I will now call to order the regular meeting of the Santa Cruz County Board of Supervisors. It is June 7th, 9 a.m. Clerk, roll call, uh, roll call, please. Supervisor Friend? Here. Coonerty? Here. Caput? Here. McPherson? Here. And Chair Koenig? Here. Chair, you have a quorum. Thank you. Thank you. We'll now have a moment of silence and a Pledge of Allegiance. Is there any board member that would like to dedicate this moment to anyone? Yes, Mr. Chair, I think that uh, Supervisor Coonerty and I both have individuals we'd like to ensure are recognized today. Um, I'd like to recognize Betty Allen, who of Coralitos, who recently passed away. She had an outsized influence in Coralitos. Um, not only is she a local that went to EA Hall and Watsonville High, but she was one of the people who made sure that Aldridge Lane Park Recording in progress. Uh, the Coralitos Cultural Center was started and the Coralitos Library was started. She was a real institution and very beloved within Coralitos community and, and she recently passed away. So I'd like to make sure that we honor her today. And I believe Supervisor Coonerty also has somebody. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Zach. Um, I'd also like to recognize in the moment of silence, Trisha Geisreiter. Um, Trisha and Reed Geisreiter have been real pillars of our community in every imaginable way. And she was an incredibly uh, wonderful, energetic human being uh, who we lost too soon uh, while she was on a trip to <laughs> Europe. And um, we wish Reed and the whole family and friends uh, the best in this challenge, in these difficult times. Thank you. We'll hold them both in our hearts during this moment of silence. Please rise for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America, to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. J.O. Palacios, are there any additions or deletions to the regular agenda? Yes, we have uh, one revision. This is on the, the regular agenda, item number 10. There are additional materials. We are adding attachment one to resolution CSA 12 service charge reports FY 2022-23 titled CSA 12 wastewater management benefits assessment service charge report. And that concludes the revisions to today's agenda. Thank you. Proceed to item four. Are there any board members that wish to remove an item from consent to regular agenda? Seeing none, we'll proceed to public comment. Any person may address the board during public comment. Speakers must not exceed two minutes in length. Individuals may speak only once during public comment. All comments must be directed to an item listed on today's consent agenda, closed session agenda, yet to be heard on the regular agenda or a topic not on the agenda that is within the jurisdiction of the board. We will not take actions or respond immediately to any public communication presented regarding topics not on the agenda, but may choose to follow up later, either individually or on a subsequent board of supervisors meeting. Go ahead, sir. My name is Don Dietrich. I live in the uh, fifth district at 904 Lockwood Lane. Uh, I'm here today to urge you to reconsider the cuts to the community bridges program. Um, as a uh, retired uh, community member, uh, I feel fortunate that I can pay my bills that I don't have to live in a one room apartment uh, wondering where my meals are coming from. Um, every Friday I go out and deliver brown bags to shut in seniors through the gray bears program and I see how people live. And it's awful. They shouldn't have to live that way in this community. So the community bridges provides that gap between those of us that are fortunate enough to not have to suffer like that and those that don't. And I feel the government's one of their fundamental roles is to make sure that we're taking care of those that are vulnerable and are, are incapable of living up to what I consider to be at least equitable standards. You know, there's all these issues with food equity, 
uh, health care and all these things that happen. And these people live very silently and live very, very poorly and, and minimally in small apartments, one room apartments. They're there waiting at the door when I show up every Friday for the food that we're bringing that probably lasts them three days. So um, I think it's very important that we as a government take care of, uh, as a community, take care of these people. And I know you have a lot of hard decisions to make in budgets. I appreciate the work that you do, but please reconsider community bridges, you know, and try and tighten up someplace else because the people that they serve are the people that need it the most. So thank you. Thank you, Mr. Dietrich. Good morning. My name is Suzanne Stone, and I'm the Executive Director of Advocacy, Inc. Could you, a core yeah, could you speak a little bit closer to the mic, Certainly. please, so we can Should hear I you? Should I start over? <laughs> Down. Good morning. Uh, my name is Suzanne Stone. If you could just pull the mic a little closer to your mouth. Thank you. And I'm the executive director of Advocacy Inc., a core grant applicant agency, which provides federally mandated monitoring and complaint investigations for seniors who reside in assisted living communities, skilled nursing facilities, and board and care homes. We've been continuously providing these services to Santa Cruz and San Benito County since 1975 and we've been receiving core funds for support since the program was instituted we're very appreciative of the support that you have given us in the past our request for proposal was not funded this year and i'm here today to let you know the consequences for local seniors and out-of-home care if our agency does not receive the funds that we requested from the county Advocacy Inc. is the only program in Santa Cruz County that responds to family and resident complaints and coordinates with state and local officials to resolve them. Our core funding request for $60,000, 20% of the Ombudsman program funding, is an essential component of our budget since we're required to have a local match in funding in order to receive the majority of our funding for this program, which comes from the Area Agency on Aging and Medi-Cal Administrative Activity Funds. Without the core grant funds, we're at risk of being unable to continue to operate the Ombudsman program. Seniors and their families rely on us to address violations of their family members' rights and to advocate for the care that these elders deserve. If our program closes, due to losing our local match, who will be the voice of these oh, okay. vulnerable it seniors? Started the core. Thank you. Good morning, Chairman Koenig and esteemed supervisors. At some point in your life, you, your parent, your grandparent or another loved one may find the need to be in a long-term care facility, skilled nursing or residential care facility. In fact, each of your districts houses one or more of these essential residences. You, as, as care concerns or care issues arise, and you may not be able to get those issues resolved with facility staff, who would you turn to? The answer is simple, the long-term care ombudsman. My name is Stephen Matsey, and I am the Long-Term Care Ombudsman Program Coordinator with Advocacy, Inc. Our small but dedicated team of two, including myself, full-time staff are mandated by the Older Americans Act to advocate for and protect the rights of residents living in long-term care settings. Today, I'm advocating for our program. We respond to complaints ranging from allegations of abuse and neglect to unsafe discharges and inadequate quality of care. Furthermore, we are the only provider in the County of Santa Cruz that provides this critical and essential service and work tirelessly to help long-term care residents live their highest quality of life. We have appreciated our longstanding partnership with the County and the City of Santa Cruz. So I was surprised and deeply concerned to learn that our program is defunded under the current core funding recommendations. Have we not learned anything about the needs of our long-term care residents during the COVID-19 pandemic? I humbly and respectfully ask that you thoughtfully consider the recommendations and the impact that the loss of this funding will have on our seniors living in long-term care settings. Thank you for your time and your consideration. Thank you, Mr. Madsey. 
Hey, good morning, supervisors. Thank you for your service. My name is Shalak Kavanis. I love Santa Cruz, and I have the privilege of serving as chair on the Mental Health Advisory Board. Um, uh, Supervisor Caput has been to almost every one of our meetings and provided the leadership, and you're going to be very, missed very, very much. So thank you very much, Supervisor. Um, I'm here to talk about uh, consent agenda item number 39, the residential uh, uh, uh yeah. Residential facility for youth uh, and adults. There will be two uh, to deal with severe crisis, uh, mental health, mental health crises, and uh, strongly uh, want to uh, support that. As the mental health advisory board is important when uh, people are suffering crises, that they stay here locally with their family in the place that they know in the community that can support them instead of getting sent out. And that's especially true for our vulnerable youth who might be suffering mental health crises. So as the Mental Health Advisory Board of Santa Cruz County, we strongly, strongly support the um, funds that we are getting and to continue raising funds to uh, build the residential facilities for both the adults and the youth. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Cabanas. Good morning, gentlemen. Um, I'm Thomas Wayman. I'm living in the mountains. I, I, hopefully that's enough. Uh, I am here to comment regarding your proposed recycling rate increase. Um, I looked at the numbers and it just seems to be an alarming increase. The total is 59% over five years. Uh, well, four years if if you're just counting the rate increases, that averages out to about 12% per year. Now that's far more than the rate of inflation, even with the recent price increases. And the, the problem I have is the government doesn't wanna do what the rest of us have to do, live within our means. They, If they wanna do some big, new big project, they just, add on taxes and you're getting more money every year because of um, increases in sales tax from goods that, that are rising in price. You're getting more from real estate as old houses are sold off. Uh, you know, you get a huge uh, bump in revenue. And I would just plead that you, um, Live within your means. Don't just come to us every year saying, well, I need more money. We need more money. You're getting a little bit more every year from inflation. So those are my comments. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Wayman. Yeah. Good morning, Board of Supervisors. My name is Dana Wagner. I am the director of the Community Bridges Women, Infants, and Children programs here in Santa Cruz County. Our program serves more than 6,400 individuals and 4,000 families each month. The proposed cuts outlined in the core funding recommendations will defund services vital to the health and well-being of our community. A sudden 60% cut in funding to community bridges programs is short-sighted and will disrupt the lives of thousands of underserved families in our community and dozens of staff who have dedicated their careers to helping others. I ask everyone in this room to imagine the impact it would have on you if you suddenly woke up to the news that you were getting a 60% cut to your family's budget beginning July 1st. How would that loss impact you and the those around you and would have a ripple effects to those you may employ and to the local economy? Now, I, I ask you to multiply this by thousands and not just any thousand, but thousands of working families in your districts who are struggling to make ends meet during these challenging and unprecedented times. What will happen to these families? Over the years, Community Bridges has provided essential services to those young and old, specifically to the most vulnerable and challenged. Community Bridges Network of Programs is a safe and friendly place to receive these services. This was particularly true during the CZU fire, throughout the ongoing pandemic, and now during the infant formula shortage. Community Bridges staff have rallied during these crises. There's been no stoppage of services. On the contrary, services have been increased and targeted to meet the needs and challenges of the last two years. 
it is unconscionable that we would consider defunding these programs at such a critical time. Our community has benefited from the visionary leadership and dedicated personnel at Community Bridges. I respectfully request that you reconsider the devastating and decimating cuts to Community Bridges programs proposed by CORE. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Ms. Wagner. I'm David Bianchi, and I'm Executive Director for Family Service Agency of the Central Coast. Uh, it's not a good morning for the clients of our agency. I've spoken here many times in this chamber over the past 35 years, but I'm disheartened to be standing here today. We've had a public-private partnership spanning over four decades to support our vital mental health services. We work to assist a number of agencies to merge with us to preserve existing services under a cost-effective umbrella, including suicide prevention of Santa Cruz, IU Venture, Family Service of Pajaro Valley, Women Care, and Survivors Healing Center, who joined our established counseling and senior peer counseling programs. <laughs> Any process, no matter how carefully planned, can result in mistakes and unintended consequences for the very community it was designed to support. The process isn't sacred. Our staff were paid less, most of whom can't afford to live here, our hundreds of volunteers who take time away from their families to help others, and our clients who have the courage to seek help at a time of crisis who need and deserve your support. That is sacred. I'm not going to ask our clients who are children, families, and seniors in counseling, People who have lost loved ones to suicide, women undergoing treatment for cancer, survivors of child sexual abuse, and care facility residents isolated and ravaged by the pandemic to come here and tell you what in your heart of hearts you already know. Despite our exemplary record of meeting all benchmarks, outcomes, and level of satisfaction to these vulnerable target populations with our culturally aware diverse workforce of staff and volunteers, we are recommended for zero funding going forward. This is a significant loss of support, will likely cripple some of our programs, and will result in the disenfranchisement of constituents in each of your districts and their ability to access our unique services. Please use your understanding and compassion to consider our public appeal and any formal appeal we're allowed to file. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Mr. Bianchi. Good morning. Um, I've never been here to speak, but I just felt this was so important and was really shocked to learn about the cuts to the Family Service Agency that David just spoke about. Uh, my name is Elisa Berton. I've been a physician in this community for more than 30 years, uh, working at community health centers, first at Salud para la Gente down in Watsonville and then at the Women's Health Center. Uh, I'm also the president of the board of the Family Services Agency. Um, and it was just shocking uh, for me to learn about the cuts to the services that we provide, especially at this moment uh, when we're having such a crisis uh, in mental health um, because of the pandemic, because of uh, income inequality, the difficulties with the standard of living in this community. Um, the Family Services Agency has always been kind of a backstop for clients that couldn't uh, access mental health services elsewhere. Uh, when I worked at the Women's Health Center, uh, those uh, clients that did not have Medi-Cal or couldn't afford our sliding scale rate, the card that we always gave them was for the Family Services Agency uh, for them to access the mental health services there. Um, just at this moment in time, I think all of us have read the newspapers and are aware of the mental health crisis that's happening in this country and in this community. And to cut services to um, for mental health, it just seems unconscionable. And so I wanted to ask you to uh, reconsider that uh, conclusion. All right, thank you. Thank you, Ms. Breton. Good morning. My name is Cheryl Frenzel, and I'm a rather new executive director for the Diversity Center, and I'm here representing the Diversity Center. Um, I came to realize recently that the Diversity Center did not receive core funding, which it has in the past. And I wanted to come here and ask for consideration for some county funding for this incredibly important organization. The Diversity Center is the only LGBTQ serving organization from here to San Luis Obispo, frankly. When I came on this year, what was happening on the staff was a lot of um, struggle because of the amount of mental health crisis and frankly, suicide ideation and attempts. 
And when I came on, what was trying to happen was forming a community um, review of how do we shore up appropriate mental health support for LGBTQ youth and seniors who are being extremely impacted. And this also had county representation on it. And at the end of the day, it was really clear that we didn't quite have what was needed to care for LGBTQ youth because there's a special awareness that a clinician needs to have. So I took the approach in our core grant to ask for funding for a clinician because it was the way to shore up what was lacking. So that might have been the wrong approach. However, I am sincerely hoping that we can still count on county and city funding in order to help us continue the services to the LGBTQ community here um, going forward. Thank you very much. Thank you, Director Frenzel. Good morning. My name is Shannon Calden and I am the Director of Elementary Curriculum and Instruction for Santa Cruz City Schools. On behalf of the district, I'd like to thank the core investments team for their recommendation that we receive a core grant. At Santa Cruz City Schools, we strive to support the education and health and well being of our students and families in Santa Cruz. The focus of this grant is to give elementary students an identity as learners and computer scientists before they leave elementary school. Understanding concepts of computer science opens doors to students that were previously closed until high school or beyond. Research shows that the earlier students see themselves as capable of understanding difficult concepts such as computer science, they're more likely to continue to college and have a lucrative career path as an adult. We seek to support our immigrant children, children of poverty, children of the Latinx community, and English learners with educational opportunities beyond reading, writing, and math so they can realize a better future. Our process also includes substantial engagement of families, teaching them technology and CS concepts to allow them to better participate in an increasingly digital world. We look forward to partnering with our community to expand the work we've already done at Galt Elementary to the remaining children and families in Santa Cruz City Schools. We thank the Board of Supervisors and the core team for your support of our initiatives and your commitment to helping us create a brighter future for the children of our community. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Gary Richard Arnold, uh, remind the DA and the County Council uh, was everybody saw on the, uh, there that uh, Zach Friend knew exactly what uh, Ryan Coonerty uh, was going to say next, and uh, they live on opposite ends of the county. If there's three or more on a line, that's a violation of the Brown Act. This county is already run by conspiracy with the parallel government, AMBAG, uh, never reporting since Manu has been up here to the public of the uh, the commitment. Uh, to money, et cetera, that are done there. Uh, Agenda 21, which you have signed on to, uh, was created by Maurice Strong. If you read West Magazine in, from Colorado, he calls for the culling of the world population exactly what's going on now. And all these people begging for money, they don't care whether this is a sanctuary city and county uh, where drugs and crime and housing and hospital crowding and even baby formula is going to not the Americans you represent, but to this global loney uh, that uh, uh, Biden signed on to. Look up the Wall Street Journal where he says, uh, God, it's got to be 15 years ago, where he calls, he says, I'm a uh, new world order. I believe in the new world order. He does not believe in the national sovereignty or the constitutional protections of the United States. Uh, when Manu came here, he was not going to be he said he was not going to be another uh, <clears throat> Panetta machine person, yet he's kept uh, a public speaking time. He cut it by one third. He's created an absentee staff. None of the supervisors any longer have anybody answering their phone. It all goes through one thing under our Carlos Palacios. Uh, their own assistants no longer have a specific email address. You're, they're literally out to lunch between 12 and noon when most people that are working 
even have time, cannot reach you. Uh, and remember, Thank Santa you, Cruz, uh, they gave the key to the city to Angela Davis Thank and you. has Black Lives Matter endorsed Manu with an organization co-founded called Sevenomics. And one of the founders Thank is you, a Arnold. dual city. Good morning, ladies, gentlemen. Um, my name is Suzanne Forbes. I'm here in support of Community Bridges. Um, over the years, I've been here 26 years, and uh, throughout the years just, that I've been Ms. here, Forbes, whenever... Ms. Forbes, would you just step a little closer to the mic so oh, we can I'm all so hear sorry, you? I'm sorry, of course. Uh, my name is Suzanne Forbes. Um, reiterate, I'm here to support Community Bridges. I only recently learned of the budget cut yesterday, so it was kind of... <laughs> I've got to come and say what little I have to say, so I'll make it as succinct as possible. Um, they have offered me support and advocacy over the years, and I'm really grateful for them. I did. I had nowhere else to go for what I was given through them. Anyhow, I would hope that you would reconsider your cut to them. Thank you. And all the other agencies that have come forward to ask that you rescind those agreements. Thank you, Ms. Fords. Good morning, board. My name is Maria Cadenas. I'm the executive director of Ventures. I'm here to thank you for the recommendation of funding for the program Semillitas or Small Seeds, which is, uh, we're just honored to have been partnering with the county uh, and great organizations, including First Five Santa Cruz, Santa Cruz County Office of Education, Dientes, Salud para la Gente, and many others to bring Semillitas to our county. Creating a vibrant, healthy community with shared prosperity does not happen overnight, which is why the county's investments in Semillitas is such an important aspect on how we see our support and commitment to our Santa Cruz County kids. Semillitas will provide an automatic college savings account to all county newborns and continued investment as they develop to make sure that their parents have aspirations and hope for the future. What's most important is the studies have shown that children with these accounts are three times more likely to go to college and four times more likely to graduate. And that doesn't even include the impact on decreasing maternal depression and the increase of social emotional well-being of the child from zero to five. This is because programs like Semillitas are changing the way we welcome our kids and build aspirations from day one. From the onset, this program and the leadership team that made it possible had a commitment to our children in our county to make sure that they thrive and with it, the future of this county. Again, I'm internally grateful for the consideration of funding for Semillitas and this bold step into the future for our county. Thank you. Thank you, Director Cadenas. <clears throat> so um, I came here to support community bridges from being cut. Um, I haven't used their service, so I hope I'm in the right line talking at the right time. But I have finally gotten a decent social worker with the county mental health that has given me resources that Community Bridges gives to families and seniors. Well, I'm a, I'm a, I fit all those categories. I'm a senior, I'm a disabled person, I'm a family. I live in I live in um, below the poverty line, and um, as you can see, our country is going down. More and more people are falling into poverty. This is the totally wrong time to stop start cutting vital services that help the poor. You know, while you fund, it's kind of like um, you. It seems like this county is all big on funding, big development, um, fair market rate, and they're looking towards the taxes moving over here. You got the wrong crowd that you're funding. You need to help the people that really need help, not for profit, but just to live. Um, I know like with County Mental Health, I, I tried to find these when I was homeless and when I advocated for homeless people, but they give you a... They give you um, cards that help you out at the grocery stores for food. They give you cards for other things. I didn't know these existed because it's really hard to find these resources. So um, Community Bridges is a great resource and it needs to stay there and it needs to be funding people that really need help. We need to, um, in our country, we need an FDR type thing going on and cutting funding from this is the opposite of that. Right now, 
America isn't long to survive if it ignores its lower people that that need help of local government and federal government. Thank you. And my name's Pat Colby. Thank, thank you, Ms. Colby. Hi. I'm sorry to come here without a speech or anything, but I was just informed about this recently. Hello. Um, uh, community Bridges in Felton it has really helped us out a lot, uh, not just because of my involvement with the homeless community there, but in regard to uh, people who lost their homes in the uh, CZU fire. Also, when the Mount Hermon had to close down uh, for as long as it did, that's where a lot of my colleagues, the people that I work with, were getting their groceries from. I had to go down there and literally load up a pickup full of groceries to bring back. Um, you know, we were exhausting our resources. We had you know, food in our shut down dining room. But uh, that was that was very important to those people who were unable to work at the time. Um, and still, even though most of us are most most of us are working things out, it's uh, it's a very important resource for the homeless community in Felton. Um, it's where a lot of people go to uh, find jobs. That's how I found out about this because Mount Hermon is in need of, of help uh, in, in hiring people. Uh, and I contacted the, the I, it's called Community Bridges now in Felton to see if they could um, post job listings for me. Um, I know I have, you know, have difficulty getting people to hire because they're not the greatest jobs, but there are people there who are willing to take that. So not only does it help me, but it helps people out there who are in need of employment. Looks like I'm running out of time, but uh, so thank you. Thank you, sir. Good morning, Supervisors, Karen Delaney. The organization I work for is grateful that we aren't being cut. And my staff was like, you're crazy. Why are you going down there? Um, it's because my whole career, I believe in two things. One, people are good and will try to do the right thing if they have the right data. And two, we can do better even when it's hard. Core folks were given an impossible task because of the level of investment, limited levels set by your board eight months ago before we knew the economic climate, the conditions were any amazing new program only gets funded if you pull someone already away from the table. If you think those are still the conditions, if you really believe that's the best we can do, let me tell you one example. This is what the San Francisco Board of Supervisors is voting for, for their nonprofits. A 5.25% COLA for all staff in fully funded existing programs for all nonprofit partners. An additional 60 million over two years to invest in bringing all nonprofit childcare workers up over a lingual living wage, not losing a single childcare slot. 30 million over two years to increase wages for nonprofit homeless veterans and mental health service workers so that all case managers make a minimum prevailing wage of $28 an hour, plus a 37 million increase investment in new targeted services like our core. Sadly, in my beloved community, that model that every new dollar in a year where you have a lot more money has to come from another service is not true. I encourage you to hold over, get the list of the cuts, compare them to every dollar you're spending this budget. Thank you, Ms. Thank Delaney. You. Buenos dias. Yo hablo en español. Okay. Okay. That's. Empezamos despacio, okay? Okay. Buenos días. Mi nombre es Diana Valadez. Good morning. My name is Diana Valadez. Soy una madre de dos hijos que van a la escuela de Laibo. Um, I'm a mother of two kids who go to Laibo school. Uh, al mismo tiempo, mis hijos uh, reciben ayudas en el centro de recursos de LIBOC. My kids, um, they receive help and support from the LIBOC. Y lo único que quiero decir es que estoy aquí dando la cara por otras madres. The only, the only 
I'm here to let you know that I am representing other mothers. Es muy importante que conservemos todos los servicios que tenemos. It is very important for us to, to preserve all the supports and resources that we have. Lo único que queremos es tener hijos sanos y felices. We want children who are happy and healthy. And verlos realizados y verlos que cumplan sus sueños y esperanzas. Have them realize themselves and be happy and be successful. Queremos niños uh, resilientes, llenos de amor para el prójimo. We would like to have loving kids. Y es justo que todos recibamos una buena salud. It's only fair that we all have good health. Gracias por escucharnos. Gracias por tomar estos tiempos para las personas como nosotros. Thank you so much for listening to me and to, for us. Y es tiempo de que sigamos con las ayudas. Gracias. It, it's, a, it's a good idea and it's wonderful for you guys to continue with this um, support. Thank you. Gracias. Thank you, Mr. Oh, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman. I, I just want to interrupt. I appreciate the input, and I think these people may not be here later today, but this item, uh, and we discussed in detail on item 12, so after you speak at uh, oral communications, uh, any recommendation or decision by the board will not be made until after the discussion on item 12. I just wanted to make, uh, we appreciate your input, but I just wanted to let you know the uh, in-depth discussion will be coming a little later. Yes, thank you, Supervisor McPherson. I'll say let's um, we'll take comment from people who are still standing here. Uh, we will hear uh, the core item. It's item 11. Um, and when it comes to online public comments, which I will have to assume people are slightly more flexible, I'll ask that anyone speaking uh, to the core item wait till we actually hear that item. Uh, but go ahead, sir. Go ahead. Is it item 12 or 11? It's it's item 11. Go ahead, sir. Good morning. Uh, thank you for your time. Uh, we've been going to uh, all the uh, community breaches events they have and all the uh, stuff they prevent for, for kids. Our kids have been taking advantage of all the classes they do, all the tutoring. They've been doing that all the time. Uh, when we get COVID, we get help through them. They help us with providing food and all the basics that we need. Some of the head of the household. So when I went down with COVID, all my family wasn't able to do anything. And they were able to provide us. Uh, we could walk, or the kids and the wife could walk and pick up uh, groceries, the basis we need to survive for a week or two. Uh, they've been providing a lot of staff and a lot of support. My kids are very happy joining the clubs they have, and uh, we'll be very happy for us to if you guys, if you folks figure it out and decide to to keep it going, we'll be appreciated. And we're speaking in more families and are unable to make it. Unfortunately, everybody has to work in different times, but sure. we're supporting them and thank you for your time. Thank you, sir. Yeah, good morning. My name is James Ewing Whitman on the consent agenda. Item number 21, referring to Assembly Bill 361 about uh, remote meetings. This is a, almost as much of a full house as I've seen here in the past eight months since they've been open to the public. Look, none of you guys are wearing masks today. Look behind me, half the people are wearing masks. Just why is that? Why does the city of Santa Cruz not have open meetings? They did it for two weeks only. So also on the agenda item number 26, um, an approval of re reappropriation of $124 million. What is going to go on with that money? I thought that was part of people's retirement funds. And number 38, the, ex the emergency extension because of the tsunami that happened in January. Is the public not aware that these extensions just allow fishing extra? Expeditions for people to, for this government to get more money. You know, I didn't stand for the Pledge of Allegiance. What we, have, we, what we have there are three flags: the United States flag, a California flag, and the pedophile flag. So, um, when a nation is taken over, they sew something around it, and it becomes a pirate flag. So, I wish I had more support for the city of Santa Cruz, the county of Santa Cruz, the state of California, and the U.S. government, but it's been taken over. You know, I don't know how many of the public actually realize that the elected officials answer to the city and county managers who often aren't elected officials. 
So it's interesting that so many people have stood here today about the funding that they used to get and that they're not. Maybe if they would have shown up more to see what actually is going on in this room, that may not have happened. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Whitman. Good morning. Adult Education of Santa Cruz County partners with Community Bridges to provide childcare for adults learning English. This means that anyone who has a young kid can come to the Live Oak Center to take classes while their children receive top-notch care. Fun fact, Live Oak Community Resources is the only place in the entire county that does this. There are no other options for students who want to learn English and need childcare. This service is crucial for our immigrant families composed of parents who have the time, desire, and energy to learn English, but need to have the childcare. These proposed funding cuts would take away not only the childcare, but the ESL class itself from the satellite location. You should not take away the one classroom option our families with young children have. As the teacher, I, Miriam Cohen, can attest to just how crucial both classroom time and non-classroom time are. I have watched community blossom within our classroom at Live Oak Community Resources. Students study in class together for three hours daily, learning things like U.S. civics, current events, how to navigate the various medical and educational systems, and of course, grammar and pronunciation. About halfway through, they take a break to check in with their kids and let their minds relax. Since their native languages differ, they use English as their communal language to exchange woes on parenting struggles and tips on things like how to potty train their kids or how to find a preschool. If someone needs a dentist, they can ask how to find one and where to go. It's in these moments when students of diverse backgrounds are supporting each other through similar phases of life that relationships are built and community happens. By the way, in the period from mid-October through last Friday, students attended approximately 1,550 hours of class. Through Community Bridges, these students and their families also have access to fresh food twice a month, parenting classes to help with those tricky preschool years, and help with applications and legal aid, among other services. In a time of soaring inflation and a looming recession, it is imperative that you support our families and preserve resources that bridge our communities. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Cohen. All right, we'll now uh, go to Zoom. Is there anyone on Zoom who would like to comment uh, on something? And uh, again, since we have not actually come to item 11, we'll be, we're, we'll be hearing more about the core process. I'd ask that anyone speaking uh, online try to address things that uh, are not on our regular agenda. Carol, your microphone is now available. Good morning. My name is Carol Bjorn. Um, I have a great idea actually on how you can solve all these spending problems. It's really quite heartbreaking to hear everyone's testimony this morning. Um, but you know what? You should really consider getting rid of the County Office of Education. They really don't do anything to add any value to the students in Santa Cruz County. They're really just rubber stamping everything coming out of Sacramento. There's no critical thinking going on over there. And I'm sure they have a huge budget. Um, so if you just get rid of that county agency, it would free up a lot of money to actually serve the poor people in this county. Um, please remove item 43 from the consent agenda and place it on the regular agenda. Please vote no on this agenda item. Item 43 would clearly violate the fourth and fifth amendments of the Constitution for the United States of America. Further, if you all vote yes on this item, you could be held liable for violating the fourth and fifth amendment rights of the Californians living in Santa Cruz County. Further, you all would be participating in the ongoing fraud of the COVID-19 pandemic. As I've talked about on numerous occasions before this board, there is no isolated SARS-CoV-2 virus. Thus, there is no basis for saying that it's contagious, and there's no basis for saying that it causes the disease of COVID-19. Last week, I read from the book, The Truth About Contagion by Dr. Thomas Cowan. Ms. Bjorn, we're getting a lot of feedback. As I was reading last week from the book, um, the question was, is the Spanish flu pandemic contagious? And again, um, during a study conducted by U.S. Public Health, um, it was found that the Spanish flu pan, uh, pandemic it actually was not contagious. They did an experiment where they took the mucus secretions from 100 uh, people that were sick put it in 100 volunteers, not one person got sick. You really need to read this book and I highly recommend it for everyone in the, in the audience today. Thank, Thank you, Ms. Bjorn.
Jeffrey Ellis, your microphone is now available. Jeffrey Ellis, if you'll accept the unmute, your microphone is now available. Uh, hi, my name is uh, Jeffrey Ellis, uh, here to speak on uh, item 46 on the agenda. Uh, these are uh, applications for uh, funding of uh, homeless facilities. Uh, this looks to me like deja vu all over again. Uh, at your February meeting, uh, you, you approved uh, four home key projects, including the or, or, uh, applications for funding, including the one on uh, Park Avenue, um, which was done without any uh, neighborhood outreach and engagement. Uh, it's caused a lot of unhappiness in that area. I, I've spoken to people there. Uh, they're they're uh, appalled that it was done without consulting them. And now you have applications for a total of six million dollars. Uh, and there's nothing in the agenda item about where these facilities would go, and absolutely nothing about neighborhood outreach and engagement. Now, please, please, you need to let people know what's coming or what may be coming and get their buy-in. And all I see on the agenda is let's get the money. Let's get the $6 million. Well, first, let's ask the people in the targeted neighborhoods whether or not they want these facilities, whether or not they will support them. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Ellis. Elizabeth Madrigal, your microphone is now available. Good morning, Chair Koenig and Supervisors of the Board. Elizabeth Madrigal speaking on behalf of the Monterey Bay Economic Partnership. Our housing initiative consists of a broad coalition of community members, local employers, and organizations to advocate for and catalyze an increase in housing of all types and income levels near transit, jobs, and services in the Tri-County, Monterey, Santa Cruz, and San Benito County region. MBEP fully supports agenda item 36, adopting a formal resolution for the pro-housing designation program and directing the community development and infrastructure department to submit an application for a pro-housing designation once the county has adopted sufficient policies and programs to qualify for approval. We commend the county of Santa Cruz for this step as the pro-housing designation will grant the county an, an advantage in applying for state housing funds and be a state leader when it comes to building the housing that is desperately needed in our community. Thank you for your time and consideration. Thank you, Ms. Madrigal. Call in user two, your microphone is now available. This is Marilyn Garrett. Yeah, a great way to fund everything is to just take a small portion of the military budget. How about the billions going to the Ukraine? Uh, misdirection of money in this country, that's for sure. I uh, would also call for you to put item 43 on the regular agenda, on a future agenda violates Fourth and Fifth Amendment, and I read Dr. Thomas Callan's book. I recommend it for you um, that Carol Bjorn referred to. I'd also like to recommend that you read the um, printed speech of Robert F. Kennedy Jr. in January and you can, from the steps of the Lincoln Memorial against the mandates, and it's WestonAPrice.org. 
And one of the things he states is if you give government the license to silence its critics, you have given them the capacity to commit any atrocity they want and to obliterate all the amendments and rights of the Constitution. Freedom of speech is critical for people to know what's going on, and that is being censored. And he said, we've experienced a coup d'etat against democracy and the demolition, the controlled demolition of the United States Constitution and the Bill of Rights under these, these last months. So I recommend you read that and that the uh, pharmaceutical you, corporation. Karen. Serge Cogno, your microphone is now available. Good morning, Chair Koenig and Board of Supervisors. Uh, my name is Serge Cagno. I'm uh, executive director of a local nonprofit. I'll speak on item number 11 when that agenda item comes up. Um, I'd like to uh, speak to item number 32, the living wage ordinance. The living wage ordinance is a powerful statement of the importance our community places on ethics in our county contract budgets. However, there should not be an exception for nonprofits. As a director of a local nonprofit, it's my ethical responsibility to provide my staff with a living wage. Nonprofit staff are the heart of the services nonprofits offer. County contracts should not have the ability to give exceptions for nonprofits, requiring only a form. If you run a search for them throughout past board materials, you'll find them usually not filled out, only having an executive director's signature. It's unclear whether county staff ever looked over the forms or whether further information was requested to explain why staff were not receiving the living wages. There's no reason a county contract should be given without funding for living wages. To say that it is be because there's simply not enough funding does not lessen our ethical obligation to support our community through our programs, and that includes our staff. Studies have shown staff at nonprofits often need to supplement their income with public benefits. Staff have difficulty paying for groceries, rent, and gas like everybody else. There's no reason why a contract should be given knowing some staff do not receive a living wage, especially here in Santa Cruz, while there's no reviewing of the salaries of the executive team or the non of the nonprofit. Please make efforts to remove this outdated attempt to push lack of funding onto the backs of those struggling to pay their bills while doing the great frontline work of our nonprofits. As the co-chair of the a mental health advisory board. I'd also like to um, speak on item number 39 in appreciation and support of the creation of these two needed programs. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Mr. Cogno. Cesar Lara, your microphone is now available. Yeah, good morning, members of the Board of Supervisors. Uh, Cesar Lara with the Monterey Bay Central Library Council, and happy Election Day. And I'm calling about item number 11 since we're on the campaign trail today. But, you know, cuts and core funding to community M business program. Mr. Lara, is there any way you can wait until we actually hear the item 11? I actually cannot. Um, right, um, please proceed. Yeah, uh, partial closure of all uh, four family resource centers would ne negatively impact working families. Um, family resource centers serves thousands of members of the Santa Cruz County community across its four locations. Loss of subsidized house care slots, health child care slots and partial uh, closure of these sites would negatively impact not just uh, youth but also seniors uh, I urge you not to support not to support the, the the cutting of the core funding thank you thank you mr. Lara Lorraine Iglesias your microphone is now available Thank you, good morning. I'd like to speak to item 11. Um, I know that I cannot stay, so if you could accept my comments, I'd be appreciate that. Go ahead. 
Thank you. My name is Lorraine Iglesias. Good morning, Board of Supervisors. I sit on the Board of Directors for Ventures, and I wanted to just show my appreciation for considering Semillitas, which is a program in Ventures, which means small seeds. And I wanted to thank you for considering uh, an investment in the future of Santa um Santa Cruz County children's and the future equity for their lives. So again, showing my appreciation and thank you. Thank you, Ms. Iglesias. Jessica Peters, your microphone is now available. Good morning, can you hear me? Yes. Hi, uh, my name is Jessica. I live in District 5 and my comment is short and sweet this morning. I just wanted to say that I really appreciate seeing Bruce McPherson in person this morning. Um, it's so important that we have good in-person, present and engaged representation for District 5. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Peters. <clears throat> Whitney Barnes, your microphone is now available. Hi, good morning, thank you. Uh, I'm here as a representative of the team of Adult Protective Services for Santa Cruz County. And I would like to thank the board for proclaiming June 2022 uh, Elder Abuse Awareness Month. Our team investigates allegations of abuse, neglect, self-neglect and exploitation among older and dependent adults throughout the county. We strive to reduce risk and enhance safety for all community dwelling older and dependent adults in Santa Cruz County. The issue of elder abuse is significant and not just in terms of impact, but also scale. According to the National Council on Aging, roughly 10% of Americans over the age of 60 have experienced some form of elder abuse. Additional studies suggest that self-neglect adversely affects somewhere between 10 and 20% of American older adults. If you reflect on your own personal connections within your family, neighborhood, church, community, and others, consider that somewhere between one or two of every 10 older adults in your social circle may be suffering from some form of abuse, neglect, financial exploitation, or inability to meet their own daily needs. It's important to keep in mind that we do estimate only one in every 24 incidences of abuse against older adults is reported. And that highlights the importance of events such as this proclamation. Raising awareness on the issue of elder abuse will increase attention to the issue and hopefully ease fears for those who may need to seek help and support. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Barnes. Gloria P, your microphone is now available. <clears throat> Buenos días, mi nombre es Gloria Palomo. Soy líder de Copa y Good morning, my name is Gloria Palomo. <laughs> mi esposo Leocadio Rivera, que hace 20 años fue diagnosticado con Parkinson y demencia. My husband has this with Parkinson and that dementia. Es un paciente del programa de Elder Day, donde lo cuidan cuatro horas por día y veinte horas por semana. Para mí estos programas son una bendición para poder sobrellevar estas enfermedades tan difíciles. These programs are a blessing for me and my family to be able to con continue taking care of my husband. Y si dejaran de dar fondos para ayuda, yo sé lo que va a pasar. If you take these services away, I have a very good idea of what's going to happen. Yo ya tuve una experiencia cuando cerraron por causa de la pandemia. I've already experienced this when you closed due to the pandemic. Durante este tiempo me afectó al grado que me dio parálisis parcial y During por favor. Time, he affected me um, health wise. Y por favor le suplico que no reduzca la ayuda. Porque Please, no I beg quiero, you, do not take away this help. No quiero volver a pasar por esta experiencia. I will not, otra like, vez. To, I will not like to leave this experience again. Por favor, toquen su, su corazón para poder seguir ayudándonos. No cierren la ayuda para estos programas. 
please don't take away this help in these programs. Gracias. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, how many more speakers do we have online? That was our final speaker. All right. Very well, then. Um, thank you, everyone. We'll now move to item six, which is action on the consent agenda. Any member of the board wish to speak to items on the consent agenda? Uh, Mr. Chair, I'll, uh, see, excuse me. Uh, I'd like to speak on a couple items. Uh, number 36, the pro, pro housing designation program. I want to thank Dr. Ratner, our director of uh, the county's housing for health division for bringing this opportunity to our attention. Uh, if we succeed in adopting policies to become a pro housing county, it will position us in a better place to be more competitive uh, for state money to build project. And I want to thank Chair Koenig and his staff for working with my office on this item. Uh, there's on items 39, 40 and 40, uh, five. Uh, they all have to do with behavioral health funding. And I want to thank really our behavioral health staff and all our nonprofit partners for working in the arena of mental health services. I'm really glad to see a greater investments in addressing this issue as it is a major contributing factor uh, to homelessness and it is co-occurring issue with substance abuse in many cases. Uh, we really cannot afford uh, not to address uh, this issue with, uh, without uh, adequate resources. And I, I think the recent events that we've seen in our nation have proven time and time again how important it is to provide uh, more behavioral health services to our community. And I think we'll be able to do that if we are successful in getting these funding uh, uh, grant to get these grants that we've applied for. Um, on item 48, I have a question. It's about geological hazards and geotechnical engineering guidelines. I think I want to thank our staff for the community uh, from the community development infrastructure for bringing this item so we can really better understand how professionals are being advised on how to navigate, navigate uh, this issue. Uh, I'd, I'd like to ask a question. I think our public works director is here or the uh, uh, do we anticipate that this, oh, fine, good, thank you, see, good to see you. Do we anticipate that these guidelines are going to make it simpler and more predictable about uh, people seeking permits to get through the process? I think this is really an important to think about in both the context of uh, fire recovery that we've had and also other geologically challenging areas in the county that were directed by the CZU fire. It seems like the state and local guidelines are a little different and we want to meet them all and we need to meet them all. Yeah, uh, good morning. My name is Carolyn Burke. I'm the assistant director with uh, Community Development and Infrastructure overseeing the Permit Center. And uh, our current guidelines date back to the mid 90s. And since that time, there have been a lot of regulatory and technical advancements in both geotechnical and geologic um, reporting. And uh, one of those is the incorporation of stronger geotechnical requirements in the California Building Code. So these guidelines bring all of that into one package for consultants. And our hope is that it will um, set expectations so that we can have a smoother uh, review process, as well as provide consultants with tools so that they can better scope their reports um, prior to signing contracts with uh, clients. And um, they're able to better anticipate timelines. And overall, um, our mantra is, you know, more complete reports and applications lead to more streamlined review times. So that's our hope in producing these guidelines. Yeah, I hope that's speed it up and it makes it more predictable because we've heard this for two years now. And uh, I know you have too, Ms. Burke. Yeah. And, uh, Absolutely. I appreciate the efforts that you've tried to coordinate what we do and what we have in the county and what the state demands too. It's been a not an easy process. Absolutely, yeah. And with respect to the CZU fire survivors, um, the CZU rebuild directive is an option for them, um, which takes them out of the county code review process. But the California Building Code, as you know, still has requirements. And so this helps provide a path um, for them to be able to at least anticipate what kind of requirements would come up in that review. 
Great. Thank you. Thank you for Absolutely. your explanation. Thank I you. appreciate it. And one other thing on item number 53, the California Department of Transportation, uh, they, uh, the litter and encampments along state highways uh, right away have been an increasingly difficult problem throughout California because local jurisdictions really don't have the ability just to go in and, and work in these areas. So I really appreciate uh, the county's community uh, development and infrastructure division again for working with Caltrans to provide the funding to maintain these areas to the best extent possible. I know it's a, a big issue here and elsewhere throughout the state of California. That's it. Thank you, Supervisor McPherson. All right, seeing, um, I'll, I'll just comment on a couple items here. On item 33, I wanna thank Mark Yellen for volunteering to serve on the Emergency Medical Care Commission as representative of the Santa Cruz Medical Society. Um, on item 36, the pro housing designation. I also wanna thank uh, our planning staff who's committed to reviewing uh, best practice policies from around the state uh, and bringing them to our county uh, so that we can uh, proactively address the housing crisis. Uh, on item 51, some, uh, authorizing the submission of a grant for 2023 active transportation program funding in the amounts of $67 million uh, and $3.5 million for the coastal rail trail segments. Um, and of course, I'm excited to see this project move forward. And I, I uh, thank Public Works for all their their work on it. Uh, I just have to say, I, I am concerned uh, that there, there's a risk in applying for too much money here. Uh, you know, we are less than 1% of the state's population. And we're asking for more than 10% of all the active transportation funding for this project, uh, for a program that has been described as oversubscribed and highly competitive. So um, hoping for the best, uh, but uh, I, I do have uh, concerns. Um, on and then finally on um, item 47, extending the contract with Housing Matters and Abode. Um, you know, I just want to say here as well. I'm concerned that we're reaching the uh, maximum utility of this program, allocating housing vouchers uh, for people. You know, we've had a, it's, it's fantastic that we've uh, given vouchers to 250 families and found permanent homes for 100 people. Um, but the marginal utility of spending another $2 million on this program uh, when we are in urgent need of other transitional housing options in our community, uh, it does make me trepidatious. Um, you know, I'll support finishing out this program, but I think we need to seriously consider this as uh, as we look at what the best next dollar is to spend addressing homelessness. Those are all my comments. Is there a motion? I'll move the recommended action. I'll second. Motion by Supervisor Coonerty uh, to accept the consent agenda. Second by Supervisor Friend. Any further discussion? Seeing none, clerk, roll call vote, please. Supervisor Friend. Aye. Coonerty? Aye. Caput? Aye. McPherson? Aye. And Koenig? Aye. Thank you, Chair. The consent agenda passes unanimously. Thank you. Then we'll proceed to item seven to consider adoption of resolutions confirming the previously established benefit assessment rates for county service areas four, Pajaro Dunes, and CSA 48, County Fire. Adopt resolutions setting a public hearing on June 28, 2022, on the proposed fiscal year 22 23 service charge reports for CSAs four and 48, and take related actions as outlined in the memorandum of the Director of General Services. For report on this item, we have uh, Director of General Services Michael Beaton. Take it away. Uh, uh, thank you, uh, Chair Koenig. Uh, Michael Bean, Director of General Services. I am uh, staffed to this item and available for any questions. Okay, uh, any questions from members of the board? Seeing none, is there any member of the public that wishes to comment on this item? Seeing none, I'll return it to the board. A uh, motion will be in order. I'll move the recommended actions. I'll second. Motion by Supervisor Friend, second by Supervisor Caput. Any further discussion? Seeing none, clerk roll call vote, please. Supervisor Friend? Aye. Coonerty? Aye. Caput? Aye. McPherson? Aye. And Koenig? Aye. That item passes unanimously. Thank you, Director Beaton. We'll now proceed to item eight, a public hearing to consider approving a resolution establishing a charge for recycling and solid waste services infrastructure at the county's Buena Vista landfill and take related actions as outlined in the memorandum of the Deputy CAO, Director of Community Development and Infrastructure. And for a report on this item, uh, we have Assistant Director, Director of Community Development and Infrastructure, um, Kent Edler. Uh, as well as Casey Colossa our in our Department of Public Works. Good morning, Chair Koenig. I'm Casey Colossa, Recycling and Solid Waste Services Manager in the Department of Community Development and Infrastructure. 
Up here with me is Ken Endler, Assistant Director. Uh, today's item is regarding the establishment of a charge for recycling and solid waste infrastructure. Since the Buena Vista landfill is nearing capacity and due to requirements of uh, Senate Bill 1383, the new charge would fund a transfer station infrastructure at the Buena Vista landfill and organics processing facility at the Buena Vista landfill and closure costs for the closing of the Buena Vista landfill. This new charge would be collected through the property tax bills on developed parcels in the unincorporated areas of the county. The charge per parcel over the next five years is outlined in the board memo and they were developed by our solid waste consultants, HF&H. So in compliance with Proposition 218, the notices of the new charge were mailed on April 14th, which exceeds the 45 day minimum um, required for noticing prior to today's public hearing. Per Proposition 218, the new charge would not go into effect if more than 50% of affected property owners submitted a written protest prior to the public hearing. There are 45,017 affected property owners and we've received only nine written protests or um, of, of the charge. So that's far below the 50% required for a majority protest. So the recommended actions are to open a public hearing to take objections or protests, if any, to the proposed charge for recycling and solid waste services infrastructure and close the public hearing. And upon its com conclusion, adopt the attached resolution approving establishment of a charge for recycling and solid waste services infrastructure. And we are available for uh, many questions. Thank you. I'll officially open the public hearing for this item. Is there any member of the board that has questions? Supervisor Caput. Thank you. Uh, yeah, the old, uh, caught me a little bit off guard here. Uh, now the recycling, when you're talking about the charge, uh, it would be taken uh, uh, when they got there uh, at the landfill? So this charge would actually be put on the property tax bill. So it, it would not okay. be when you go to the landfill. Uh, do we make money on the uh, recycle? Uh, yeah, that's figured into our revenue for our budget. Yeah. Okay. Okay. All right. Yep, yeah. Supervisor McPherson. I want to thank Public Works for bringing this item uh, to us and for laying the groundwork and how we're going to deal with the eventual closure of the Buena Vista landfill, which has been stated, I think, 20 years ago. It was going to close in a couple of years. So. Uh, it's it's held its ground uh, as best it can. Um, but to understand this, we are under state mandates. And for those who want to refer to legislation, it's Senate Bill 1383 to deal with our organic waste in a better manner. And this is going to help us come up with solutions to that issue and the demands that the state has put upon us. Um, I have, and I think all of us have received some comments about why unincorporated uh, residents are shouldering this and i think it's important to note that the residents outside of the unincorporated area in the cities the four cities in santa cruz they do pay an additional fee uh to use the buena vista site uh that said i look forward to future discussions on this about how we're planning to address our recycling and solid waste in the years to come um, this is um, something we just have to address and get ahead of uh it's a state mandate and we have to meet it Thank you. Thank you, Supervisor McPherson. Any further questions or comments from the board? Seeing none, does any member of the public wish to address us on this item? Please approach the podium. My name is Geraldine DiCarlo. I live in Santa Cruz County, unincorporated. I did get the notification in the newsletter from uh, from Green Waste. And when I saw this, I was shocked. First of all, I am a senior citizen, fixed income. I do pay for recycling when I go to, to take whatever I need to at Buena Vista, which is not very often. And I do pay for services to pick everything up at my home, which I have to actually lug down the street, put down at the end of the street, about a quarter mile down and come back and pick it up. I should not be paying an additional surcharge for something that I'm already paying for. So I'm protesting, but I also have to tell you, the gentleman up here said if he had gotten X amount of 
protest and writing, I would have responded. But there's no th nothing on this writing that says I have to protest in writing. Nobody's informed anybody up in that area, to my knowledge, that this is happening. So this is another piece of junk mail that comes through and people just toss it. We have not been properly informed of what's going on. <coughs> That's all I have to say. Thank you, Ms. Carlo. Is there anyone on Zoom that wishes to address us on this item? Yes, we do have one speaker. I, I apologize, two speakers now. Call in user two, your microphone is now available. This is, excuse me, Marilyn Garrett. I appreciate the previous speaker there. I'm in the same category. I find this pretty outrageous that you keep putting more taxes on uh, small property owners. And also, recycling is a myth. It's estimated that about 5% of the plastics is so-called recycled. Why are not the polluters of the plastic, the producers, halted at the source? This is ridiculous that, um, you know, what is the corporations privatize the profit and socialize the cost. That's what's going on. And during these last couple of years, there's been more and more and more plastic produced. It's clogging up everything with microplastics, the oceans. Um, this doesn't go to the source. Stop the pollution where it starts has to do with the profiting system. And I'm opposed to this increase in taxes. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Garrett. Jessica Peters, your microphone is now available. Hi, good morning again. This is Jessica. I live in District 5. Um, I want to thank the previous speaker for bringing up the, the mailing that we received. We also received that um, I took it as mail that came from Green Waste, which I do not feel that um, Green Waste um, as our trash provider should be responsible for sending out information that has to do with our taxes being increased. Um, I disagree with our taxes being increased. I feel that the budget should be balanced somewhere else and us as taxpayers are being asked to shoulder far too much. Um, our trash rates have actually doubled in the last 10 years through green waste. Our water costs are going up, pg e costs are going up, food costs are going up, gas. Everything is going up and we're being asked to shoulder all of this. But yet the county with their budget, I don't see where cuts to the actual county are being made. And I would ask that the taxpayers are not asked to shoulder this. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Peters. We have no additional speakers. All right, then I'll return to the board for action. Sure, yeah. Supervisor Caput. Okay, thank you. Uh, now, the money, uh, it's $110 a year, right? That's correct. That's the first year, though. It has a schedule where every year it increases. And uh, how much is that total when you add up all the uh, property owners? So the, the total for the first year raises about uh, $5.8 million. And this is to fund, um, we have about $52.5 million of improvements needed in order to build the transfer station as well as the organics composting facility. And then there's additional costs for the, for the closure costs of the landfill. Okay, well, what I noticed was that it goes up every year about, uh, <coughs> about 15 to $20, right? Uh, from uh, 2022 to 2023, uh, how, how many years uh, are we talking about this uh, to go on? When, in the year 2030, are we going to still be charging it? 
So right. So what's before the board today is to approve five years worth of rates. Um, but we we are expecting that in order to pay for the the transfer station and the organics processing facility, we're going to have to bond for that. So every five years, we would come back, we would reevaluate the rates and the costs, and come back before the board um, with proposed either increases or decreases to the rates. Okay. <clears throat> Okay, yeah. The only question I have is, uh, is the charge and basically how many years they would go on. Uh, so you're saying after the five years, uh, they, it would uh, be a different rate? Yeah, we, we expect that the bonding for the facilities would be about a 30-year bond. So that's, um, it, it, it could be, you know, for 30 years that we're going to have charges, you know, an assessment or not, that, not an assessment, but the charges for um, for these amounts in order to pay off the bonds for these facilities. Okay, but uh, the money we're collecting is to build some kind of facility at the landfill. landfill. Once it's built and paid for, then why would it continue past the five years? I would I would expect that what would happen that once it's paid off is that we would just have a that the the capital cost to pay for it would be gone and then we would just be left with kind of maintenance of the facilities, which would be a reduction. So I would after 30 years, my expectation would be is that that, that charge would go down once the facility is paid for. Okay. Uh, that, that's my concern. It should go down after five years. It should go down. Well, after after it's paid for. So we're going to be bonding for 30 years. So it would probably after the 30 years. But again, we're going to come back every five years and we reevaluate, have a new cost of service report. So it, it technically will take 30 years to pay it off. Correct. Thank you, Supervisor Cabot. Any further discussion? Yeah, Mr. Chair, I just have a, I think what might be a better way of, of asking the question is what would happen if this was not done? So for, for Casey and or for Mr. Close and Mr. Edler, say uh, we were unable to bond and unable to build and, and given the new state mandates, what would be the impact of the landfill and for the county? So there's uh, a lot of impacts if this doesn't if this doesn't go through. So what would happen is that in you know five to seven years we would close the landfill. So there would be nowhere for county residents or the green waste trucks to take garbage within within the county, other than um, the the Ben Lomond transfer station, which is a, a much smaller facility. So then what would happen is that the garbage trucks would have to, instead of right now, they go and they dump their loads at the Buena Vista landfill. So without a transfer station, they would have to drive individually down to the Marina landfill or the Monterey Regional, which is located in Marina. So you would have individual trucks driving from Santa Cruz County down to Monterey County and back in the individual packer garbage trucks. We've looked at those costs. Those costs would be more expensive than what this charge would be. And you would have additional greenhouse gas emissions with, with garbage trucks driving back and forth. Um, we're planning to electrify our fleet once the technology gets there, which um, we're hoping will get there by the time the transfer facility is there. So there's, um, that's you know some of the impacts. We've also, we've studied many things as well. We've studied rail, the cost of rail to, to you know, ship it out. Um, that is, you know, doesn't pencil out economically at this point. Um, that's, um, you'd have just the amount of facilities and how far you'd have to ship and so forth. So we've looked at many different alternatives. We feel that this one is the best, um, from a cost perspective and still gives the residents a place to take their garbage inside the county. Um, when we all know that illegal dumping is, is constantly a problem. If we don't have a landfill in the county, we, we fully expect that there there to be an increase in illegal dumping as well. And there has been a change in state requirements that have also increased costs for uh, county residents in regards to organics and, and other issues that also drive up general costs in regards to landfill usage, correct? Yeah, that that's true as well. Because I was just speaking about the garbage previously, but there are SB 1383 requires um, all the the organics to be taken out of the regular garbage. So that's, you know, that's additional 
um, additional trucking that would be in separate trucks that would have to go down as well on um, beat hauled out of county as well, where um, th this proposal before the board today is two facilities. So it's, it's transfer station. So allow people to dump their garbage. And it's also a separate facility where we could process organic waste on site at the Buena Vista landfill. Okay. I just, th I just thought it was important to note that, that some of this is supervisor McPherson had noted is just the, the pure age and longevity of the landfill and, and uh, due to both innovation and recycling that it's been preserved as, uh, beyond its its useful life. Then some of it though is, is also additional state mandates that require us to do various things locally. We've not historically been required to do. Um, we can argue the merits of that, but the reality is those are those are unfunded mandates that are coming down that that are uh, that local use uh, rate payers are, that's we share the burden on that or, or shoulder the burden. So um, I understand the questions from Supervisor Kaplan and I appreciate them. I, I just think that the, the counterfactual to this would be catastrophic for a lot of issues within Santa Cruz County, both um, from what I would believe would be a, a significant increase in, in illegal dumping and waste, which is an ongoing issue for all of us in the unincorporated area, uh, additional climate change related issues on GHG issues on transportation costs, and then just uh, the reality that we wouldn't meet state mandates. So uh, as a result of that, I, I will move the recommended actions. Second. Motion by Supervisor Friend, second by Supervisor McPherson. Any further discussion? Seeing none, clerk, roll call vote, please. Supervisor Friend. Aye. Coonerty? Aye. Caput? Aye. McPherson? Aye. And Koenig? Aye. That item passes unanimously. Thank you, Mr. Edler and Mr. Colossa. <laughs> we will now proceed to item nine, public hearing to consider fiscal year 2022-2023 benefit assessment service charge reports for sanitation county service areas two, five, seven, 10, and 20, and adopt resolution confirming the fiscal year 22-23 benefit assessment service charge reports as outlined in the memorandum of the deputy CAO, director of community development and infrastructure. And for a report on this item, we have Ashley Trujillo, civil engineer. Take it away, Ashley. Hey, thank you. So I'm Ashley Trujillo, Senior Engineer for Sanitation Engineering. And on April 12th, 2022, the board adopted the 2022-2023 benefit assessments for the county service areas 2, 5, 7, 10, and 20. And set today as the date of the public hearing on the benefit assessment reports. CPI increase of 4.2% for sewer service charges in CSAs 2, 5, 7, and 20 are necessary to adequately meet the CSA's revenue requirements. No additional um, increase is required for CSA 10. The benefit assessment reports were electronically filed with the clerk of the board for public review on or prior to May 23rd, 2022. Therefore, we recommend that the board open the public hearing and hear objections or protests, if any, to the proposed 2022-2023 benefit assessment service charge reports for the county service areas 2, 5, 7, 10, and 20 and close the public hearing and adopt a resolution confirming the 2022-2023 benefit assessment service charge reports for the various sanitation county service areas. I'm available for questions. Thank you, Ms. Trujillo. I'll open the public uh, hearing on this item. Are there any questions from members of the board? No. Seeing none, is there any member of the public that wishes to address us on this item? Is there anyone on Zoom? We do have a speaker on Zoom, yes. One moment. Call in user two, your microphone is now available. Marilyn Garrett again, more and more and more taxes. Just on this agenda, there are quite a few previous agendas, it adds up. And what are we really getting any benefit from? I see very, very little. And it's disturbing to me where our taxes go. You have plenty of money for the whole infrastructure, 5G, 4G, radiation, facilities, surveillance, uh, money for other things like that. 
and we were asked to pay more and more for more and more damage to the public overall. Very disturbing. Elected representatives should be protecting the public well-being. And unfortunately, I'm not saying that. Having attended board meetings for over 20 years, when I retired from teaching, previous boards would have discussions. They would vote no on certain things when Marty Warmhout and Jan Butes were there. Things would come back. They would have other perspectives presented. This board, no. All corporate, except occasionally, Greg Kappa, thank you for your no votes on occasion. That's all I have to say. Very disturbing. Thank you, Ms. Karen. We have no additional speakers for this item, Chair. All right, I'll return to the board for action. Is there a second? A second. Motion by Supervisor McPherson, second by Supervisor Friend. Any further discussion? Seeing none, clerk, roll call vote, please. Supervisor Friend? Aye. Coonerty? Aye. Caput? Aye. McPherson? Aye. And Koenig? Aye. That item passes unanimously. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Hill, and I'll officially close the public hearing on that item. We now have a regularly scheduled, two regularly scheduled items uh, for 1030. Um, items 13 and 14. So the Board of Supervisors will now recess in order to permit the Board of Directors of the Santa Cruz County Flood Control and Water Conservation District of Zone 5 to convene and carry out a regularly scheduled meeting. And as the chair of the Flood Control and Water Conservation District for Zone 5, I officially call uh, open the meeting. Um, and clerk, if we could begin with a roll call, please. Here. Here. Thank you. Director Friend? Here. Coonerty? Here. Caput? Here. McPherson? Here. Jaff? And Bertrand? Director, you have a quorum. Thank you. Are there any additions or deletions to consent or regular agendas? Good morning. No, this is Rachel Fatuhi with the Stormwater Management Section, Senior Engineer. Uh, there is no addition or deletion to the agenda. All right. Thank you, Ms. Fatuhi. We'll move to item three, oral communications. Does any uh, member of the public wish to address the Zone 5 Flood Control and Water Conservation District? Is there anyone on Zoom? that wishes to address us. We have no speakers on Zoom. All right, then I'll proceed to item four, approval of zone five meeting minutes. <laughs> Any discussion on this item? Any member of the public that wishes to address us on this item? Uh, seeing none, is there a motion to approve? Motion to approve by Supervisor McPherson or Director McPherson. Is there a second? Second, second by Supervisor Friend. Any further discussion? Seeing none, clerk, roll call vote, please. Director Friend? Aye. Coonerty? Aye. Caput? Aye. Koenig? Aye. And McPherson? Aye. That item passes unanimously. All right, the minutes being approved, we'll proceed to item five, action on the consent agenda. Any comments or questions on the consent agenda for members of the board? Seeing none, any members of the public that wish to address us on the consent agenda? Anyone on Zoom? We have no speakers on Zoom. All right. I'll return it uh, to the board for action. Is there a motion? Uh, we move the action and recommend the actions. A second. Motion by Super uh, Director McPherson, second by Director Friend. Any further discussion? Seeing none, clerk roll call vote, please. Director Friend? Aye. Coonerty? Aye. Caput? Aye. Koenig? Aye. And McPherson. Aye. That item passes unanimously. Thank you. And we'll proceed to item eight. Consider changes to the zone five rules and regulations related to section 1.9, method of action, 1.11, election of the zone five board chair, section 3.3, district engineer, and adopt resolution amending resolution number 4-89Z, approving said amendments as outlined in the memorandum of the district engineer. And uh, Ms. Fatui, report on this item. 
so we're uh, presenting this item for changes. The main change we have is uh, uh, initiated when during the last meeting for uh, streamlining the process for the chair and vice chair. And then when we looked at the original, I mean, the current uh, rules and regulations, there are a few changes that became necessary, such as a typo we had from the prior resolution. And also we have the, the Robert, Robert's rule, we changed it to the current practice by the county to Robinson rule, <clears throat> as well as changing the name of the district engineer for public works to the uh, community development that or a new name. So those are the changes we did with this uh, amendment to the Thank you. regulation. Thank you very much. Uh, are there any questions or comments from members of the board? Uh, no, Mr. Chair, as you remember, I brought this item, mentioned this last time just to streamline for future boards, make it simple with the two districts that are most impacted to have the chair, vice chair role in this. So I appreciate the board's consideration. Thank you, Director Friend. Any member of the public that wishes to address us on this item? Anyone on Zoom? No speakers on Zoom, Chair. Thank you. I'll return it to the board for action. I'll move the recommended actions. Second. Motion by Supervisor or Director Friend, second by Director Coonerty. Any further discussion? Seeing none, clerk, roll call vote, please. Director Friend? Aye. Coonerty? Aye. Rapid? Aye. Koenig? Aye. And McPherson? Aye. That item passes unanimously. Thank you. We'll proceed to item nine to consider approval of the proposed fiscal year 22, 23 zone five and zone five expansion construction budgets as outlined in the memorandum of the district engineer. Ms. Yep. Uh, so this item is approving next year's budget uh, zone five construction expansion as well as zone five, which is mainly, zone five is mainly from revenues from annual assessment construction Expansion construction is from impact fees. Uh, so the budget in front of you is um, for the expansion construction. The budget is in the total amount of the, the I'm sorry, um, for operation. Uh, for the operation, we're starting with the operation uh, that total, I mean, recommended finance include an estimated fund balance as of June 30, 2022, a fund balance of a million or 45,587 and a tax levy of 829,700. And the recommended appropriation is 1,875,287, leaving zero in an appropriated revenue. Basically, the revenues are appropriated into expenditures. As for the expansion construction, uh, the recommended financing, including uh, estimated balance as of June 30, 2022, there's a typo here, fund balance of 772,446 and a drainage fees of 160,000. So that's for next fiscal year and permit processing of 240,000. The recommended appropriations are 1,175,446 leaving an estimated zero in an appropriate, an appropriate fund balance. With that, we recommend your approval, or if you have any question, I'll be glad to answer. Thank you. Any questions from members of the board? Seeing none, any members of the public that wish to address us on this item? Uh, is anyone on Zoom? No speakers on Zoom. All right, thank you. Then I'll return it to the board for action. The motion will be in order. I'll move the recommended actions. Second. Motion by Super, our Director Friend, second by Director Coonerty. Any further discussion? Seeing none, Clerk, roll call vote, please. Director Friend? Aye. Coonerty? Aye. Caput? Aye. Koenig? Aye. McPherson? Aye. That item passes unanimously. Thank you. We'll proceed to item 10. Consider adoption of resolution accepting unanticipated revenue of $55,000 in a Santa Cruz County Flood Control and Water Conservation District Zone 5's expansion construction budget as outlined in the memorandum of the district engineer. So uh, for the revenues this fiscal year we're in, we're getting more revenues in reviews than what we anticipated. Uh, so what we allocated early on, we are exceeding that. So we need to uh, accept this and uh, additional revenues so we can continue spending for the remaining part of this fiscal year. And the amount that we uh, underestimated was 50,000. So we're accepting those revenues so we can spend it 
during this fiscal year. Thank you very much. Any questions from the directors? Seeing none, any members of the public that wish to address us on this item? Anyone on Zoom? We do have one speaker on Zoom. All right. One moment. Monica, your microphone is available. Hi, this is for the following item. Thank you. Not for this one. Thanks. Okay, thank you. All right, then I'll return it to the directors for action. I'll move the recommended actions. Second. Motion by Director Friend, second by Director McPherson. Any further discussion? Seeing none, clerk, uh, roll call vote, please. Director Friend? Aye. Coonerty? Aye. Caput? Aye. Koenig? Aye. And McPherson? Aye. That item passes unanimously. Thank you. That brings us to the conclusion of the Zone 5 meeting, and uh, we will now adjourn, and I will hand it to uh, Supervisor Friend as our board chair for uh, the Zone 7 meeting. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Madam Clerk, do you need a minute to promote any of the attendees and to... Yes, uh, please, attend? Chair. Thank you. Let me know when you're okay. There, I believe all of our panelists have been upgraded. Thank you, Madam Clerk, for your help on that. I will now call to order the Santa Cruz County Board of Directors for the Flood Control and Water Conservation District, or Zone 7, for our June 7th meeting. If we could have a roll call, please. Director Koenig? Here. Coonerty? Here. Caput? Aye. Uh, here. McPherson? Here. Culbertson? Bilicic? Here. And friend. Here. And I also saw that uh, Ms. Lucas is here, although she's a non-voting member. We appreciate her attending. Um, Mr. Machado, are there any changes to today's agenda? Uh, thank you, Chair. No changes today. All right, we'll open it up to oral communications. This is an opportunity for members of the community to address us on items that are not on today's agenda, but are within the purview of zone seven. Uh, is there anybody in the chambers that would like to address us on zone seven? Seeing none, is there anybody on Zoom or on the phone that would like to address us? Chair, we do have one speaker. Thank you. Call in user two, your microphone is now available. Um, this is the Flood Control and Water Conservation District, and people have been very diligent overall about water conservation, but we really need to ask the question about the what is causing these extreme droughts um, and um, yeah, and one of the sources of information I recommend for you and anybody listening is geoengineeringwatch.org with Dane Wigington. And one of the things he states is that climate engineering operations are blocking the brain and he cites patents that have been issued for various climate engineering operations. And it's, um, he also recommended on his website seeing the dimming and said, um, climate engineering is the elephant in the room. What we're seeing is not natural weather like we used to see. That's affecting the crops, and we have a big agricultural area in the south of this county. So um, this geoengineering really needs to be halted. Um, so geoengineeringwatch.org. 
uh, think it's <laughs> really disturbing hearing the facts. He also has a program on KSCO Saturday morning, 1080 a.m. for an hour, and you can just hear the facts on geoengineering. That's Thank you, Ms. Garrett. These. Thank you. All right, is there anybody else for all communications, Madam Clerk? We have no additional speakers. Thank you. We'll move on to item four. And before we address the minutes, just um, Director Machado, perhaps moving forward, unless there's something that precludes us, we could add the minutes into the consent agenda so it could be swept, swept into one action if possible. Are there any comments from directors on the minutes? Um, seeing none, is there anybody from the community that would like to address us on the minutes? Anybody online, Madam Clerk? No speakers for this item. All right, we'll bring it back to the board. Director Bilicic, you had a comment? I have a, no, I'd just like to motion to approve. Thank you. We have, a motion. we have a motion from Director Bilicic. I apologize, I missed the second. Uh, motion motion. Director Koenig. Uh, thank you. Um, Madam Clerk, uh, roll call, please. Director Koenig? Aye. Coonerty? Aye. Rapid? Aye. McPherson? Aye. Bilicic? Aye. And friend. All right, we'll move yeah, on to item five. This is act, action on the consent agenda, which are items six and seven. Does any director like to comment on the two items on consent? Is any member of the community, would any member of the community like to address this? I'll come back to you, Dr. Uh, Director Bill. Such is there any member of the community that would like to address this on this item within chambers? Seeing none, is there anybody online that would like to address us on Zoom? We have no speakers on Zoom. All right, I'll bring it back, Director Bill. Such you would have a comment on consent? comment is that I really appreciate uh, item six and the opportunity to teleconference. It's much more convenient and I think efficient too. Thank you, Director Bill. Such anybody else on comments and consent? Uh, seeing none, is there a motion to approve the consent agenda? Motion to approve. Second. second. We have a motion from Director Bill Such and a second from Director Koenig. If we could have a roll call, please. Director Koenig? Aye. Coonerty? Aye. Caput? Aye. McPherson? Aye. Bilicic? Aye. And Friend? Aye. Right. We'll move on to the first item of the regular agenda, which is the program manager's report for Zone 7. This is item number eight. So we're here to consider a status report on the Pajaro River flood management risk, flood risk management project as outlined in the memo of the district engineer. Um, Director Machado, please. Thank you, Chair and Directors. Um, just a couple of highlights on the item before you for our uh, management update. Um, a good piece of information, including your board letter today, is a map of all of the uh, reaches that are under uh, proposed for the um, Pajaro project. And uh, most interestingly is uh, the status of our design progress with the Army Corps of Engineers. Uh, and they are designing reaches five and six. Uh, an update there highlighted in the board letter is uh, that that design will be about 35% complete this fall. Uh, additionally, the board letter highlights uh, some new funding and construction that, that we have celebrated a bit, uh, but I did want to highlight it again. Uh, we did receive $67 million from the federal um, transportation legislation that was approved in um, November. And so that was uh, good news, and that'll go towards that phase one of reaches five and six. Um, so with that, uh, just quick highlights, and then the the last bit I did want to share, and, and we'll talk about it more here in the in the near future, is tomorrow's public hearing for our proposed assessment, uh, which will go towards the maintenance of the capital project that that we're talking about now. So June eighth is tomorrow night in the. Watsonville Chambers at 6.30. Uh, with that, uh, I will conclude my remarks. The recommended action for this item is to accept and file the status report on the Pajaro River Flood Risk Management Project, and I am certainly available to answer any questions. Thank you, Director Machado. The map was a request of this board previously for just clarity on the location, so I appreciate that that has been provided. Are, are there any questions from directors before we open it up to the community? I uh, see none. Is there anyone in chambers that would like to address the board on this item? Uh, Madam Clerk, is there anybody on Zoom? We have no speakers on Zoom, Chair. Great. Uh, this is an action item. I'll bring it back to the board for action. I'll move the recommended actions. Second. 
We have a motion from Director Koenig and a second from Director Bilsich. If we could have a roll call, please. Director Koenig? Aye. Coonerty? Aye. Caffet? Aye. McPherson? Aye. Bilicic? Aye. And Friend? Aye. We'll now move on to item nine, which is a public hearing on zone seven assessment rates for the 22 and 23 fiscal year. We're here to hear any objections and protests, if any, and consider adoption of a resolution confirming the rate report as outlined in the memo of the district engineer. We have a summary of the assessment rates and a resolution in the assessment rates. Uh, Director Masato. Thank you, Chair and Directors. Uh, so this is an annual adoption. Uh, this year's assessment does include a 4% uh, inflationary index. Um, and uh, this does cover the operations and maintenance of our Pajaro River system. Uh, the recommended action is to open the public hearing and hear objections and protests, if any, to the proposed 2223 assessment rate report for Zone 7 and to close the public hearing. And upon conclusion of the hearing, consider adoption of the attached resolution confirming the written report on assessment rates for the 2223 fiscal year. And staff is available to answer any questions you may have. Thank you. Before we open the public hearing, are there any questions from board members on this item? Okay, seeing none, I'd like to now open up the public hearing. Is there any member of the public that would like to address us on this item within chambers? Seeing none, Madam Clerk, is there anybody on Zoom that would like we to address us during the public hearing? We have no speakers on Zoom, Chair. Okay, this will be a final call for comments or protests in regards to this item. Is there anybody that would like to address us during this public hearing? Okay, I'm seeing and hearing none. I will then close the public hearing and bring it back to the board for action. Director Move Bill, approval. I'd like to make a motion for approval. All right, we had a motion from Supervisor Caput. Uh, Director Bilicic, would you second that? Yes, thank okay, you. Okay, then we have a second from Director Bilicic. If we could have a roll call vote, please. Director Koenig? Aye. Coonerty? Aye. Caput? Aye. McPherson? Aye. Bilicic? Aye. And Friend? Aye. And that concludes Zone 7. Appreciation to Director Bilicic for joining us as well as Ms. Lucas. Um, and then I'll turn it back to Chair Koenig for the regular Board of Supervisors agenda. Chair, do we have item 10? Yeah, one more item. One more item. I tried to get us out. <laughs> you wouldn't let me. All right, so let's do uh, item 10. Consider the 22-23, thank you, by the way, Director uh, Machado. Consider the 22-23 proposed budget for Zone 7 and accept and file the semi-annual levy inspection reports as outlined in the memo of the district engineer. We have the Zone 7 budget. They have uh, the budget narrative, the levy inspection report uh, for both 21 and 22, and the table as the attachments. Director Machado, please. Thank you, Chair and Directors. Uh, so the item before you is our 22-23 proposed budget. Uh, the proposed budget includes expenditures of $4,683,279. Uh, those expenditures are funded from three sources. Uh, first is the fund balance of 97,444. Uh, the second is grant revenues of 2,336,739. And the third revenue source is our assessments uh, at $2,249,096. Uh, a critical piece here to really explain this proposed expenditure is attachment B, our budget narrative information. These are our proposed expenditures. Um, I believe it's a good report. Uh, it's, it's complete, and we certainly can answer any questions that you may have. The recommended action uh, this morning is to consider approval of the 22-23 proposed budget for the Santa Cruz County Flood Control and Water Conservation District Zone 7, and to accept and file the semi-annual levy inspection reports. I'm available to answer any questions you may have. Thank you, Director Machado. Are there any board members that have questions on the budget? On the proposal? Can, I, can I have a comment? Please, Director Bell such. I just want to say how much I appreciate all the detailed work, um, all the inspections that were done. This is pretty comprehensive. And, uh, you know, it tells us what condition everything is in. It's really a um, nice report. So I appreciate your, um, your fine work. Thank you. Any other directors with questions or comments before we open it up to the public? Uh, seeing none, is there anybody in chambers that would like to address us on the proposed budget? Also seeing none, is there anybody, Madam Clerk, on Zoom? We have no speakers on Zoom, Chair. Okay, I'll bring it back to the board for action. Is there a motion? I'll make a motion to approve the new budget. Second. And the 
We have a motion uh, for the recommended actions from Director Bilicic and a second from Director Koenig. If we could have a roll call vote, please. Director Koenig? Aye. Coonerty? Aye. Caput? Aye. McPherson? Aye. Bilicic? Aye. And Friend? Aye. And now we will actually conclude the item. And my appreciation that I expressed previously did not go away for Director Bilicic and others that attended the meeting. Thank you, uh, Director Machado. I'll hand it back to um, Chair Koenig for the regularly scheduled Board of Supervisors next item. Thank you, Supervisor Friend. I will now resume the regular meeting of the Santa Cruz County Board of Supervisors. Uh, I will thank everyone for their patience. We are almost at the item I think most of you are here to discuss, which is item 11. Uh, but first, item 10, public hearing to consider resolution confirming proposed fiscal year 22-23 assessment service charge reports for county service area 12, wastewater management, as outlined in the memorandum of the Director of Health Services. And for a report on this item, we have our Director of Health Services, Monica Morales, and Director of Environmental Health, Marilyn Underwood. Please. Good morning. So thank you. As you described, uh, Chair Cooney, this is a public hearing for the assessment community services charges number 12, wastewater management for physical year 22 and 23. As a reminder, the CSA 12 was created in 1990, and it was in an effort to address the concerns pertaining to the failing on-site wastewater treatment systems in the county. So as such, with the passage of the local agency management program in October of 2021, the CSA actually became mandatory. What we're trying to do here today is follow up on our discussion for May 10th, where you adopted the benefit assessment services charges for CSA 12. Today's meeting is really for us to come back um, as you've adopted the resolution that June 7 would be the date for us to have the hearing, the public hearing on this. As such, I wanna pass it to Director Underwood to give you more of the details of what this proposal entails that we presented to you as well in May of this year. The gray button on the microphone. Thank, thank you. you. Good morning, Supervisor Koenig and board. Uh, thank you, Dr. Morales for, Director Morales for your uh, opening remarks. Again, as she has said that this, the, we're talking with you about the service charges for CSA 12 and 12A and 12N. These are all part of a wastewater, on-site wastewater treatment system oversight. I'll call them OTS, trying to get away from the word septic systems uh, as they become more uh, fancy. Uh, these, this this uh, CSA was created back in 1990 and it really was some forward thinking by the board at that time time about the need for a program to oversee septic tank maintenance, uh, septic system disposal in general, uh, in the whole county, but in particular in the San Lorenzo Valley watershed because of its importance, obviously, to our water quality. And we know that we have impacts around the county that was summarized in our LAMP that I'll talk about in a minute. Um, and then in 1993, the board created 12N, which I will also talk about a little bit, which are these specific uh, service charges uh, for a particular, what we call non standard systems. Um, we've been performing these activities since uh, 1990 and 1994 and overseeing these systems. And in fact, there's been no increase in the CSA 12 and 12A charges since 1996. Uh, and in, uh, since 2009, there was a change in the 12N. And as you're all very well aware that the state required us uh, with the passage of a state law and also their state policy in 2012, that we develop minimum standards, uh, that we develop a program that meets the minimum standards they set forth uh, in something called the Local Agency Management Program, the called LAMP. Uh, we did submit um, a LAMP to the board and it was approved on October 14th last year, which allows us to continue to see oversee uh, um, uh, on-site OTS permitting and inspections in this county. In the LAMP and in the state minimum standards, we had to do additional activities. Ironically, most of these are the activities that are already covered under CSA funds. So they not only require us to continue doing those activities, but we need to do a lot of reporting back to the state. And in fact, we need to expand some of our activities, uh, particularly in the groundwater and surface monitoring um, areas. Um, 
So I did an extensive study to look at the cost that it, uh, it will take to carry out these activities that was included in the staff report in the May 10th meeting. So these are reasonable costs to carry out these activities. Um, they do, um, in the again, the thing that you already approved with the service charge increases uh, for CSA 12, this is throughout the county unincorporated that have a um, an OTS system on their parcel. It would go from $6.90 to $33.32. Uh, in CSA 12A, this is within the uh, San Lorenzo Valley watershed. It will go from $18.54 to 2314. And finally, for those um, that have non-standard systems, so we're proposing a change in just the um, two, two of the three systems. Uh, those that have non-conforming, that's a conventional septic system, they needed to do a repair. In some cases, we allow them to do that repair without meeting upgrade standards. Uh, it does come with the caveat that they can't do any expansion of their home and upon this transfer of the property, it does need, need to be upgraded to current standards. We're proposing a change from 101 to 331 or you've approved, I should say, 101 to 331. And then lastly, our alternative systems. These are systems that uh, enhance systems that have a lot of bells and whistles and need to be overseen to keep making sure that they're acting properly, meaning that they are treating the sewage before it's discharged or a leach field. These kind of systems are required when say there's not enough groundwater separation or the stream setback issues. These are becoming more and more uh, prevalent in our county because of the, the, the site constraints that we have. Currently, we have somewhere around 900 of those. Uh, we Most of them have what we call as an on-site service provider, an OSSP. We require that under the new LAMP that they have a commercial entity to do this work and make sure that once a year we get a report from them. For that, we're not changing any um, service charge. It would still be $167, no change. About 800 of the our parcels already do that. We really want to get everybody to join the commercial, uh, but we did cost out the estimate that it cost for us to enforce and IE inspect those systems if they don't take on an OSSP provider. And for that, it were, uh, you have approved an increase from 501 to 1,326. Uh, again, we think these are reasonable costs to cover the expenditures to do this work, uh, especially under the LAMP. With this, uh, we the uh, recommended actions are used for to open a public hearing, hear support objections or protest, if any, to proposed fiscal year 2023-22-23 assessment service charge report for the county service area 12, waste matter management, and to close the public hearing and adopt a resolution confirming the proposed fiscal year 2022-23 assessment service charge re reports for county service area 12 wastewater management. Thank you. Thank you, Director Underwood and Director Morales. Uh, before I open the public hearing, are there any questions from members of the board? Um, I'd like to make a couple of comments. Um, this has been a long time coming. As you said, uh, this was created, uh, CSA 12 was created in 1991, and we haven't seen an, an increase since 1996. Um, and in those 30 years or so, uh, the population and housing uh, have been uh, greatly increased. Um, and you've heard me maybe say it before that there was one report at least 10 years ago that said uh, the density of septic tanks in the San Rosa Valley is probably greater uh, of any community west of the Mississippi. So we, we need to do something about this. It's as was stated by Ms. Underwood about the critical factor that uh, the septic systems play in our water system that in the San Lorenzo River in particular that are so vital to our uh, water sources that we have in Santa Cruz County. Um, I really want to thank the environmental health for working on this issue. It's been a long time coming. And once again, we are dealing locally, as we had previously in another item, uh, how to respond to state mandates. And this is a case that's related to the environmental aspects of septic systems. So these increases will allow the county to provide the kind of service required by the state in terms of oversight of septic systems. It's been a long time coming and it's much needed and uh, I appreciate the work that everybody has put into it. Thank you. Thank you, Supervisor McPherson. Further comments or questions? Seeing none, I will open the public hearing. Is there any member of the public that wishes to address us on this item? Seeing none in chambers, is there any member uh, of the public on Zoom that wishes to address us on the item? We do have a speaker on Zoom. Oh. My apologies, they've put, okay, they've put their hand back up, yes. 
Call in user two, your microphone is now available. More, more taxes. Wow, this agenda is loaded with that. I have a request when the staff report takes place, please spell out the acronyms. I, there's a lot of them you listed. And could you repeat the one? I want to make comments first, but you changed septic tank waste to what um, seems like language is often euphemisms to um, cover up um, things that aren't so pleasant. And I also wonder with the, um, uh, the groundwater and the surface water, we really need to have rules that state for instance, no pesticides, polluters are polluting the surface and groundwater. Why is that permitted? That shouldn't be allowed at all. And there are thousands of chemicals, including in this recent Soquel Creek water, what they call pure water, poop water, that you cannot remove all the pharmaceuticals and toxins from. This is further polluting things. It really seems like there is a lack of ecological common sense uh, problem solutions taking place. So again, I'm opposed to this increase and please tell me what you change septic tank waste to what? Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Garrett. Are there any, so anyone else wishes to address us on Zoom? We have no additional speakers, Chair. All right, and uh, Director Underwood, would you like to define OTS? Sure. OTS is on-site wastewater treatment system, and it's been replacing septic just because we do have so many enhanced treatments that the term septic system is no longer relevant. Thank you. All right, I'll officially close the public hearing and return it to the board for action. Motion would be in order. I'll move the recommended actions. Second. Okay, uh, motion by Supervisor Friend, second by Supervisor Coonerty. Any further discussion? Seeing none, clerk, roll call vote, please. Supervisor Friend? Aye. Coonerty? Aye. Caput? Aye. McPherson? Aye. And Koenig? Aye. This item passes unanimously. Thank you. We'll now proceed to item 11, to consider approval of recommended awards from the collective of results and evidence-based, that is core investments requests for proposals, process and approve agreement between city of Santa Cruz and county related to core funding and contract administration, direct the human services department to return on June 28th, 2022 with final core contract awards, direct the human services department to return on or before February 28th, 2023, with an update on the evaluation of the core RFP process and community stakeholder process and take related actions as outlined in the memorandum of the Director of Human Services. For presentation on this item, we have our Director of Human Services, Randy Morris, and Assistant Director, Kimberly Peterson. Take it away. Uh, thank you. Uh, good morning, Chair Koenig and members of the board, um, public watching and um, members of the public who are here. Um, I am Randy Morris, Human Service Director, joined by Kimberly Peterson, uh, Assistant Director, as uh, Chair Koenig described. Um, appreciate coordination with the clerk of the board who's going to queue up a PowerPoint um, in, in a minute to go through today's presentation, but I'd like to make a few introductory comments um, in part in recognition of the um, emotion and passion and investment this community has in this program for 40 years. Um, I'm mindful of the point in history I play in this. Um, the first is I wanna take a moment to recognize not going through names, but just generically speaking to this is a collaboration with the city of Santa Cruz who Kimberly and I will be in front of this afternoon. This is a two, dual jurisdiction uh, funding matter with city funds and county funds and our partnership with city staff, but a host of county staff and other support staff that um, were a team that helped us uh, move this uh, request for proposal and competitive procurement to where we are today. 
And we anticipated, um, given the challenge in front of us, and there were some public comments during general comment this morning, um, the, the complicated position that we're all in when you have tens of twenties of thirties of millions of dollars of unmet need in this community, and you only have five or $6 million to spread around. It is a complicated moment for the service providers currently funded for those who have been waiting for years and years to be able to have this opportunity to apply and get funding um, for us as staff to establish a fair process. And for you as our elected body to sort of figure out how to respond to the um, passion and emotions. But I stand here very proud as the human services director, um, to give you a presentation with Kimberly that outlines what we did to execute that which the community asked us to do and what your board approved, which were the rules and the parameters that were in the competitive procurement. So um, thank you to the human services and city of Santa Cruz uh, team that helped us um, do all the work that you'll hear about today. The second comment I wanna make is uh, I do wanna recognize that this is a process that has been in motion for generations before me and this particular board. Um, this is a program that 40 years ago, this board of supervisors were providing services through local general fund money to help a number of our local service providers help the community. And for 35 years, the process took place in one sort of way. And that was a lot of what's in the chambers behind me today. And that is people who are providing service and the consumers that they serve coming to your board during budget hearings with great passion and pride in what they do, asking your board to give them more money to do more of that good work. And the shadow to that was a lot of service providers who were asking, how do I get some of that money? <laughs> so that led to an action that occurred five years ago today. And that was for the first time ever after 35 years, your board approved actually for the first time ever, actually putting that money out through a competition called a request for proposal where service providers had to apply for money. And what occurred five years ago was not very many changes. There was a few, there was a lot of passion, there was a lot of debate, there was a lot of fight. And actually your board um, responded to one of those fights to resource some funding and approved giving the money back, even though the procurement led to some cuts. So I wanna recognize as somebody is newer to the community that this is a moment after 40 years where there is for the first time ever change. And we are gonna talk about how we got to this moment, the process we established and why we believe this makes sense, what we have in front of you today. But I feel like I need to recognize that this is the first time there's change where there is a shifting of um, dollars between which service provider delivers what. I want to take a moment to balance um, two comments. One is, I feel it's my responsibility to express, though not surprised, a little bit of disappointment in some of the narratives that are in the community that from what I see are factually incorrect. So my hope is that throughout this presentation, your board as our elected officials who have the ultimate decision making responsibility will have full information to make a fully informed decision. You will hear throughout the presentation a number of facts about what played out. And I just wanna highlight two because there is a lot of emailing going around requesting people come to this board with talking points to do, and I just wanna name two things. Number one, basically stop these cuts. The package in front of you today represents an 11% increase or $545,000 of more money than is in place today. So this is proposal is an 11% increase now, from the individual provider perspective, there are cuts to particular agencies, but there are new agencies and the overall package is a $545,000 increase in services or 11%. So just as you hear the comments about cuts, I appreciate and understand from a particular agency who is getting cuts, I get it, but there is not overall cuts to the safety net of services. There's a pretty large increase. And the second is comments that service providers who are getting cuts had absolutely no notice that this was coming and the rugs being pulled out from under them. Five years ago, those who have contracts today were given three years of contract money. Your board approved a one-year extension to align with the two-year budget cycle this board adopted for this first time, which gave them a fourth year of funding, which to the shadow, the CBOs who wanted to get this money had to wait another year. 
And then the pandemic, this board moved it forward yet another year. So the current providers had five years of knowledge that this dollar was going to be put out for competitive bid. And so I expressed my disappointment that there are comments being made that there was no notice. So those are just two examples. And my interest in sharing this is just to make sure, as I see it, the facts are on the table. Uh, my final comment, um, I want to take the moment to share what I believe is my role as the Human Services Department Director, who this is not our money. This is the only moment that we come to you as a department um, with recommendations for money that is yours. 40 years ago, the board asked the Human Services Department to manage the contracts, and we've carried on that tradition, and now we're managing the second procurement ever. But our job in a democracy that's functioning well is to do what you've directed us to do, to do it fairly, to describe the rules, but also to what I anticipate we're going to hear in public comment is to recognize that a functioning democracy involves passion, healthy debate, and what I hope is respectful disagreement. If at the end of that, your board has all the information you need to make an informed decision to accept our recommendations, I feel like we've done our job. But I want to end my introductory comments before we pull up the PowerPoint by sharing with you what I see as a bigger concern of mine. If the economists' predictions are true, the human services department that manages $170 million and the health service agency that manages probably $200 million, we are likely going to be at a moment in the future we're going to have to be dealing with big cuts. So it is never a comfortable moment for service providers, clients who get services from service providers, for us as staff or your board to have to make difficult decisions about cuts. I appreciate that, but I am hoping the end result of this conversation is your board is in a position to make an informed decision and you have all the facts and we welcome hard questions and we will listen closely to public comment as well. So thank you for the moment to share my perspective on this. Mindful, this is a bit of a historic moment and clerk of the board, if you could pull up the PowerPoint. So if you could go to the next slide. So this is a quick overview of what uh, I will be covering along with Kimberly. Uh, quick repeat of the recommended actions um, with a little bit of detail. Um, talk about a little bit of the history evolution of core that got us today. I think that foundation is important. We are gonna then give a summary of the applications that were received. And then to what I think is some of the most important moments for the public discourse and for your board's deliberation is for us to describe in some detail that are in the public materials, the process we put in place to move this process forward to ensure a fair application process and um, the recommended wars are done through a fair way. And also um, the funding recommendations and the role us staff had in making a few adjustments that you gave us um, uh, parameters to work within in the RFP. And then we'll end with um, talking about the role we have as county with city and end with the next steps to summarize what's coming after today's hearing between now and when we hope this um, budget passes at the end of the fiscal year. So next slide. So here's a summary of the recommended actions. I wanna take a minute to talk about today's um, ask of you on item number one, which is to approve the recommended awards. I wanna be clear that this is the first of three steps in the process. Today is not the final moment for your board to make the decision about who gets awards. Per the terms of the RFP, there is a significant adjustment in the sequence of events from what happened five years ago. And that is because of the Omicron variant. The service providers asked and we agreed with their request to delay the application deadline by a month. We came to your board in January to ask for you to approve that delay. And we came back in March to outline the uh, implications of supporting that delay, which led to us having to get board approval to change the appeal process. Because we had to get complete this process in time to, for the fiscal year. So what that has done is last time, five years ago, most major decisions were made at this moment in time when the rewards, and then there was appeal process and then it got brought back to the board to sort of just stamp approval for the budget at the end of the year. Today is step one. You'll hear um, 
from the community. You'll deliberate, you'll ask us questions. We are recommending you approve the package of awards. This morning, all the service providers were, uh, per the terms of the RFP, given notice by every single application, whether they're being recommended forward to a day or whether they are not, and their individual score. That triggers the appeal process. That is the second step, and that is my recommendation to your board when you hear concerns and passion and arguments about keeping is to recommend the applicants file an appeal. That is the rules of this procurement. After the appeal process is completed, then the last moment is on June 28th, which is recommended action number three, where service providers, if the appeal is not upheld, they have a chance to lobby, to call you, and to come back to the board on June 28th, at which point you make your final decisions. That was a bit of a different of sequence. So I wanna take a moment to make sure you understand that the request to approve recommended awards today is not the final moment. There are two more steps. Second, this is the first time that the city and county funding is actually per terms of our agreement braided. And the plan is for the county to hold all the contracts. So we have an agreement established and approved by both legal counsels in the package. And as Chair Koenig, you uh, listed, we ask you to direct us to return on the 28th where you will make your final decisions. And we have some technical items we need your support for to execute contracts. And then we will talk briefly in Kimberly's presentation about um, initiating a review process and a lessons learned process in the summer and coming back um, early next calendar year to provide an update on sort of how the contracts have moved forward and the lessons learned. So next slide. Um, evolution of core. Um, it strikes me that this storyline listed here is really important to recognize what the rules are in, are in this RFP today and what we as staff did to execute the rules in that RFP. For 35 years, as I described in my introductory comments, community service providers came forward during budget hearings, made their arguments, your board deliberated and contracts were executed. When the process shifted to what's called core, the very first RFP was built upon four strategic plans and those strategic plans were informed in varying degrees by the community. And those were the building blocks of how to determine how to, um, for the first time ever, award funds based on those four strategic plans. This process led to bringing everything to your board and to the city council on the same days. And then we, which will be the bulk of our presentation, implemented your agreements. And I'm gonna walk through these in a little bit more detail in the next few slides. If you can move the slide forward. So the community informed process I just listed, the community programs, the first RFP. Since the awards were issued five years ago, there have been five years of community engagement sessions with the service providers and other providers who wanted to be able to gain uh, contracts through the next procurement for the last basically four years. And then we uh, engaged the community more intentionally as we prepared for today. We had five stakeholder meetings that played out last summer where the service providers who have contracts today and those who wanted to apply for contracts had an opportunity to give us as staff feedback, which then informed what we brought to your board to approve. And if you can go to the next slide, I'll share a bit more. Before the terms of this RFP were approved by your board, there were seven public meetings where current service providers had an opportunity to speak publicly about what they felt the terms of this RFP should be. We were in front of you in February of 21. We were back in front of you in September of 21. And we came forward to you in November of 21 with the draft RFP. The city had two uh, city council meetings and two community program committee meetings. So those seven meetings were opportunities that were made available to the service providers to share what they believe should be the terms of this RFP. The terms of this RSP are as much informed by the parameters that your board approved. And my final comments are, and what were not included in 
the parameters of the board. And this is where I want to um, have my last comment here be a pivot to what governed the terms of this RFP. Through those five stakeholder meetings and those seven public meetings, there were 12 opportunities for the current service providers to share their perspective about choosing to prioritize a particular core condition of well being, to prioritize a particular population, to prioritize a particular region, or for a particular provider to say why they felt they deserved carve out money and that they didn't have to compete for it. And to the best of my knowledge, and I've reviewed all 12 of those forums, not once did it come up, and therefore the terms of this part RFP did not direct or instruct us to organize the application process, the panel review process, or therefore what we're bringing forward to you based on any prioritization. That is a very important fact because as staff, it was not our place to manipulate the application process and the ranking process to recommend awards, prioritize anything, because those 12 moments did not leave to anybody recommend we do so. So if you go to the next slide. So this put us in the position of executing what your board approved as informed by those multiple opportunities for stakeholders to share what they felt should be the rules in this RFP. First, and I will say more of this in my closing slides, this was a collaboration with the county and the city because the city shares in the funding and we work together every step of the way. Second, to my earlier comments, there are a number of service providers who have not had access to this money for, for sure 35 years. And in the last RFP, if they were not awarded any money for really 40 years, to create a level playing field, we put in place a technical assistance program to help make sure all service providers had a fair opportunity to apply for these funds. And as is articulated in the materials, there were 64 training sessions provided before the applications were due that ended up supporting 298 participants to help make sure everybody interested in applying had opportunity for some technical assistance to submit a qualified application. I'm going to end my comments by referencing these final three bullets, and then I'm going to turn it over to Kimberly, who's going to share what I believe is the crux of what we believe is fair and open and uh, pieces of information for public comment and for your board to focus your questions to us. How did we execute to make sure that this process was fair, the rankings were fair, and the recommended in front of wards in front of you were following the terms of this RFP that this board approved? It involved a process of recruiting and training and supporting panel members. It involved a process of creating a scoring rubric that was used that was targeting each of the individual tier groups. And in the end, it involved us as staff within the parameters you approved, bringing forward of some modest adjustments to ensure we could get the most amount of awards out to the community possible. And Kimberly's presentation is gonna cover these in much more uh, detail. And the materials also include a lot of information about these details. I'm gonna turn it over to Kimberly now, and I will come back at the end to close out um, with the next steps. Thank you. Thank you, Randy. Can you hear me okay? okay? So as you may recall, and as Randy mentioned, these are the, what you're looking at is the total number of proposals received as of March 4th, 2022, which was following a one month extension of the initial deadline. At the time that we extended the deadline, we knew it would have implications further down the line in the process, which meant a truncated timeline for reviewing proposals, analyzing and submitting recommended awards, as well as a truncated appeal timeline. What you can see in this graph is that there were 127 applications received. This represented 70, 127 applications from 78 agencies. We received 79 applications for new programs and 48 applications from existing programs. And as you can see, there were nearly $16 million worth of requests, which was more than two and a half times the available amount of funding. What you can also see when you look at the uh, column under the small tier, is that there were fewer small tier proposals than there was available funding. 
And as we will discuss a little bit more, we took a portion of the remaining funding and moved it into other tiers. And just to set up a moment of context, this RFP was set up through um, through tiers based on the uh, amount of funding requested by each applicant. And that's what you were seeing on the last slide. As it relates to the panel process, though we had a truncated timeline, we worked to ensure that there process was still thorough and fair. Extensive outreach was done to recruit panelists with reference to the feedback that had been received from um, lessons learned from the prior RFP to have a, a local and diverse representation on the panels. We had uh, 58 panelists. All panelists uh, went through a training that was provided on the scoring rubric. There was a scoring rub rubric for each tier level. And following each panelist's opportunity to review the proposals and score them on their own, uh, there was um, each panel reconvened to discuss any discrepancies or variances among their scores. <clears throat> and they had an opportunity to change those scores if they chose following that meeting. During the panel review period, the panelists had support from the core team if they had any questions regarding the process during the course of their review. We had 19 panels and they were organized by core condition of all the applications received. Panelists were assigned based on their connection to the core conditions of the proposals and demographics. As mentioned, we were striving for a locally representative diverse group of panelists. Once all panelists had submitted their scores, met with their fellow panel members, and had an opportunity to adjust their scores if they chose, then the final scores were averaged for each application and utilized to determine the final score of the proposal and the final scores were used in the ranking process for each tier. <laughs> Funding recommendations. So since applicants submitted their proposals at the end of February or early March, we recognize that people have been very eager to know the results. On May 26th, we sent an app so we sent uh, an email to all applicants, letting them know that the funding recommendations would be presented at the June 7th board meeting, and that we would send them the link to the materials once they were published. Last Thursday on June 2nd, we sent all applicants a follow-up email, letting them know that the board meeting materials had been published and that their formal notification of their awards and whether they are being recommended for an award or not, would be emailed to them on the morning of June 7th. That formal email triggers the appeal process, which will then end June 10th, this Friday, at the close of business. The appeal period had been adjusted due to the truncated timeline as referenced earlier. And we want to acknowledge that had we sent the formal notifications to applicants at the same time that the board materials were, were published, it was something we considered, then that notification would have triggered the appeal timeline, providing applicants less time to appeal if they chose to. We recognize there's been a number of inquiries regarding releasing the scores and the full list of applicants publicly. Um, we had not done that um, for a couple of reasons. Um, one was that we were we had referred back to what process had been followed during the last round of the um, RFP cycle. And at that time, uh, only recommended uh, proposals were published in the materials. And the other reason that we hadn't done it, it was uh, out of respect for organizations that were uh, not funded and providing them an opportunity to see their own scores um, and consider what they wanted to do with that information. 
This morning, uh, as Randy mentioned, all applicants were emailed the, their formal notification of the results and their score. They were also provided a link to the Human Services Department core website, which includes additional information regarding the RFP process, including the scoring matrix, uh, training documents, and other materials. I will also acknowledge that in light of the, the number of requests that we have received over the um, last few days from a number of organizations and, and elected officials um, to provide the full list of applicants and in some cases rankings or scores. We did also provide the information of all applicants by tier with high level buckets um, for the most competitive applications by tier. So following the entire uh, review and scoring process, we did, um, staff did utilize some of the discretion allowed within the RFP to make some minor adjustments. As mentioned, there were fewer applications received in the small tier than we had funding available. So, and following the scoring of the small tier funds, we established a, a minimum score of 68 to recommend for funding and move the remaining funding over to the medium and large tiers. We also use staff discretion to make a slight uh, to make a slight 3% adjustment to all medium, large and targeted impact grants, allowing us to utilize all available funding and also fund two more medium and large tier proposals. Finally, during the March 8th board meeting, there had been direction to carve out funding for SEALs meal, senior meals programs and align that award with the award that was made by the Area Agency on Aging for Senior Meals. So we did that. And that proposal was included with the large tier proposals and uh, is being recommended within that category along with the other large tier proposals for a recommended funding of $436,000 as is in the materials. Thanks, Mike. So uh, Randy's described the, the process that led um, that led up to this RFP and the, the, um, the efforts for community and stakeholder engagement um, that have taken place up to this time. And also in defining the RFP, it was really, um, it was community driven in the sense that it was up to the applicants to define the need in the community. Equity is, was a, a central part of this RFP as well. And applicants were to describe the need in the community, the inequity that they viewed, and um, how they would um, address it. Equity was also a central part of the process from the perspective of providing an equitable opportunity for applicants, and from the perspective of applicants defining the inequity they would address. As you will see in the next few slides, in many areas, the recommended awards reflect the proposals submitted in a number of areas. I will speak to where the recommended awards also reflect the awards from the prior RFP cycle. Next slide, please. So this RFP was built around the core conditions of well-being. And what this graph represents is the percentage of funding requested by core condition from all the applications received with a comparison to the applications received uh, to the applications proposed um, recommended for funding. You can see that across most areas, the recommended awards are very similar to the proposed awards. The largest variance uh, down is a 5% in the stable affordable housing area with thriving families, which represents, to tell you more about that core condition, it means safe nurturing relationships and environments that promote optimal health and well-being of all family members across generations. In that category, thriving families, there's a higher variance of recommended awards, as you can see. 
Through the core framework, though the, for, though the core framework has a number of interconnected conditions supporting overall equitable health and well being for county residents, um, applicants had to select one primary core condition, though their program may intersect with others. For example, the watershed rangers proposal is a lifelong learning and education core condition category proposal, though it can also be connected to healthy environments. So this slide's showing a couple things. Um, on the far left column, the population U 200% FPL represents the low income population under 200% of the federal poverty level in each of the listed regions. The middle column proposed represents the funding requested to serve those regions. And the column to the right is the distribution of funding of the recommended awards. In most categories, the recommended funding closely represents the funded funding proposed. It also closely reflects the current distribution of funding through the current core contracts. Uh, some might notice that the low income population in South County is higher. And this could be interpreted to show that there's less funding going to South County, though the, the highest proportion of funds is actually directed to South County where there are higher poverty levels. I can also note that Watsonville has a community um, has community programs where the city gives funding to um, community based organizations. And um, at the same time, the city of Santa Cruz has partnered in this core process, adding a million dollars to this core RFP process. Hence, you can see that there is one 1% uh, 1 <laughs> higher recommended awards for the city of Santa Cruz compared to what is recommended. But it's 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 um, it's not completely out of line with the funding available in the process. Next slide, please. What you see here, this graph is similar to what you saw on the prior slide, broken down by age. I can also tell you that the percentage of funding recommended for uh, for seniors, um, we've heard many questions about that, is consistent with the percentage of core funding currently directed um, for seniors in the current core contracts. And this graph is also similar to the prior two you've seen. Um, it's the recommended awards broken down by race and ethnicity. And as you can see again, um, the recommended awards are pretty close to the proposed awards. Again, referencing back that the, this was a community defined applicants put forth where they felt the need was and the recommended rewards closely reflect um, where the uh, organizations said they felt there was a need. I can also say that these awards also closely ref reflect the distribution of funds through current core contracts. Um, one area where there is an, um, a notable increase is that um, for the Latinx community, uh, currently about 43% of funds go to serve the Latinx community and in the recommended awards, uh, there's 50% of funds serving the community, which does more closely align with the population as well. Thank you. Okay, we are almost there. Um, I have two more slides. We'll close it out and turn it back to the board. Um, Want to take a moment to recognize that, as I said earlier this afternoon, because this is both jurisdictions of the county and the city, Kimberly and I will be in front of the city council at 430. And just want to give a quick highlight to share with you why there's the um, agreement attached. Uh, this was a collaboration throughout. Um, there were shared presentations uh, publicly with their city council in the afternoon of most of the presentations here at the board uh, building up to this moment. This is the first time ever bullet point two that all the funds are proposed to be braided. Uh, the current core contracts, um, some of the feedback we heard from the core uh, service providers is they have a contract with the county and then they have a contract with the city, even though it's the same program and how complex that is. 
So we heard that. And so uh, staff worked together to um, recommend that all of the core contracts are braided together. And the third bullet, the city agreed that um, the way to administer that, since we have um, five, six of the funds is to have the county actually hold the contracts. So to ensure um, the city can feel comfortable with their money being journaled to us and built into the singular contracts where there's blended funding, that led to a formal agreement that is one of the recommended actions in front of you that has been reviewed thoroughly by our county council and their city attorney's office to sort of govern how this um, shared funding and over uh, county holding the contracts um, are managed. So the next slide is just to close out with some next steps and I'll make a quick final comment as well. Um, I wanna repeat, um, you are likely, cause you have already gotten a lot of letters and a lot of lobbying and you're likely to hear a lot of public comments about asking you to take actions today to change what's in front of you. Mindful of the history here, there was a reason this changed from appeals being made at a budget board hearing and you deliberating and recommending awards in that moment to this process was to follow these rules. And so these rules, which are in the RFP as informed by the community and approved by you are to have the next step to be to file an appeal. So I just wanna highlight that to me, one of my biggest concerns about this process, this is ultimately your decision as a board, is changing the rules or shifting the process raises the question, why did we spend this time putting this process together? So I would recommend the focus be in the conversation about the process, the ranking, et cetera. And then unless there is any indication of anything that raises question about our confidence that the process was fair, I would recommend that the next step in the process be followed, which is all applicants which have been noticed this morning can file an appeal. As I described earlier, the next step after that is that um, depending on the results of the appeal, if an appeal is not supported, those applicants have an opportunity between that moment, which is there's one week for a county, which is the general service department as the overseer of most purchasing in this county. Um, that will be one week, and then they will have the last two weeks before the 28th to make their final case and come to the June 28th final awards moment to make where you ultimately and then the city council after you have an opportunity to make final awards. Wherever this process lands after June 28th, um, and we'll articulate this in more detail at that June 28th hearing, um, we will then spend the summer executing contracts, including an action on June 28th, asking for your support to be begin issuing funds to new service providers and service providers or carrier so, so services can continue. And then we plan to initiate an evaluation process. Um, initiating a collective impact process and shifting a process from 35 years and for the first time ever, the RFP five years ago that le led to small changes, it is expected that there's gonna be a lot of thoughts and feedback that we wanna harness over the fall and then capture that so that when we have a future RFP, we can take those lessons learned. So um, the final slide is just to close, to turn it back to your board. I wanna repeat what I said. Um, in my introductory comments, this is a difficult moment. Um, these recommended awards honor the process your board asked us to follow. We respect the passion and the debate that's gonna follow. And ultimately, I hope that unless you find any um, fault in the process that we executed, that you support our recommended awards. Thank you. Thank you, Director Morris. Thank you, Assistant Director Peterson. Other questions or comments from members of the board? Mr. Chair, I'd like I'd just like yeah. to get a public comment to hear the testimony on these on these items before we uh, come back to our questions. All right, uh, Supervisor Coonerty. Very quickly, uh, can you describe the what the appeals process will be so that um, the folks in the public who are concerned know what know what that looks like over the next two weeks? So applicants have uh, three uh, three days to appeal following today. Um, they can submit their, they would be submitting their appeal to the uh, general services department who would then follow up uh, on um, investigating the, the request. The applicants would receive a response within five uh, business days, which would be next uh, next Friday. 
And then uh, following the appeal process, then we will be coming back to you on June 28th. And, and I would like to just piggyback, um, if I understand your question, Supervisor Coonerty, if, if um, people concerned about this are not familiar with public procurement um, and appeal process, the, the reason why the General Service Department is the body that will review the appeal is for many reasons. One is they are the department that primarily manages all RFPs and public procurement and purchasing. And they are an independent third party by design from us who did not... Um, have a role in reviewing and seeing these. So it creates an independent third party review to read the applicant's um, grievance and have an independent eye to determine if there's any merit to it. And the investigation from my experience with general service department time here is pretty thorough to help create um, that second check and balance before coming back to you for the final on June 28th. Great. And then I, I just, if the chair will give me one moment, I think just because I think I want to emphasize a little bit, uh, at least on behalf of myself, uh, what Director Morris talked about, which is one, I want to thank everybody who's gone through this process. Um, I, I was on the city council elected 18 years ago, uh, and our community programs funding was based on who got funding 20 years before that. Um, and it was indef indef uh, dis uh, indefensible uh, as an elected official to be able to describe why one program got X and another program got Y and why new applicants couldn't apply and get money, even though the needs had changed in the community, the demographics had changed and other things. We began this process uh, of 16 years ago uh, to try to make the process less um, status quo driven and more reflective of the needs of the community. Um, this is an iterative process and it will change, but it's really important for people to understand that the previous process um, I found to be profoundly unfair um, in terms of how it allocated precious resources to the community um, and that uh, we created this new process to get um, both political um, opinions uh, out of the process and to make it expert driven based on the needs and changes in our community and then um, to, to bring it to the board and have us uh, to look at it and make adjustments and changes and go forward. The second thing I want to say is, uh, as Director Morris mentioned, we added a half million dollars to this uh, budget. Um, and uh, I think everyone on the board is very aware of the needs and crisis in this community on homelessness, seniors, mental health, on and on and on. Um, but what we need from people today or over the coming weeks is to identify, um, to make their case for why their program is important, but which other program needs to be reduced in order to fund a, another program. Because um, we have a uh, structural deficit. We have a, we get 14 cents of every dollar in, uh, in uh, fees, uh, in uh, property taxes. Um, it is magical thinking to compare us to San Francisco in any way, shape, or form. Um, and so, um, to the extent we have a we have a fixed pie, uh, we we baked a bigger pie, but the pie is not going to get any bigger. So, to the extent that people believe that these very worthy programs need funding, they need to articulate which program can be reduced and why, because that's the choice before the board today and and over the next coming weeks and in three weeks when we make our final uh, decision. So um, it's going to be, you're going to have the most effective testimony if you can articulate that um, uh, for us going forward. Thank you. Thank you, Supervisor Coonerty. Um, just one further point of, of clarification. So if the, I mean, ultimately the city has to approve the same recommendations that this board does. Um, so if there were any changes made based on the appeals process or based on our meeting at the 28th, would then does the city have another meeting scheduled after the 28th where they would also have to agree uh, to the same recommended awards? And uh, if they didn't, what would happen? Yeah, I'm going to break that down in two ways as I'm hearing it. And please let me know if I've responded to what I'm hearing as two different questions. Um, number one, I didn't say it 
Um, but I, this, your question uh, compels me to sort of give this level of detail. The city has agreed in our collaboration that the appeal process for the braided funding, their 1 million and change and ours would be arbitrated by the County General Service Department. So the first step is with city agreement, it is in the terms of the RFP. So the city council will prove that the first level of appeal is governed by the general services department. The second is we do have a placeholder because it's not our place as staff to be able to predict or tell elected officials what to do between today's hearing and then the afternoon city council meeting. And then on the 28th, your board's hearing and then the city council meeting. So we have a placeholder to cross the bridge when we get there. If this board ends up making some recommendations that end up being different than the city. I do want to use the moment to share with you and underline why I'm gonna repeat this this afternoon at the city. We put this process in place based on five community meetings and seven board hearings, which was the opportunity for the community to make their recommendations and pleas for what should be prioritized. The lack of any prioritization led to the process we executed, which meant the best applications are being recommended for awards based on the process Kimberly described. So I'm backing into the answer to what I see as the second part of your question. I'm recommending to your board and I'm recommending to the city today to encourage applicants to appeal. And then there's opportunity the 28th to confront that question that we will have to confront if we get there, if the two jurisdictions um, have conflict. We are hopeful since there was so much process <laughs> um, in advance that um, both elected bodies will support the process, but we will see. This is ultimately a decision of your board for the, your share of the county funds and for the city this afternoon. So I hope that answers it. We have a placeholder of potential work we might have to do if we end up in that moment, but we will see. All right, thank you. Is there no uh, supervisor friend? Was there anything? Yeah, just briefly add? then to the appeal question, Mr. Morris, um, what if somebody, what if there's merit to an appeal determined by GSD that there's merit? I didn't, maybe I, I missed that component, but how would that alter the 28th findings? Um, maybe you didn't hear that because I'm hoping that doesn't happen, but it's a very good question. And this is another placeholder we have in our sort of work plan, if you will, which is we would then have to, in full disclosure, take that appeal information and uh, coordinate with the city, particularly if the application has city funding in it. And we would have to come back on the 28th with our recommendation based on what came of that. Okay. So we are not trying to get ahead of that and predict scenarios. There's way too many applications, but there's a placeholder to use the 28th as the opportunity to answer that question in full disclosure and give opportunity for anybody impacted by it to make public comment. Thank you. All right, seeing so no further comment, uh, to Supervisor Kappen. Okay, so we're we're still looking at all these things. And uh, so anyway, I'm, I'm not gonna go down each item, but uh, I appreciate uh, the fact that uh, we're being transparent and we're, you know, we're, we're having people show up. <laughs> For example, I, I'm having a hard time understanding some of the uh, recommendations. Uh, and I'll just, I'm going to just do one. But Advocacy Inc., uh, I think that they are getting about 59, 60,000 a year now. And they're not recommended to get any uh, next year. <laughs> The short answer is correct, given your um, choosing to ask about a particular, I know there was some testimony this morning in open general comment. I feel like the right answer to that question is to zoom up from the particular and repeat what Kimberly said in the process. Yeah. That organization applied in a particular tier. That application was reviewed by the panel for the process Kimberly described and their ranking was not high enough to be recommended for an award. My comments that I made in my beginning and at the end about process, I wanna be careful in the way I say this because I am not um, judging, I'm commenting on the process. 
those 12 opportunities were opportunities for either the AAA, who I know wrote a letter complaining about this process, recommending Advocacy Inc. get money, or Advocacy Inc. They had 12 opportunities at those five community forums and the seven public meetings, that organization or any, including the one that's here with a lot of people, to make a policy argument to us as staff or to you as a board why they were deserving of prioritization over another. Some of the arguments in the letter from the AAA could have been made in any of those 12 forums. They were not. An argument could have been made when Supervisor Friend issued additional direction to guarantee a carve out of senior meals funding to be awarded to who the AAA funded for senior meals. That moment could have been a moment for the AAA or Advocacy Inc or any provider of service through the AAA to say, hey, I would like to recommend that you also carve out money to give core money to whoever the AAA selects in their procurement. That moment would have been an opportunity for your board to deliberate. You could have weighed in if this is an important program to you, Supervisor Caput, if the board so instructed us to do so. Those would have been the rules we would have followed. The absence of that advocacy in those 12 forums is why my answer to your question is important to highlight. We were not instructed to prioritize that program. We are instructed to create a fair process and bring forward recommended awards to you based on the applications that scored the highest per the process we described in detail in the materials and Kimberly shared in her presentation. Yeah, I, the, the example I, I'm giving here for Advocacy Inc. It's the first one on the, uh, uh, it starts with an A, right? So it's an alphabetic or um there especially during the pandemic when uh we're talking about the ombudsman program and um uh, they don't have a big staff they have a small staff that has to cover all the long-term facilities in santa cruz county so what I'm getting at is they don't have a lot of time to lobby and go and present their case to uh, the core uh, process. But can you imagine, uh, and especially during the uh, COVID uh, pandemic, that there are people in uh, rest homes that are actually being neglected or abused in some of them, not in all of them, just in some of them. So what I'm getting at here is uh, we have to look at uh, each one of these and, and decide, especially if we're going from some money to zero. Yeah, I, I, I can see where we adjust uh, certain uh, numbers, but if we're gonna go from 60,000 to zero, I have a problem with that. And I'm only using the one example. I'm not gonna go down all of them. So I wanna to respond to your comment. You said, can you understand? So I wanna offer some full disclosure. In my former position in Alameda County, I ran the AAA, which oversaw the ombuds program. So for nine and a half years, I saw the pain and suffering of what happened when people in um, licensed facilities were getting hurt and mistreated and the program I ran that I oversaw that I funded and saw how much extra money it needed. So I just want to start with, yes, from my professional resume, I have direct experience understanding what you're speaking to. What I want to go back to is process. Before I was ever here, these conversations occurred in budget hearings. My predecessor was directed to shift from these discussions and arguments occurring in open budget hearings to a process. And that process was a competitive application for these scarce dollars. So what I would say, and I'm choosing to use this moment, Supervisor Caput, you're not running for your seat. I'm gonna be here again for three years. Should this board choose to direct us to unravel this process we spent a year to put in place because of the very righteous and emotional argument you're bringing up, what is missing from your argument is the hundreds of other programs that also don't have time that are on shoestrings budgets and the subset of them who actually do get funding. Our job was to create a fair process under your board's direction 
and we executed that process. <laughs> if your board wants to deliberate and start going through the list and picking it apart, I really do ask the question for all of you who are still going to be here, Supervisor Cummings <laughs> and myself, why did we do an RFP? if the end result was going to be reviewing of the list by list. And because these are very righteous issues. And when you have $16 million of applications, you have one third the money to dole out. There is not ever going to be a good answer to your question. Okay. So anyway, uh, we, we are, we're reviewing everything and we're going to come back when? My recommendation to repeat, and I apologize if I'm being redundant, is to encourage Advocacy Inc. and anybody else who makes a, a passion plea today about why their program is deserving of funding, even though their application was not competitive, to encourage them to a file and appeal. Then on June 28, those applicants have, between the time the General Service Department reviews the appeal, and if they are not um, awarded money, they have about two more weeks to talk to board members, to do more press releases, to do more lobbying, and to come back in front of you on the 28th where a final decision is made. So today is not the final decision, but my strong recommendation is to support this process move forward because if you, and pardon for the analogy, if you begin to pull the string out of this sweater by picking the first in the alphabet, it begins a dialogue about every single other organization. And I'm back to why did we do a competitive RFP? Okay, so the final, final decision is the end of this month. Correct, with the process, which again, I wanna highlight the many times that there was opportunities for people to lobby for carve outs or dedicated funding. That did not happen. Nobody brought forward that. Right. So this is the rules that are the terms of this RFP that were followed. Okay, and uh, one last comment that I'll, because uh, we'll, we're just reviewing it, basically is, uh, uh, for example, Advocacy Inc. and the Ombudsman Program, uh, they, they're, they're not geared towards uh, lobbying and actually, you know, presenting their case. What I'm getting at is on the panel, there should be people that realize the work that non, um, that uh, people that are not good at lobbying uh, should be represented or known for what they do in the community. So that's that's what I'm getting at. Uh, we can we can have a program that's not doing nearly as good as uh, some but they have good spokesmen that show up and they're very persuasive. That's what I'm worried about. So I think you're about to see that happen, <laughs> but let me go back to answer your question because I'm worried we might have not been clear in the public materials or our presentation if you are still wondering if there is an outstanding question that we have not answered. So let me be clear. The process that was run by definition eliminates the unfair playing field of advantaging organizations who are, as you call it, persuasive, who are capable of buying t-shirts for people and busing them here to make large arguments, to your point, when smaller organizations don't have that capacity or political acumen. Right. I hear you. Your instruction as one of the five unanimous votes that determine the rules of this RFP is what led to that process being fair and uninfluenced by those who are more capable of persuading and lobbying and arguing and complaining. Because the RFP panels, as Kimberly described, we specifically recruited subject matter experts, lived experience professionals, and organized the panels based on people who have a knowledge of the general issues. And they were uninfluenced by lobbying. So we did, at least as I hear your question, exactly what you're wishing for. And so now today is the day where the organizations who are more sophisticated, who are upset with this, will push hard, have already started pushing hard. And my recommendation, which I think is your point, is to not let those with the loudest voices have you change your votes, have everybody file an appeal and let the process play out and you still have June 28th to make a final decision. 
Okay. I can add. I would just add that um, uh, the training that I mentioned and the scoring matrix was very specifically designed to eliminate eliminate bias so that each application was viewed on its own merits. So we really, when I mentioned um, equity, that was really intent to create a level playing field for everybody. So each proposal would have a chance to be viewed um, on its own. Right. Thank you. Yeah, and uh, and uh, Kimberly, you uh, were in South County, and uh, another example, and I'll wrap it up, is uh, the immigration project through CAB, and that's one that didn't have at the time uh, someone to go out to all the meetings and try to persuade people to fund them, and they were getting left out of the process. Uh, I knew about them, Kimberly knew about them, and we knew the importance of uh, the immigration project in Watsonville especially because of undocumented uh, immigrants and uh, blended families and all that. But if we didn't know about that, and if we didn't speak about it, they would have been uh, they would have been left out of the process. And so that that's just the general thing I'm putting out there. Uh, I want to make sure that some that don't have people that go out, and a lot of times paid to go out and advocate for them, uh, they get they might be left out of the process. Okay. As Chair Koenig, as you turn this over to, I think, public comment now, sure. Supervisor Caput, I feel confident that we achieved that goal that you're describing by eliminating who lobbies and who's more organized in the process. So what's in front of you today is an unbiased, very clear and level playing field sure. review of the applications, and they were scored based on their merit. Now what you're about to hear is what I think you're getting at, which has you as board deliberate when you get one or two organizations who are very sophisticated and well-organized and how do you also balance the voices who don't do this as you deliberate? Okay. All right, thank you, Supervisor Cabot. All right, we'll open it for public comment. Anyone who wishes to comment here in the chambers, please approach the podium. Thank you for your time, uh, Chair Koenig. Uh, my name is Raymond Cancino, I'm the CEO of Community Bridges. Um, I just wanna start with comments that look to silence voices and to somehow demonize clients who took their time to speak about these impacts and how they will affect their lives is shameful. And we disagree with the implications that today is somehow not healthy for democracy. The irony of it all is that today is election day. Here are the facts on the table, to quote Mr. HSD director. We need to see the full scope of which programs and services will lose funding, how many people it will impact, where it will impact, and none of this was provided to you in the report you saw, especially when the data that is being quoted is simply demographic. It's not how many clients, how many people, what services or what communities are impacted. When you have over 46% of all previously funded agencies defunded and their programs realigned into new programs and over $2.2 million redistributed, there's a serious problem. In addition to that, when you have one agency representing over 36% of the total realignment, there is a serious disservice that is happening to that agency, its services and the client in which it serves. Through the last five years, we have worked hand in hand asking tough questions around sparking discussions around equity and partners and concerns. We've raised some of the questions that are being denied by the HSD director. We have asked questions about how are we gonna keep the social safety net? And that those conversations were never, never intended to have conversation about we should get funding over someone else. It was a generative conversation about what is better for our community. And by the recommendations seen today and seen and released on Thursday, how is our community better off? Thank you, Director Pensino. Hi, um, Pat Colby again. And this is going to the people that are going to our county supervisors. I, I'm going to have to ask if you've already commented on this item uh, during general public. But, um, after listening to him, I have other points. I'm sorry. There's so many people that wish to comment on this. I, I really have. To I really feel. Uh, it's not fair because he framed things and like this gentleman said, he demonized different agencies. Um, it sounds like he says it, they're 
Uh, it's their I, own if, fault. If we had to, if we hear from everyone who spoke this morning, and again, um, I'm afraid we just don't have time for that. So I'm uh, sorry. I feel like he's not doing his governmental job of being welcome. fair. Ma'am, you're welcome to submit your comments to us uh, in written form. Thank you. I'll put them on social media so a lot more people will comment to you. Thank you. Because you're being um, swayed by some untrue statements and some unfair practices. Hello, and I would like to um, suggest, you know, for supervisors to treat the community bridges as a place that are very valuable for people. And um, it could be a place where people can come and talk about their problems and um, get a help right away. And uh, since um, we have Live Oak Resource Center, uh, the community resource center and um, maybe Supervisor Manokonik can set up time over there to meet with the um, community members. And I think this is a great organization and I got to know a lot of good people and um, such organizations should growing, you know, and um, instead of cutting a funding, they should get uh, more funding to connect more with the people and community and help you supervisors to do your job and make uh, people to like to live, you know, on that ground, and especially in Live Oak. And thank you. Thank you, Ms. Boyko. This program has helped me because my parents work more than 12 hours a day and still don't have enough money to pay me private tutor. And this program gives me support by giving me a tutor, which helps me keep my grade, which helps me keep, keep my grades high. Thank you. Thank you. And which program are you speaking to? Um, what? Live Oak Community. Thank you. Good afternoon. My name is Juanita Rodriguez. What is community? The Webster Dictionary defines it as a group of people living in the same place or having a particular characteristic in common. We all have something in common. We all are brothers, sisters, mothers, fathers, siblings, children, and grandparents. The short term that I've been working for Community Bridges has um, really opened my eyes to see how much vast the majority of people that we work, uh, work with and serve examples. I have uh, Santa Cruz County employees go to my place so I can help them um, do their time cards so they can get paid because of the lack of uh, pro, um, resources for them to have a computer at home. Food distributions. I have seen clients that they do go and have go and pick up their food distribution at our location, mm -hmm. and yet by the end of the week, I haven't come back and ask to see if we have beans and lentils for them to have. Translation. I have seen most of the majority of the people that they go there for translation, which I have helped as filling out as social security, unemployment, disability, CalFresh, and medical. And others like housing applications, um, employment applications, and so forth. So with this said, please reconsider our recommendations so we can keep on helping the 6,000 families in our community plus more because Santa Cruz County is growing. Thank you. Thank you. Hello, my name is Judy Sherman. I'm a resident of the 5th District and I sent a letter to uh, Supervisor McPherson about my concerns uh, for services or in the San Lorenzo Valley. But um, while I'm a resident of Ben Lomond, I've um, 
And I was also a former staff member of the Old Valley Resource Center before it was Mountain Community Resources. But I have been a consultant for family resource centers across the state with their public and private partners for the last 20 years of my career. Um, so I'm here to kind of speak more generally about family resource centers rather than one specific FRC. Um, I was the lead author of um, this monograph called Family Resource Centers, Vehicles for Change that was published by the State Department of Social Services, Office of Child Abuse Prevention and the SH Cal Foundation. Um, that and an original monograph represent uh, the beginning of the state's investment in family resource centers since 2000. Um, I'd like to distribute them to you today to deepen your understanding of family resource centers. And um, I'm here to speak in support for continued funding by the county of the community bridges at the level necessary to maintain and grow the family resource center, the four family resource centers. Um, and I want to tell you a little bit about the level of support from the state and how family resource centers can benefit locally from that support that's coming through the state. Um, in 2009, the Welfare and Institutions Code was amended to require the Office of Child Abuse Prevention to use funds from federal funding to support coordination and sharing of best practices implemented by family resource centers. Sorry, Senate Bill 436 defined family resource centers for the purpose of that provision. In 2020 and 2021, emergency relief funds were distributed directly to family resource centers from the state so that they could provide their neighborhoods in immediate with immediate concrete Thank support. Thank you, Ms. Sherman. If you could just uh, leave the document for us here with the clerk. I will redo it and submit it. Thank you. Thank you. Hello, my name is Cecilia. I will be reading a letter made by Celia. She wasn't able to attend today due to work. Mm -hmm. Hello, my name is Celia. I am writing this letter as a public comment regarding the pro proposed core funding cut to Community Bridges Family Resource Centers. I have been visiting Nueva Vista for many years and as a caring mother of a child with a diagnosed disability, it has been a challenge to get support for my child in a caring community such as Nueva Vista Community Center. I have ac accessed different services such as parenting classes, track preparation, computer lab for homework, and job searching. Also tutoring, child summer programs as well. If I wasn't able to access these resources, my family would be severely impacted and it could result in the struggle to find programs for my school age children and finding the funds to commute and program fees. Mm -hmm. I am a single parent that does not have the financial cap capability of signing my children to enrichment summer programs or after school programs. Unfortunately, we do not have the same privileges as others in our communities, such as the elected Santa Cruz County Board of Supervisors. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning, uh, Britt Bassoni with Seniors Council of Santa Cruz and San Benito Counties. Um, the Seniors Council would like to um, would like to express its concern and its opposition to the Santa Cruz County and Santa Cruz City's recommended cuts to senior programs and their core allocations scheduled for action this morning. Among the programs eliminated, and which you've already heard about this morning, are Advocacy Inc.'s Ombudsman Program. Uh, as along with three programs from Senior Network Services, Information and Assistance, um, Family Caregiver Support, and uh, Senior Shared Housing Programs. Um, the Elder Day Community-Based Adult Services Program and Project Scouts Tax Preparation for Seniors and Low-Income Workers. Funding is also reduced for Meals on Wheels. Most of these programs use county and city funds as required local match for state and federal funding, meaning the federal and state funds will potentially be lost as well. The county reports indicate the county report indicates that two point two million dollars will be cut from previously funded programs and that the funds will be shifted to other organizations. The report neglects, however, to share which organizations will lose funding or which local services will reduce or will be reduced or eliminated from this action. Before taking any action, Seniors Council strongly encourages the board to insist on seeing a list of services that will be lost and to discuss any plans for addressing those losses. Adjustments to the local um, social uh, social safety net were expected as a part of the core process, but taking away $2.2 million of funding with no planned transition or mitigation is clearly a flawed approach. Um, programs that provide culturally diverse services to help vulnerable populations access sufficient resources to lead 
excuse me, to lead a healthy and successful life or to prevent circumstances that put them at risk or are part of the safety net as well. Again, the proposed $2.2 million cuts to existing programs severely damage that safety net. We urge the Board of Supervisors to reconsider these actions. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, um, I'm Mikey Cohen, and I come really just as a citizen, um, but representing Community Bridges. Um, and I really want to speak to uh, the council here to talk about questioning what the process that had gone on, because I, I'm. It's hard to see that how impact seems to have been missing here. Um, you have an organization like Community Bridges that obviously has a huge amount of impact in the community. Um, I see this as my wife is a teacher at ESL there. My child has taught um, and done tutoring at the organization. Um, I've seen it myself for when we had uh, the fire evacuations and the organization that was there front and center helping set up uh, emergency evacuation shelters and everything is Community Bridges. So we have this organization that's there that's that's deeply rooted in the community. And it seems to me that it's a really flawed process where the result of this whole thing is some severe cutting to this organization. So I implore you to just look in into the process and wondering how does that happen? Are you guys making a huge mistake by really adhering to what probably seems like a very flawed process? Thank you for your time. Thank you, Mr. Cohen. Hello, um, I have a little speaker. She's one of my students, Kimberly. Thanks. Thanks. No queremos a Sheer. She was trying to say, we don't want you to close. Yeah, um, she's, a, she's a little bit shy, but Kimberly is one of her clients. Um, she always comes by to the center to help us volunteer for the food distributions. <laughs> yeah, she's a really hard worker. She always draws for, for us. Um, we are um, a lot with a green shirt. Um, but we are a community. We are representing for those who were not unable to attend. I really do feel the services are really beneficial for our clients, like tutoring, counseling, food distributions, um, rental assistance right now because of the pandemic. A lot of people lost their jobs and they need assistance with their rent, distributions. There's some people that can't put food on their tables and having this distribution with the produce being so expensive at the moment, it gives them a budget to help them save for something else. Tutoring, there's a lot of kids out there that are behind in school. There are kindergartners that are supposed to be like second graders. Um, I'm sorry, um, but oh, sorry. Oh, this is oh, yeah. so really. If these services are cut, it can really uh, impact a lot of families. Um, counseling, there's a lot of depressed kids. Um, sorry, and the for the supervisors, I know. Um, you don't really know our clients, but there are a lot of people that are going through things at their house, especially because of COVID. A lot of I myself lost my grandparents to COVID. I do feel counseling is a really something that has to be <laughs> at the moment. Sorry, I try to make everything. Thank, thank you but very thank much, you. both of you. Oh, yes, good Buenas tardes a todos. Necesito Good traducción. Afternoon. Good afternoon, everyone. Necesito traducción. Yo le ayudo. Mi nombre es Lidia y yo voy a leer una carta de una de una cliente en live. My name is Lydia and I'm going to read a letter from a client. Hola, mi nombre es Lisette Santana. Les Hi, my name is Lisette Santana. Les escribo para dar mi comentario sobre los recortes al presupuesto. I'm writing to you to talk about the shortage of the funding que ha afectado los centros de recursos familiares de puentes de la comunidad. That it has affected all the community uh, projects. Yo visito el centro comunitario de Live Oak des, desde que inició la pandemia y uno I de los... I have visited these programs since the pandemic started. 
Y uno de los servicios que utilicé fue banco de comidas, así como clases. One of the services that I used was the food bank. Así como clases para padres. And classes for uh, parent, parenting classes. El Centro de Recursos ha sido no solo un espacio donde puedo encontrar ayuda. The center has been very helpful. También me he conectado a una comunidad. I have connected myself with the community. Gracias al centro estoy cumpliendo una de mis metas que es aprender inglés. Thanks to this um, center and the support, I've been learning how to speak English. Con el programa de ESL. With the program, with the ESL program. Y el apoyo que brindan de cuidado de niños gratis. And the support for uh, child, child care. Hoy, Free child care, excuse me. Hoy concluí mi primer curso. Today I finished my first course. También mi hijo se ha beneficiado con el programa de tutorías. My son has benefited from the tutorial program. Así como próximamente con los campamentos de verano. And uh, in the future with the camping uh, summer camp. Si no tuviéramos acceso a estos servicios sería muy difícil cumplir nuestras metas. If we didn't have access to those programs, it would be really hard to meet our goals. Espero tomen a consideración y tengamos su completo apoyo para los centros comunitarios. I really hope that you take this under consideration. Y, y nuestra comunidad y adultos mayores, padres, jóvenes, niños. Our community, our adults and our children. Que somos beneficiados. That are benefited. Gracias. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, Jamie Ackman, Community Bridges Fund Development. I'm also a resident of Ben Lomond, so I'll be wearing two hats today. Um, first, I think it's interesting and a little ironic that um, the fact that Community Bridges has the ability to reach so many people and bring so many people with us is being used as a mark against us, because that's the very reason that the county partnered with us for COVID relief early in the pandemic, for rental relief, as we help to support the community and make sure that our, our community members had access to those vital services, because we do have reach, we do have impact, and we serve so many people. Community Bridges asked for just $100,000 to keep Mountain Community Resources open in San Lorenzo Valley. Similar asks for our other four family resource centers, all of which are being zeroed out. Since the start of the pandemic, demand for food distributions at our community resource centers has increased by 43%. Demand for mental health counseling has increased by 39%. We do 800 or more hours of mental health counseling at our family resource centers every year. That's all going away with this budget. We've seen demand for our client load increase by 50% at our family resource centers. You paid $250,000 just a few years ago to improve the shower facilities and laundry facility at Mountain Community Resources. That facility will close and the unhoused living in our community will not have access to the daily shower that they now enjoy before they go to work in our community. We don't have many local services available in San Lorenzo Valley, and you're also zeroing, zeroing out the San Lorenzo Valley Highland Senior Center too. Not one of Community Bridges resources, but one of the things it's losing. San Lorenzo Valley is losing a lot in this core report. As the fundamental development manager for CB, I can only see the resulting impacts for all in our community. A net decrease in subsidized childcare, a loss of services at our only adult day healthcare center in Santa Cruz County, and more harm to thousands of residents. Thank you. I'm Mayra Melendres, Program Director of Community Bridges Family Resource um, Collective, speaking for La Manzana, Nueva Vista, Live Oak, and Mountain Community Resources. I'm disheartened by the recommendations as our programs align with many of the core conditions. I do value all the programs being recommended for funding, and we have been key partners with these and many other organizations, including the county. If you call this a passion plea, we'll let them be a passion plea. We clearly have a reach of people that are that trust us in our community. We are wearing our green shirts because they trust us. We are a community. We are here to empower these people to move 
and meet their basic needs. We are not going to discourage them from having a voice and coming here today and tomorrow and whenever necessary, because we are the voice of these people that have right now are working in the fields or working in the hotels or, you know, working away and cannot be present that came here earlier today and had to leave because they go to work. I have received feedback from some county staff that we did not rec get recommended for funding due to us getting funding from other sources. Well, we do get other funding sources, but they are for special projects. They're not for our core services, which is to enable social mobility for these individuals that seek our services. And I'm speaking for 6,000 participants that come to our centers on a yearly basis, services that have increased with the pandemic and the demand has not decreased. The city of Watsonville does not support our family resource center in Watsonville. And that is our largest family resource center. Core funds requested are for addressing needs of the community are targeted to enable clients to attain economic stability and social mobility. Thank you. I, I'm Lois Sons. I'm the program director at Elder Day Adult Day Healthcare. And I am, of course, devastated by not receiving funding in this um, recommendation process. But that's not really what I want to talk about right at this moment. Um, I'm horrified with this process. I am really, really horrified. We're in Santa Cruz. We do things together. We work together. This is so adversarial. Adversarial, sorry. I'm I'm really disheartened, Director Morris, by hearing you demeaning community bridges. You were very demeaning and that's, I'm, I'm very proud of our agency and I'm very proud of what we do. And I'm hoping that we can look at this now, this time, maybe for the next, the next uh, set of processes. But we're, um, We're just not doing this right. Somehow we're not doing it right. We're not coming together. We're not doing what we need to do as a community. These recommendations will really shred the social safety net. Local government isn't able to provide the local safety net and expects nonprofits to do that. And there's not enough money. There's not enough money for nonprofits to do that. I would like to know how we all of the local nonprofits can work together with our local governments and figure out how to make this pie bigger. Because just cutting one set of organizations and giving it to somebody else is not going to fix the problem. I think we need to figure out a way to fix the problem, please. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Silvia Sanchez. I'm a program coordinator at La Manzana Community Resource Center, a program of community bridges in Watsonville. Um, part of my job duties include working with tenants who are at risk of uh, eviction. Um, we've seen a lot of that increase with the pandemic. Um, and today I would like to share a client story in the hope that you would reconsider um, the core funding recommendations. Uh, Mary is one of one of our many clients. She's 32 years old, a single mother living in a converted garage in Santa Cruz County. During the pandemic, she lost her job and became unable to pay rent. Mary came to our Family Resource Center seeking rental assistance um, and later returned to us for legal support when her landlord became impatient and began to threaten to evict her and her five-year-old daughter. More recently, Mary's landlord began threatening to cut her access to the home's, ki to the home's kitchen. She goes into the main home to prepare her meals as she lives in the garage, as I, as I mentioned. Um, Mary feared that she would no longer be able to prepare food for herself and her five-year-old daughter. With the support of Community Bridges, um, she received legal assistance that prevented the landlord from following through with his threats. Without core funding, uh, she would face delayed service with her three-day eviction notice. And people, uh, for people like her and all of her clients, the funding represents more than just the money. 
it really represents the ability to live in a safe and dignified life. Um, and I, you know, request that you restore funding to Community Bridges, the Family Resource Centers. And my last comment is just that the reason you see so many green t-shirts here today is because we understand and we um, are here to advocate for our clients. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Sanchez. Hello. Reverend Beth Love with Eat for the Earth. I'm the executive director. And Eat for the Earth was actually recommended for funding in the um, in the process that has been described today. And I want to say that we were so elated when we found out because what we're offering is community members the opportunity to empower themselves to reclaim their health and transform their lives through the power of a plant-based diet. And a plant-based diet has been shown in so many studies to be able to help people reverse heart disease diabetes, um, some cancers, and certainly to prevent these diseases and so much more. So we were so elated. And part of that elation was just the fact that a government entity is for has enough forethought and designed a process that would lift up um, a community program like this that has so much potential to support change. We just finished our first pilot round. And um, one, of our, one of our clients who um, lives in South County, um, it, I don't want to say too much about her, but she um, she reduced her blood in ten day program. She reduced her blood pressure by fifty points. Um, she reduced inflammation, pain. She's sleeping better. She's less depressed, et cetera, et cetera. So we know this is powerful. But I'll tell you what: when I woke up this morning and I saw an email from Survivors Healing Center, I used to be the executive director before it was under Family Services Agency, and I saw that Family Services Agency was losing one hundred and seventy two thousand dollars on the other side of the coin was revealed. So as one of those shadow agencies that has come into the limelight and now has money, um, hearing that the, all the family resource centers are not getting funded and that the child care centers are losing money and um, Survivors Healing Center is disheartening. And I want to just say as a reverend, I want to call you all up, find that $2.2 million somewhere. Like don't defund all these programs or find as much of it as you can. I don't like the choice of somebody's got to name my program to be on the chopping block in order for their to be funded, fund them all. Thank you, Reverend Love. Thank you for your service. Um, my name is Corey Birch. I'm an advocate three at um, Mountain Community Resources, a program of Community Bridges. Been there for 20 years. Um, Community Bridges stands in the gap. Uh, they serve people to access services for people who are um, to provide access to services uh, for people who are, are challenged both geographically, mentally, um, transportation wise. They don't have funds to get to places. Um, we need to build trust with them first. That's what our walk-in services do. We build trust by giving them some of the things they need, the showers, the laundry, the lockers, the mail services. We build those services, then we apply for things like a disability, like some of the Med Medi-Cal and CalFresh, a free phone from Lifeline, um, domestic violence services, um, drug and alcohol addiction services. We are the access point. We have help for all, all sorts of resources. The reason why we haven't been able to go to all these meetings is because we've had two people that have to, in order to stay open, we have to be on our, our sites to open our doors. We are underfunded, understaffed, and doing much more work than we've ever done before. We were there for the CZU fires. We were working out of hotel rooms to get access to people so that they could evacuate. People would call me on the phone, on my cell phone, to say, how do I get out of Boulder Creek? I said, Life lift line is standing with the cops at the at the border there. You got to get to that and they'll bring you out. You know, we are strong and because we are strong, we help people to help themselves. Thank you, Thank Ms. Burke. Hi, my name is Sandra Rodelo. I'm uh, 
work on La Manzana through our community breaches. And uh, I just want to say, you know, we do work passionately. We're not here in being passionate. We are here to state this, the facts. The community breaches is losing the core funding. And we will say, yes, they have funding for a long, long time. And I have been working with them for 10 years. And in those 10 years, I've seen families grow. We are not talking about families that can afford uh, some resources and they are just using us for the moment. No, we have make families grow healthier, stronger, uh, to move and to uh, become uh, financially stable. Now, we are not working alone. No, we work with all the other agencies to provide the services. Some of those agencies are in your uh, budget uh, recommendations. They are using us to promote the SAMS also. We are not doing this just because we wanted to be the in top. We are helping. I now I'm working in this agency because I want to become healthy. I mean, um, Rich, I work with the sentiency because I believe in the core values that they, they uh, are putting out there. I'm using this shirt because I'm not ashamed to work for the clients. I'm not here to ask and beg for my job. No, I'm very capable to get another job in another agency. I'm here just to speak up for the process. We can, as a community resource center, we cannot prioritize one individual for another. I just wanted you to let them you know they appreciate the work that they did, and I hope they still continue doing it. Thank you, Michelle Zella. Hello, I'm here again. I just wanted to add a part that I did not say of the letter that I was reading, which is from, the, from Celia. She's a single mom. I am perplexed as to how these individuals of the Santa Cruz County Board of Supervisors have input on the distribution of funds to low income programs when they have minimal knowledge of the struggles working class families face. I also question how they base their decision on the disbursement of funds and there might and there might be bias or conflicts of interest. I would also like to add I grew up in Santa Cruz. We've used these resources all our lives. I remember growing up and not being able to afford a backpack, coming in and they they provide a backpack for me. Where am I going to go? Where where what was I going to go for a backpack if they were not here? Also, just a few days ago, even though I just started working with them, I saw these Ukrainian refugees came in asking for support for help. If we're not here, who's going to help them? They were asking for to help them with the application resources could barely speak English who's going to help them if we're not here thank you thank you Hello, my name is Jeanette. I work for Santa Cruz Barrios Needles, and um, we are deeply rooted in community and we've established deep trust from populations that find it difficult to trust as um, most of our uh, the people that we serve are undocumented and we have declared um, our place a sanctuary. And so uh, we built that trust. Um, we have food distribution twice a week. Um, Fridays and Saturdays, and we serve over 300 people every day that we serve the food. And um, our view, we have an audio engineering um, studio where uh, the youth come in. Um, instead of being out in the streets, they come in and they make music, they record, and they make videos. And we actually, they had their first um their first show a couple of weeks ago, and um, they really enjoyed that. And um, so we have... Um, we have a, a lot of services. Um, we have a kids club also when we do tutoring. Um, we also work inside. Uh, we go to the schools in Watsonville, a middle school, and we provide a culture. Uh, a culture. We we teach them about their culture. Um, we're there for them. Um, a lot of those students there um, can do connect with all, with us because we've all were raised the same way. We were, were most of us um, are from the community and we work for the community and we provide. And then so we also um, we send open and provide services through all through COVID. Um, and also when we had that those the fires. Um, 
our place was um, a donation center. And so a lot of people came in and brought clothes and furniture, anything we needed. And we were also the ones who would go and deliver to people who needed what, what they what they lost. Most of them lost their homes. They lost anything that they that they needed. We were there for everybody. And so we also have uh, reentry services for youth and for um, adults. We work um, closely with um, families from the juvenile hall also, and we deliver food boxes for them. And so we're there and we help them advocate for themselves as well. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, my name's Finn. I was a tutor for Community Bridges, and it really is the only free tutoring program that we have. And I really feel like I was able to help out the kids who I tutored, and I think it was really valuable, and you should really consider. Thank you. Hi, Clay Kip, Executive Director of the Seniors Council Area Agency on Aging. And I have to say, this is a really weird hearing. It's the first time where I've heard community programs attacked and vilified. And I don't believe that's what the Board of Supervisors would typically do or even mean to this point. None of you have made those sorts of comments, but I just have to call that out. And what my first comment was going to be today was to thank all of you for your engagement and your support of the social safety net. I think that's really critical. It's admirable what everybody has been doing for years. So thank you all for that. Um, I do want to disagree with some of the statements that were made about the AAA specifically, which kind of confuses me about how to speak here. When your agency is called out in the staff report and that information is inaccurate, it's hard to include that in your public comments. But I don't want to get into a debate publicly with, with county staff, but I think that needs to be expressed. Um, the other thing that I want to share is I've been doing this for 35, 33 years. And throughout that time, we have had to apply for funds every single year. Sometimes we've been successful, and this was with three different agencies, sometimes not successful. So the kind of backstory that this is the first time there's been applications being reviewed by anyone I don't know where that comes from, but that's not the 33 years of experience that I have. And then lastly, I want to say just a couple things. Being challenged to say which community programs should we be pitted against and take money away from in order to address seniors. I'm not going to say seniors deserve funding over children or that seniors deserve money over battered women. That's, that's a zero-sum game. So that is also a very weird dynamic today. I will say just one last thing that... We're Thank bragging you. about half a million dollars being added to the system, but we have 750000 taken away for a special project. Thank you, That's a net loss. My name is Ana Marín. Ana Maria. Tengo tres hijas. Me beneficio, me beneficio de los programas de verano, de ayuda de tarea, y me gustaría que reconsideraran el dar apoyo a los programas, porque nuestros niños les gusta el programa. Como padres trabajamos y ocupamos que se estén, tengan la ayuda. Emigramos de México y ellos tienen otra oportunidad mejor que nosotros. As parents, we immigrated from Mexico. Our children need help. Reconsideren ayudar a nuestros hijos porque ellos son el futuro del mundo, pienso. Tienen mejor oportunidad que nosotros. No pudimos estudiar y ellos reconsideren, por favor, ayudarnos en estos programas. Muchas gracias. Thank you very much. John Jameson, I'm from Felton. I find most regrettable that we have people here fighting over the scraps that the system is willing to toss them, and it isn't enough. And actually, it wouldn't be enough if the people at the top who have the assets uh, distributed what they have, because there are simply too many people on the planet. This is obviously not going to be solved today, but uh, we need to take a look at that. Uh, we are going to exceed the carrying capacity of the planet 
probably in the next 20 years. And we need to look in the mirror and see that we are each our own worst enemy, both individually and collectively as a human race. We are victims of our own success. And so I think I don't have an answer to all the questions uh, other than that uh, if we could cut our population down to 500 million worldwide, there'd be enough for everybody to be rich. But I don't see that happening in my lifetime. So I don't envy you having to make these decisions and I wish you all luck. And I wish everybody in this room luck because I don't know how it's gonna go. It might be a very rough ride. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Jameson. Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for your time. My name is Pamela Nell, and I am the program manager for Live Oak Community Resources and Nueva Vista Community Resources. And honestly, there's not much I can add that hasn't already been stated and that resonates personally with what I feel and what I've experienced. But I do want to say that we work so deeply in community, not just with the participants that we serve, or our staff, but also our volunteers and our interns, and also other programs, including programs that are recommended for funding. You know, we work in deep partnerships and our work and is contributes to their work being possible. So I just wanted to mention that. And thank you so much for your time. Thank you, Pamela. I see no uh, other members of the public here in the chamber. Is there anyone on Zoom? Yes, press? we do have speakers via Zoom. Helen Ewan Story, your microphone's now available. Thank you, and good morning, Chair and Supervisors. I'm Helen Ewan Story, Acting Executive Director of the Community Action Board of Santa Cruz County. As you know, CAB is the county's designated community action agency charged with eliminating poverty and creating social change through advocacy and essential services driven by our values of equity, dignity, diversity, and inclusion. CAB sincerely appreciates the core recommendations to support its critical employment services for adults with barriers, immigration legal and educational services for DACA, and other immigrant community members, and food, youth education, family, and senior resources and supports to isolated and predominantly farm worker families in the Davenport North Coast area, including those impacted by the CZU fire. CAB is also thankful for the recommended support of our homelessness prevention and intervention services, including our South County Housing Collaborative to support housing vulnerable South County youth and families, along with our partners CRLA, Families in Transition, Pajaro Valley Shelter Services, and the PBUSD's Healthy Start Program. We look forward to continued partnership with the county to provide these impactful services to thousands of county residents over the next three years with core funding support. We also recognize that many of our and the county's longstanding nonprofit partners who provide critical services to low-income children, families, adults, and seniors are not currently recommended for funding this year or greatly reduced funding. Since we know that funding shifts of this magnitude will have impact Act both on those that depend on them as well as other community partners like CAB, we respectfully encourage your board to find additional core funding or departmental funding to support these services at some level and or to partner with school districts or other philanthropy to help leverage and increase resources. Further, we respectfully encourage that the recommended targeted tier impact projects serve all the county, including South County, to support equity-based services throughout the uh, county for this important targeted service. Again, thank you for your partnership. Thank you, Ms. Story. Sandy Davey, your microphone is now available. Sandy, if you'll accept the unmute, your microphone is now available. It seems Sandy's having connectivity issues. We'll move to the next speaker. Corey, your microphone is now available. Mm -hmm. 
Don't worry, uh, your microphone is now available. Yes, can you hear me? Yes, thank you. Thank you, okay. My name is Corey Azevedo. I'm the Executive Director of Senior Network Services. Uh, the outcome of CORE for Senior Network includes the following. Uh, we'll be out of compliance with the Federal Older Americans Act. Uh, there will be the denial of outside state and federal dollars coming into the county. Uh, there will be the closure of the most cost-effective dollar-for-dollar housing program in the county, and it could close the doors of a 50-year-old nonprofit. Uh, does this sound like uh, the outcomes of a good process? Uh, this is not a zero sum game. There are ways to grow this pie. The first priority should be uh, matching funds. Uh, Senior Network submitted two federally required programs that have a 10 to one and four to one match. Uh, core value that match at zero and chose not to multiply their dollars in that way. By accepting uh, outside money, we grow the pie. There's also the cost of administration. Uh, it was discussed 64 technical assistance trainings, 12 public meetings, there's coffee chats, et cetera, et cetera. This is a sign that is too complex and bureaucratic and too costly. Streamlining that uh, process could take some of those funds and put it back in the pie, thereby growing the pie. Uh, there's also what is the value of nonprofits to the local social safety net? I would argue it's more than the fraction of a percent that's currently set, up, set aside by the county. Uh, and the Board of Supervisors can grow the by two. And lastly, a solution. Uh, there is a 10% rule where CORE would not fund less than 90% of any proposal. Uh, Senior Network believes that was unnecessary uh, and is causing a lot of issues we see here today. Uh, the elimination of that rule would allow these dollars to be smoothed over more organizations. Uh, any nonprofit executive director would rather have 60 or 70% than zero. And lastly, the whole framework for CORE, in my opinion, is off. Uh, this should be about a partnership approach and not a purchase of service approach. Thank you, Mr. Acevedo. Eduardo Santana, your microphone is now available. Good afternoon. We, we can hear, hear you, Eduardo. Great. Good afternoon, um, members of the council. Um, Eduardo Santana, Project Scouts Program Director. Project Scouts has been providing free tax services for seniors, disabled, low-income families, and individuals in Santa Cruz County for over 40 years. I am disheartened to know that Project Scout is not receiving any funding for the great service that our IRS certificated volunteers provide a rich Santa Cruz County community. Beyond losing funding this year, in order for us to provide free tax services, we are required to receive local match funds. Without such funds from the county, the future of Project Scout services are in jeopardy. Just this past Friday, Project Scout assisted 32 taxpayers with free tax assistance at the Watsonville Public Library and secured refunds of over $17,000 for those we service. The money that is put back in the wallets of our clients, some of our counties more socioeconomically at risk, get readily reinvested in our local businesses. Whether the money goes to pay rent, taking the car to the mechanic, or buying groceries, this money has a multiplier effect that and without the assistance of Project Scouts, IRS certificated volunteers, many of our residents will miss out on such refunds. Thousands of Santa Cruz County residents miss out on cash back from tax credits because they don't file taxes. This is the time to invest in programs that provide financial stability and provide a safety net for our county residents, not to defund them. <laughs> Project Scout volunteers work at least 10 hours a week as IRS certificated tax volunteers during tax season, providing residents of the county over $35,000 worth of free services during tax season alone. And some of the volunteers continue during the whole year. It's a great investment if you ask me. As of the end of tax season, Project Scout has assisted 1,254 1, taxpayers and put over $1,500,000 back in the pockets of those clients we service. Without Project Scout's volunteer in person assistance, where, where will all Santa Cruz County residents obtain free tax credit? The answer is nowhere. Project Scout has always been a proud partner in the county for mental social economic growth. It is hoped that Project Scout will continue providing services for seniors, disabled, low income families, and individuals with future support from the county. Project Scout is a, res a presentation of Santa Cruz County investing in itself. I ask you to please invest wisely, and I'm happy to share any data and stats with you guys as uh, necessary. Thank you very much.
Coco Walter, your microphone is now available. Hi, thank you, uh, Chair Koenig and board. I'm Coco Rayner Walter, and I'm here today representing the Senior Center Organization of the San Lorenzo Valley, otherwise known as Highlands Park Senior Center. Given that our facility supports other grantees, we were hoping for financial support to maintain our operations. We are centrally located in the San Lorenzo Valley and would be ideal and are the ideal facility to service our uh, 25,000 residents in our area. Currently, um, we support three of your recipients, Meals on Wheels. We um, are a daily user. Gray Bears is, does food distribution weekly, and the Senior Network Services are starting to come in and do services this week. We also have other nonprofits using our facilities regularly. The Red Cross comes in for a quarterly blood drive. Project Scout, who just spoke, they actually, through the tax season, come in twice a week, and have we have supported them physically with that, and now they're still coming in monthly. And then the Valley Women's Club is a year-round user of our facility. But the Highlands Park Senior Center is the only self-sustaining senior center in our county. We are not supported or run by any of the cities in Santa Cruz County. We have a 6,000 square foot building that needs constant maintenance and staffing. With COVID-19, we lost our previous staff. And for the last two years plus, we have staffed it all with our all volunteer board. We are now open four hours a day, five days a week. What could we do for our community if we were open full time? And we would love to do that. So we just ask for your help to sustain a wonderful program with the Highlands Park Senior Center. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Ms. Walter. Nora Caruso, your microphone is now available. Hi there, can you hear me? Yes. I'm Nora Caruso, Program Director for the Santa Cruz Toddler Care Center. President Biden has said, show me your budget and I'll tell you what you value. Honestly, I cannot believe that what is being presented in the budget is actually what you people value or what any of us value. Not only is the amount allotted for community programs or core funding disproportionately small, but I'm gonna to talk to you today about childcare. In the 16 years that I've been doing this job, I cannot remember a year that I haven't come and spoken to you or the city council about the cuts to our budget that you've made. This year, you're asking, your proposal is that we are completely defunded. We're going from $75,000 to zero. The impact that that's going to have is that we will no longer be able to provide our high quality child care program for one and two year olds at a sliding fee scale. We absolutely reject the idea that child care is for the wealthy. Families can't work if they don't have child care and communities cannot thrive or even <laughs> stay alive if their participants can't go to work. This is an incredibly short-sighted idea in terms of defunding childcare. To my calculation, there were eight childcare centers that were being funded just back at, during the last cycle, and now there's one. Something's got to give here. And the idea that this is a zero-sum game, like our the other speakers spoke about, is absolutely ridiculous. It is not our job to tell you who should lose funding so that we can actually provide the good work that we do. We want to partner with you to do the work that you know is really important in our community. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Car Caruso. Serge Cogno, your microphone is now available. Thank you. Uh, my name is Serge Cagno, uh, Executive Director of Recovery Cafe Santa Cruz. I want to thank all of the county staff for the core trainings and support within the core application process. I want to thank all of the nonprofits who provide services. I want to thank the Board of Supervisors for representing our community. It's re regrettable of the confrontative tone that we have in today's discussion. The Recovery Cafe Santa Cruz offers a unique, needed, and proven service for those struggling under the 
many pressures in our present world. Building feelings of respect and community, the Recovery Cafe offers a safe place to work on healing and growth. In Santa Cruz, we have seniors and people suffering from anxiety, isolate their homes, people challenged with homelessness, people struggling with substance use and mental health, people who identify as LGBTQIA+, trying to find a safe place to express who they are, domestic violence and human trafficking, survivors trying to rebuild a sense of community, former foster youth, and people who are justice involved trying to restart their lives. The Recovery Cafe offers services to all of them. The Recovery Cafe Santa Cruz did not receive any core funding. And though we feel we have a strong program, oh, other than one overall score, there was no explanation of what our project scored in the different application sections or why. As you can imagine, it's impossible to use the appeals process within core without knowing those scores or the justification of those scores. I can only guess at why we received the score we did. Our holistic program serves multiple core elements, which put our application at a slight significant disadvantage to identify a single core element and lessened our perceived impact. The application process lacked the ability of agencies to state that lower allocations or lower teals would be helpful. And throughout the public meetings, there were multiple questions agencies asking about the ability of having lower allocations. The Recovery Cafe Santa Cruz asked the Board of Supervisors to direct the Human Services Department to offer partial allocations for the Recovery Cafe and other programs which did not receive funding. Thank or you, Mr. Cogno. Yadira Flores, your microphone is now available. Hello, good morning. My name is Yadira Flores. And today I will I will be wearing two hats. Um, there are like those leaders. Our community invests in eight core condition essential for equitable equitable health and well-being in a collective effort to affect affect system towards alignment impact. County Park Friends applauds this approach to public funding. However, we need to bring your attention to the fact that in the recommendation published yesterday, 0% of funding was recommended for the healthy environment core conditions. We encourage you to ask hard questions about how we invest or not in equitable activa activation of connection to and to so, and benefits from the very healthy environments, parks, beaches, trails. And so we it's a really important for us to, to get a connection with the community. And the, at the same way, I'm here to advocate for the community bridges because I, I represent LIBO community and most of the families look at the numbers. They put all the kids on the summer schools because they don't have access to recreation because recreation is expensive. $500 for junior lifeguards when we as a county park friends provide um, a scholarship for those kids. So please consider and also our families really benefits for the resource center at Lightbook. Some essential things like do and print a copy or and, and so print something from the kids at school. You can think like that's very naive or no sense, but thank for you, Ms. Flores. Or, Peter B, your microphone is now available. Hello, I'm Peter Bichier. I'm the city of Santa Cruz a community liaison. And um, I work, I just want to say that um, I've been a community liaison for three years and uh, community bridges have been a key person helping me out uh, in my uh, uh, job as a community liaison. And uh, both the small center in Nueva Vista and in Lower Ocean have been incredibly uh, helpful for me. Uh, most of the time, we just, uh, you know, they're the one who have the direct links to the communities. And, um, you know, so I'm just a one person uh, jobber. And so it's very hard for me not to be able to 
get the support from that institution. Also, when I see that with the budget, we're talking about like the how it is separated, for example, that one people or some, you know, it is a matter of right now of a food. Uh, but a lot of times one person doesn't just have a problem that they're, they're lacking their ends meet for food. It's just a general. Yes, it's, it's food, but then it's also because they got injured at work, they get another support uh, where they need also help with rent and work or taxes. And as a whole, that uh, uh, entity is helping really a lot the, the people. And, um, and that's, I just wanted to share that. Thank you. Thank you, Peter. Amy, your microphone is now available. Hi, my name is Amy. I'm 17. And um, thank you for your time. I wanted to let you know that the Live Oak Research Center has not only been a pillar of my community, but of my life as well. And I know I'm not the only one. My parents immigrated here and all they have wanted for me was a better life, which the Resource Center has always helped me achieve. The Resource Center has always been a safe space for us, for my siblings, um, for my community, for me. Um, uh, I know I won't be able to find a safe space like this anywhere else. Community Bridges has helped me in many generations. Um, I'll be able to vote soon. And a number of youth that have benefited from the Resource Center um, will be able to too. And we will remember the kind of people that helped our community when we needed it the most. You might be able to easily dismiss our pleas to keep these resources for our community because we see what our communities go through every day. We see the amount of work they put in to even survive. <laughs> um, so please reconsider this. Please have empathy. Thank you, Amy. Dutrin, your microphone is now available. Can you hear me? Yes, thank you. Uh, thank you, Board of Supervisors. Dutron Kebebu, Executive Director for Mentors. Uh, we are one of the programs who applied and waited for five years and for the new process. Unfortunately, we didn't get funded and uh, we think the process this round seemed as fair as it could be without looking behind the scene. Um, our request is that we are the only organization in the community, in the Bay Area, that's serving a holistic approach to positive masculinity, uh, boy, de boy development, youth, fathers, and um, men. So as we look at the issues of domestic violence to the recent mass shooting, to anything that's happening in the community that's negatively impacting, there's one thread that continued to happen, toxic masculinity. So we can address issues from intervention perspective, or we can do prevention. That's what we're trying to do. We understand there's a lot of uh, programs that did not get funded and uh, you know there's nothing we can do except work with those who are funded. So we ask the Board of Supervisors as part of the contract process to request that everyone who's funded to have a father-friendly policy in their contract so that we can work with them in providing these necessary services. I'm also disheartened to hear the Family Resource Centers are not funded. The Family Resource Centers play a critical role in our community from La Manzana to Mountain Community, from Live Oak to Nueva Vista. And they bring people together and support fathers, mothers, children, and they are the lifelines. So for me to see those programs to go away really makes me very sad and, and thank you for the opportunity. Thank you, Dutron. Caller 2000, your microphone is now available. As a reminder, it's star six to unmute or mute yourself. Hello? Yes, hello. Hello? Can you hear me? We yes, hear. we can hear you. 
Okay, my name is Julie Pulliam. I'm a fire victim up in Bonnie Din. And I'm calling in today because I'm just, I listened to all this and I've listened to how you're going to fund this, that, and the other and what the process is and how fair the process is. Well, the only help I've gotten as a fire victim is from Community Mountain Resources in Felton. The only help. You know, they, they put this really hard site check plan for us, expensive, that doesn't work. I couldn't do it. I'm not computer literate. But guess what? Community Mountain Resources can because they're competent. I, I just listened to that whole thing about the fairness of the process and how that guy was so condescending. And a three-day appeal process, and then they give themselves five days to respond to the appeal of three days. It would be funny if it wasn't so tragic. Um, the county's been no help to me. In fact, they've hindered me in trying to rebuild and trying to get back on my feet after this fire. The only help I've gotten is from Community Mountain Resources and help. And, and they're confident. What they ought to be doing is signing people up to vote, and then <laughs> they come in, and maybe something would happen. But I'm just outraged. I, I'm, a, I'm a person that's been paying taxes for 45 years, property taxes, in this county, and I am outraged. Find the money. It's there. I know. Get rid of some of those uh, those guys that are trying to figure out how to make the process there. Take his salary and throw it in, because that that would take the girl down at the office at Community Mountain Resources probably a couple hours in the afternoon that she could figure it out better. Thank so you, man. I'm a, Caller 2000, your microphone is now available. We have a second caller with the same identifier. As a reminder, it's star six to mute or unmute yourself. Um, are you able to hear me? Yes. Um, so thank you to the Board of Supervisors for letting me talk. Um, I'm calling as um, a concerned parent and also as an educator myself. Over the weekend, this proposal was brought to my attention, and my son, who's three years old, currently attends um, the Redwood Mountain School, which is part of Community Bridges. Um, I really think and implore you, implore you all to consider that today's youth is tomorrow's future, and by cutting funding that has anything to do with our youth you're being short-sighted and not investing in our future um, i live in boulder creek and i'm a really proud member of the san lorenzo valley um the thing that saddens me the most about this vote is that in if the funding is cut you're essentially voting to create an equity gap in education based on family household incomes I've worked as a teacher and my wife has worked as a teacher for our careers. And seeing that our child could be part of a process as an imposed equity gap based off of finances from an age as early as three saddens me and is extremely disheartening. Um, so, like I said, I'm just speaking to all of you as a parent and educating myself. And I really hope that you think about your decision in a long-term sense to invest in our community, in the citizens of our community, and in the children who need this early childhood education for language development, social emotional development, and physical development. 90% of the brain development of children takes place before the age of five. So please, please, please think about your decisions. Think about the funding what you're putting money into and why you're trying you, sir. Dina, your microphone is now available. Hi, good afternoon. Can you hear me? Yes. Terrific. 
Good afternoon. My name is Dina. I'm with Santa Cruz Community Health. Through the Santa Cruz Women's Health Center, the East Cliff Family Health Center, and the newest Santa Cruz Mountain Health Center in Ben Lomond, Santa Cruz Community Health is a federally qualified health center, provides comprehensive primary care services in English and Spanish to all ages, genders, ethnicities, abilities, and sexual identities and orientations, regardless of their ability to pay. I want to thank you for delivering a clear yet complicated process. And I understand it's even getting more and more complicated. While the application itself was no walk in the park, it, to me, it was very clear and supported by endless opportunities for additional help and technical assistance. So I thank you for that. I'm at once disappointed to not be celebrating the recommendation of both the proposals that Santa Cruz Community Health put forward, but absolutely grateful for the recommendation made to support our Healthy Steps expansion proposal. By nearly every measure, children living in families with low incomes and children of color face the biggest obstacles such as low birth weight, unstable housing, and limited access to early learning experience. When we remove these barriers, greater access to opportunity and flourishing is possible for everyone. A Healthy Steps is a program of zero to three. It's evidence-based, team-based pediatric primary care program promoting the health, well-being, and school readiness of babies and toddlers with an emphasis on low-income families. Again, I want to thank you for considering the recommendations made. Thank you. Thank you, Dina. Allison, your microphone is now available. Thank you. Good afternoon, supervisors and community members. My name is Allison Guevara, and I'm the director of Cradle to Career, Santa Cruz County. As you know well, there is great need in our community, which has been matched by incredible resilience over the past two years. Among the many devastating consequences of the pandemic, there has been an historic separation between families and schools and widening differences in students' resources and support for learning. Yet Cradle to Career has shown that investments in family empowerment and community organizing builds community resilience. We are deeply honored and grateful to be recommended to receive the core targeted impact grant and serve multiple communities across our county. This will allow us to expand our work to three additional school districts where we have heard from superintendents desperate to engage and support families who have been hit the hardest by systemic inequities, the pandemic, distance learning, and the CZU fires. It will also allow us to convene a countywide learning and leadership circle where we will continue to catalyze whole child, whole family, whole community collective impact solutions. We have a powerful collective of partnering organizations and school districts who will be involved in our expansion, including United Way, the County Office of Education, Encompass Head Start, First Five, Santa Cruz Community Health, and many others, as well as our C2C Parent Leadership Committee and Promotora Collective, who will help ensure these precious dollars result in meaningful change. Our work is to uplift the abundance of healers, advocates, and community architects all around us, and to collaborate to address the root causes of adversity and ensure vital interconnected community services and public policies are sustained and strengthened. We truly value community partners, including community bridges, family resource centers, and child care centers, and feel it's critical that we work together to ensure their doors remain open. I want to thank you for this incredible opportunity, for your support, for a thoughtful process, and for your vision for our community. Thank you so much. Thank you, Ms. Guevara. Diane, your microphone is now available. Good afternoon, Board of Supervisors and community partners. Um, first of all, I just want to recognize everyone's involvement in this process. It was is and has been an arduous process for everyone. But as I read the, um, the uh, recommendations for funding, I notice that, um, that childcare is not really listed. We have one program that was funded. And after going through the last couple of years through the pandemic, I think the community, not only our county and state and nation, has realized the important role that childcare plays in the restoration of our economic growth. And so today I'm, I'm recognizing and, and requesting that those uh, that you recognize and, and, and also, you know, uh, maybe even rethink 
funding for some of our child care programs um, as we move forward uh, in this restorative um, process that we're all in. Um, I want to also recognize, you know, all the, the programs that are that are uh, serving our most vulnerable populations, both North and South County, and how important they all are. And also to you, because this is a difficult job and your staff is doing a difficult job too. And I just want to recognize them and you uh, for your time. And thank you so much for the whole process. Thank you, Diane. Sandy, your microphone is now available. Uh, thank you. Um, I'm interesting that I'm coming after that, that last person who spoke because one of the pieces of information that wasn't presented in your summary is that um, the core recommendations call for a 90% cut of all funding to child care for young children. Um, and essentially the amount allocated for child care is 0.001% of core funding. That's a rounding error. Now, you say that the goal of CORE is to be more reflective of the needs of the community. The community needs for child care for young children have been affirmed time and time and time again by assessments made by Santa Cruz government agencies, as well as state, federal, academic, business, and then at the raw experiences of every working family. If you affirm the decision as it stands now, you need to be aware that you're stating that you think childcare is not an important need for working families in Santa Cruz County. And the personal impact for you will be that your personal legacy as supervisor will be as the defunder of childcare. This is not about individual agency. This is about decisions made about a whole sector of service that is an ideological one and it's reflected in these funding decisions. So think really carefully because this is a three year cycle and many of you are going to be gone and that is going to end up being your personal legacy. And I know for many of you that that's probably not something you want to have. One other thing I want to reflect is in terms of the process of appeals. Here's the determination we're given. These are the only way we can um, respond. And here's are the parameters. There's an error or abuse of discretion. The record includes inaccurate information. A decision is supported by the record or a determination or interpretation is not in accord with the solicitation. I don't know what that means. And we have three days to do it. It's not a real process. It's a, it's Thank a, you, Sandy. It's we have no further speakers for this item, Chair. Thank you. Then I'll return to the board for action. Um, Supervisor McPherson. Yeah, Mr. Chair. Um, <clears throat> I want to start by quoting the, um, the staff report, a key phrase that we should keep in mind. It's, quote, uh, the evolution of the core program, including the development of this request, request for proposal, has been community informed, board and city council approved, and staff implemented. Um, I want to thank those also who were on this committee, the, uh, the RFP panelists, and those people who came here to speak to let us know today. Uh, it's uh, not a surprise, and I'm, I'm really glad that you let your feelings be known. This ever really started in uh, 2015 uh, and has undergone a continual revision uh, improvement over the time with numerous public hearings and meetings and private consultations with community board organizations. Uh, the board did direct staff to develop and implement a fair and data-driven transparent RFP process that involved professional consultants um, and content experts who could approach evaluating the proposals without a bias or conflict of interest. And I do think they really did that to the best of their ability. The aim of the aim was really to grade uh, programs based on documented outcomes and collective impacts among other criteria along with the county's uh, operational goals and objectives toward improving how we serve the community. Um, with, with all the grant programs, however, uh, there will be those who are recommended for funding and others who not are not, and which is uh, the difficulty we're grappling with it today and we have for my 10 years on the Board of Supervisors. 
That difficulty really should not call into question the high standards we set, I think, for the process as it is, and but rather should be viewed as our way, our way of trying to address the best ways uh, to serve the community. And, and by the numbers, this really can be an overall win-win situation for everybody. I mean, when you have 127 applications from 78 organizations, going after $5.8 million when there are five fifteen point six million million of requests, uh, it's pretty obvious we're not gonna be able to pre please most people um, or many of the organizations, but we have to do the best we can with what we have. And uh, I, I encourage the programs who are not recommended for funding to participate in the appeals process. And I know some of you don't think that's adequate. But this is the, the, the system we put into place, and that is why we set it up, for there to be a transparent process. And I do believe this has been transparent throughout the, the process to address those concerns. Um, to, without unraveling the thread of the sweater, I think it was mentioned, there is one program I can say, and I hope we can't start nitpicking every of one of the 126, 27 applications, but there's one program I think it should be known that I cannot support for being part of the recommended distribution. And that's the harm reduction coalitions expansion into the South County as recommended by the core panel. And the reason is um, I've rep repeatedly voted against uh, and with the majority of this board to priority prioritize our own health services agency, uh, its own syringe services program. And we have also directed staff to tackle uh, the syringe litter issue that itself is a public health program and so far has not been com comprehensively addressed. So I support harm reduction as a public health goal, but this recommendation, I don't believe it complies with the previous board direction and there's not been enough time for us uh, for this organization to distrim, dis, 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 demonstrate the ability um, to partner with the county on achieving all of our goals for harm re reduction. So that's the only uh, point that I would question on this overall proposal. And um, I do hope those who uh, have expressed their opinions will uh, take part in the appeal process and that um, we can have a clear picture of where we're gonna go and why if, uh, if any changes are made uh, in by June 28th. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Supervisor McPherson. Supervisor Kennedy. Yeah, thank you. Um, so first of all, I wanna take a moment um, and appreciate everyone who came out today to let their voices be heard. And then obviously for the work that people are doing day to day to make, um, to provide a safety net in our community, to improve quality of life, to serve uh, people in need and families in need. Um, it's remarkable work and, um, and you know, in, in, a, in, a, in a better, more perfect world, we would have the resources, as, as folks said, to, to fund uh, everybody and more um, for the work because the needs are great and the resources are scarce. Um, I will say there, there were some comments about how like this doesn't feel, this feels uncomfortable, this feels bad. I don't want people, I don't want to have to pick people to lose, who lose funding and everything else. But I, I got to say, the reason we haven't had these conversation, this hard conversation in the past was because people weren't allowed to participate. Groups like the Teen Kitchen Project, Food What, Jacob's Heart, Saludi Carino, the Homeless Garden Project, and then increased funding for Dientes and NAMI, they, they weren't allowed to apply for the last five years and get any funding. Um, and prior to that, those who have been on these boards for a while and have watched this process, they weren't allowed to apply uh, for uh, existing pools and funding. So we did, So in some ways, we didn't have to have a hard conversation because new people weren't allowed to participate, new groups and organizations weren't allowed to participate. Um, and so I, I recognize that this is a hard moment and a hard hearing, and I have a hunch it's going to be a hard couple of weeks uh, and an and and addition, additional hearing. But I do think, um, you know, that's because we've opened up this process. And when you open up a process and um, 
invite a lot of new uh, groups into the room, um, it it makes the existing resources um, uh, more scarce and it's more difficult. Um, in the in the hopes of moving forward, I'd like to make a motion um, that that at least the board can consider as we go, which would be. Um, recognizing this is a first stage in a process, there's going to be many more. Uh, one, we approve recommended actions. Uh, two, we remove the $145,000 funding recommendation for the Harm Reduction Coalition as, as is inconsistent with prior board direction to prioritize the county's own syringe services program and system, systematically address syringe litter, as Supervisor McPherson mentioned. We direct staff to return on 628 with recommendations to re redirect the $145,000 consistent with the process framework approved by the board for core and in consultation with board offices. And then four, we direct staff to return to the board on 628 with elements that will be included in the core contracts for countywide service provisions. Um, in other words, um, there's both who gets funded, but once we fund people, how do those programs get um, get operationalized across uh, across the county? So that's my motion. Um, I'll second the motion if it's proper. Yeah. Sure. Motion by Supervisor Coonerty, second by Supervisor McPherson. Any further discussion? I have some comments that's appropriate, Mr. Chair. Um, you know, ideally we would live in an equitable enough community where uh, these programs that spoke today and applied wouldn't be necessary. Uh, but we're not there yet. I mean, we have to remember that these programs are created by a series of need because of inequities within our system. And ultimately, um, it says a lot about the challenges that our overall macro system face that these systems are desperately needed and continually underfunded. And a lot of the board's focus needs to be on how do you change that that underlying trajectory uh, to ensure that that we we move we move toward that greater equity and and uh, I hear um, I mean the the comments that were made today are are real I mean these are these are stories of people that need the community's help uh, that rely on the programs that are being provided to them. I believe programs that uh, were selected and programs that weren't selected are all doing uh, absolutely essential work within our community. And I believe that, that uh, and this is a small portion, by the way, of what the county contracts out. I mean, the human services and the health services world contracts out a lot to uh, a lot of these community-based organizations to provide a lot of various services and safety net services. But uh, to Supervisor Coonerty's point, it is true that the, and there was near universal agreement about this with community-based organizations that the, the underlying original process of presumed funding, uh, static funding, and then a lot of the debates were just over whether there would be COLAs or, or whether there'd be increases or cuts depending upon the situation, um, was not an equitable process that allowed for alignment to changing demographics and changing community-based needs. I mean, um, the fact that some of the issues are still static from 40 years ago is 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 an unfortunate commentary on on, on our society on a greater level. But but there's also we can all agree the community has a lot of different challenges today than it did originally, which which necessitates a shift in how the county allocates its funding. I mean, that would be irresponsible for the county not to do that kind of review. With all that said, I I do think some of the the comments that were made today about uh, they may not have been couched in this way, but but I took it in this way to improve the system moving forward or fair. Um, I, I agree with uh, Ms. Peterson and, and Mr. Morris that that the, this is that the, the process was followed. That we created a process with a lot of community input, a lot of hearings over multiple years, um, and that that process was followed in the decisions that were recommended today. With that said, it was also said that that we would uh, evaluate that process and, and make changes, and I'm sure. Uh, county staff see some of the ways that things can be improved moving forward. I have some personal thoughts on ways that things can be improved moving forward, but that's not a commentary about whether or not the current process 
uh, was followed or not. It's just a commentary about how future processes can learn and be informed by uh, real world examples of how this process played out. And I think that one of them may be um, uh, one of the things that may need to be looked at is just adding additional flexibility um, on the core funding on these on this sort of last day situation. We can get into more details what that may be, but maybe it's a, a certain percentage is done through the process and there's greater flexibility on, on the day of on a set aside for not and that's not necessarily a growth of the total pie, but a, but a set aside that allows for flexibility of of evolving needs. And that would allow for the transparency and still allow for flexibility of, of the board moving forward. I understand that the board in theory has total flexibility now, but ultimately um, if we were to start a reallocation process, it'd be really problematic for not just the very important community programs that were funded, but the process that we work so hard to create and to shift. And I think that this is going to be the most difficult time while we're transitioning, but I also think that this is the most important time then uh, for us to receive that feedback on ways that we can improve the process uh, moving forward. So I, I will be supporting uh, the motion today a little bit uh, with hesitation, just in the fact that I, I do feel that we created a, a process and we should adhere to the process. I do hear what Supervisor McPherson is saying in regards to this one particular program. I also recognize, I imagine the city is going to have similar concerns, but but uh, I, I do want, there There were some personal statements made about county staff. And I just want to, I want to reflect on the fact that, um, you, you know, I don't think people choose to work in the human and health services world without uh, really having their calling be how do you help people that have less among us? And I, I think a lot of Director Morris and Ms. Peterson, the fact that they've chosen this vocation, they could do a lot of other things. Um, I don't question their motivations. And I also understand that in the heat of the moment, uh, we all can say things that maybe that we didn't exactly feel uh, or, or maybe weren't the most articulate at that moment. I know I definitely have done that a number of times in my life, but. But my experience with county staff, especially within those departments, has been nothing but how do we provide greater equity? How do we improve outcomes for people throughout the community? Um, and they're some of the strongest advocates behind the scenes for uh, community-based organizations and, and the partnership that they have with the county. So I just want to make sure that uh, that county staff knows that, that I, I truly do appreciate uh, your work for the most disadvantaged. And I truly appreciate the partnership we have with the community-based organizations. We serve partnerships in a partnership role. We can't do it without them and they can't do it without us. And sometimes like with any partnership, there's these, these challenges. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Supervisor Friend. Um, I'm wondering if I can make a friendly amendment that uh, in order to assist the appeals process, we issue each one of the uh, applicants their scoring matrix so that they have a better sense of of uh, you know the, the basis for the number that, that they received this morning. So we uh, actually I did want to address that uh, organizations that did want more information regarding their score and since be their scoring summary, they can reply to the notification email and we'll provide that information. And uh, we will be following up an email. We'll send, send an email out to all applicants letting them know that information in case they're not watching today. Okay, thank you. So not needed as an amendment, um, but um, I'm glad you'll be in touch with them to let them know. Um, I mean, I'll just add so, some reflection. I mean, to the effect that this is supposed to be uh, results and evidence-based, uh, I feel from my perspective, like I'm seeing very few of those results and evidence. Uh, you know, none of the programs being suggested for funding or not. Um, I mean, am I seeing, you know, just number of people served um, or, you know, at the efficacy of the money being used, results from, um, you know, the last round of funding. So, I mean, something that we can improve in the next round, but um, I definitely heard that comment a couple times today and um, it does resonate with me. Um, it feels like we're, that work was all done by the 58 uh, reviewers and uh, very little of it is available to the public uh, or even transparently to this board, at least in our public materials. Um, so again, I, th I do think we have a lot of work to do going forward. Um, I'm, willing to support the motion uh, today. And, um, you know, I think we'll, there's a, a lot to consider as far as all the comments presented. Um, and we'll get through the appeals process and uh, look at things on the 28th. Any further discussion? 
Well, uh, just uh, make a comment. I want to thank you for uh, all the time and work you put into doing this. You've taken off, you've taken a lot of pressure that we, you know, we would have to deal with. And uh, uh, this is not a perfect uh, proposal. It needs to be, you know, worked. And uh, so what I'm getting at is, uh, as much as we appreciate all the work you've done, I'm not going to rubber stamp something just because, you know, it's it's come to us. And then uh, the other is uh, we all have our own ideas on how to make it better. Uh, and that's what we need to do in the next couple of weeks. Uh, so anyway, it's going to be, it'll be interesting. Thank you, Supervisor Caput. All right. Uh, yes. Go ahead, I have just a question. It's a technical question. I don't know if our CAO counselor, you as the chair, I, I want to just make sure I understand what's being voted upon in terms of the um, additional direction. Is that something I should ask for after your vote or before your vote? Because where the staff needs to operationalize that. So I just know technically when's the time to ask that question. County Council. Well, Go ahead. I, I think I did want to want to ask a question about the motion just to clarify as to the hundred and thirty five thousand dollars. I. I, or $145,000, I heard a clause that uh, that would be discussed and uh, deliberated on with board members. And I wanna be sure that we're in recognizing Brown Act um, issues. And uh, I'm wondering whether the motion can be amended um, to eliminate that clause. Sure, so the clause, the, the exact clause was that it would be uh, consistent with the process, core process framework and, and in consultation with board offices. Uh, and so- um, I, I have concerns about that clause. And so I would, um, I would recommend striking that clause. That, okay. that the recommendations be made in consultation with board offices. Okay, I'll strike that clause. And, and may I ask if it's appropriate for me to ask one? I had that was one of my questions. Is this a, is this a chair? Is that a, I heard three parts to it, Supervisor uh, Coonerty. One was the uh, Supervisor McPherson in your second. And it sounds like the board's going to support removal of the one forty five. Then I heard the return on six twenty eight with a recommendation. After that, I'm hearing it's being striked in consult with boards, but there was a, a follow-up one that I missed and I tried to write it down. Something about for us when we return on the 28th to be clear about what we plan to list in the in the contracts. I just wanna make sure I understand what that direction was so we can comply with that for return on the 28th. Yeah, so it's just what elements will be uh, included in the core contracts for the provision of countywide services. Okay, I think I understand. So we can be clear in the board report for the 28th, how we recommend to operationalize that and your board could deliberate and public could comment and we'll execute whatever the final decision is when we execute contracts. Yeah. Okay, thank you. All right, if we're all clear on the motion, um, then clerk roll call vote, please. Supervisor Friend? Aye. Coonerty? Aye. Caput? Aye. McPherson? And Koenig? Aye. That item passes unanimously as amended. Thank you. Um, we had a 130 scheduled item and is now 149. Um, I don't know where we stand with the closed session. Um, I'd be inclined to take a 15 minute break and then come back to, to uh, resume our 130 scheduled item. But, but yeah, we, you can do that, but I would recommend moving closed session to the end of your agenda today if you wanna take a 15 minute break now. All right, yeah, we'll, uh, we'll take a 15 minute break. Uh, we'll move item 12 to uh, the end of our agenda. And then after that, we'll have closed session. All right, we'll break until uh, 2.05. Thank you. We'll now resume the meeting of the Santa Cruz County Board of Supervisors. We'll be uh, beginning with item 15, but uh, first clerk, if you'd please call the roll. Supervisor Friend? Here. Coonerty? Here. Caput? Here. McPherson? Here. And Koenig? Here. Thank you, Chair. You have a quorum.
So we're going to item 15 to consider authorizing the issuance of a proclamation honoring General Services Department Deputy Director Carol Johnson on her retirement from the County of Santa Cruz to be signed by all members of the board as outlined uh, in the memorandum by myself. Um, I suppose as a introduction, I'll read the proclamation that we have before us. Um, it covers some of the uh, many accomplishments of Ms. Johnson. So, whereas Deputy Director of the General Services Department, Carol Johnson, is retiring after 20 years of dedicated service to the County of Santa Cruz, and whereas Carol began her career with the county in March of 2002 when she was hired as an accounting technician with the Auditor Controller's Department, and in March of 2003, she promoted to a senior account technician with the General Services Department. And whereas after joining on with GSD, Carol rose up the ranks from administrative services officer to administrative services manager, and finally became the deputy director of GSD in 2019. And whereas in 2013, Carol received an employee recognition award for her role in the GSD energy efficiency upgrade team, which was responsible for the implementation of grant funded energy efficiency upgrades at five different county facilities, which significantly reduced the county's utility costs. And whereas in 2014 and 2018, Carol again received employee recognition awards for her roles in leading the seismic retrofit and upgrade of the Santa Cruz Memorial Building and efforts that created Monterey Bay Community Power. And whereas in 2018, Carol received recognition and honors from the California State Legislature, with the 2018 Clean Air Leader Award. And whereas in 2018, Carol was part of the first graduating class of the Santa Cruz County Leadership Training Program known as LEAP, Learn, Engage, Apply, and Perform, and was recognized by the California State Association of Counties as a credentialed California senior executive. And whereas Carol is known by her colleagues for her outstanding customer service and can-do attitude, along with her snazzy sayings like, that would be deluxe. And whereas in her retirement, Carol is looking forward to hopping in her RV and touring baseball fields across the country with her husband, Keith, as well as spending time with her children. Now, therefore, the members of the Santa Cruz County Board of Supervisors hereby thank, honor, and commend Carol Johnson for her years of dedicated service to the County of Santa Cruz. <clears throat> Would any members of the board like to add specific? Um, yes, Mr. Chair, there's a lot of things we can say, good things, all good things about uh, Ms. Johnson, Carol Johnson. And we, we all know what an amazing resource she has been to the Santa Cruz County team uh, for her entire career here as uh, the Deputy Director of General Services uh, most recently. But I do wanna highlight uh, one area that was mentioned to remind everyone how instrumental uh, her work was in forming Monterey Bay Community Power, which now is Central Coast Community Energy. Um, of course, the en entire executive team of the county was involved in that, that stretch, but Carol was really the, it was central in coordinating the Regional Project Development Advisory Committee and attended many of the final decision-making public meetings of the various city and county boards throughout the regions. And now we are in within five counties uh, from here down to Santa Barbara County with uh, 34 agencies and Central Coast Community Power. It wouldn't have been a reality really if she wouldn't have been there as really a rock to make this happen. And uh, before the Joint Powers Agency had any staff at all, uh, Carol was there as the central hub of communication for all the parties involved. And her clear close work with uh, my office made a tremendous difference. It made all the difference in the world. And I just wanna thank you, Carol, for once again, for your partnership, hard work and dedication over the four years it did took to had us uh, that we had to take to make that uh, organization become a reality. It's a tremendous organization and uh, you're a very, very important part of it. I just wanna say thank you for everything that you've done in particular for that, but everything for Santa Cruz County as well. Thank you. Mr. Chair, if I may as well, thank you, Supervisor McPherson. I, I've had the the real honor of working with Ms. Johnson since uh, before I worked at the county, I was at the Santa Cruz Police Department and she was uh, somebody I worked with a lot on grant related issues. And, and she is just an absolute quiet leader, just someone who never seeks the limelight, probably actually hates being where 
she is right now being recognized by all of us, was so patient with me with these very gentle reminders that you're late on your grant application, Zach, or the stuff you sent in isn't right per usual. And then she would tell me the best way to do things, always, always guiding, always teaching, always on top of everything, just that without her ability to implement uh, without her ability to deal with so many different personalities, as Supervisor McPherson was was actually noting throughout the the multi counties on on that project, but you know we this is a real loss for the county. I have to say, just someone who is that talented does not seek the limelight, gets the work done, has made a huge difference in people's lives throughout multiple counties, and in my case, actually uh, guided me through learning some processes that have been useful for me as I've continued on in my. My current life as a county supervisor. So, so Carol, congratulations. I just wanted to thank you for the, the the almost 20 years now that we've worked together, and to let you know that that you were uh, at the time of of when I was at the PD, probably my favorite county employee at that time. So I got to say that uh, you've uh, you've and, and and you're still very 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 high on the list. If I didn't say that my staff are the current uh, favorite employees, I'd, I'd get a lot of hard time right now. But but I just wanted to say that you are an outstanding individual. You deserve. Uh, nothing but good things in your retirement. And uh, thank you for all that you did for me and for the county at, at large. And I'll just add that um, anybody who can teach supervisor friend anything uh, deserves more than a proclamation. But um, I want to thank uh, Carol for her uh, really um, tremendous career. It's you need consummate professionals in any organization to keep to keep everything going. And um, you know, the general services department is something that doesn't get a lot of time and attention. But Carol's leadership there, uh, in so many ways, in so many different um, initiatives and and efforts across the county on energy, on energy resiliency, on um, emergency response. Um, she's been absolutely fantastic. And um, she certainly will be missed, but has this is well-deserved and, uh, and I appreciate everything you've done for our county. Uh, thank you for your wonderful service. Uh, uh, to the county. I think everybody uh, realizes uh, the last couple of years has probably been the toughest uh, couple of years of uh, anybody's uh, service to the county. So thank you for going through everything that we've had to go through and all your help uh, that you've done. Uh, looking forward to hearing uh, from yourself uh, when you get the proclamation. Thank you. Carol, I just wanted to uh, thank you uh, personally for everything you've done, not only for the county um, and the community, but for me as well. You're just someone that um, we could always rely on and that as um, I think Zach mentioned, you're a very quiet leader, but also a very strong leader. And we just appreciate everything you've done. You're a role model in terms of a public servant for all of us. Thank you. They're all just that we, we don't have many years working together, but when I did show up in January of 2021 uh, and you, you, I think you were one of about 10 people here in this building. So that said something to begin with. Um, and then you handed, handed me my parking pass and I asked you, oh, well, who's enforcing this? Uh, he said, Oh, I am. <laughs> uh, so that, you know, just, I think that demonstrates the ability, the fact that you always show up, you do what needs to get done. And this long list of accomplishments here on the proclamation, I think is uh, a result of that attitude that you showed up with every day. And we really will miss you. Thank you. Would anyone else like to say anything about uh, Ms. Johnson? Uh, thank you, Chair and Board. Uh, Michael Beaton, uh, Director of General Services. Uh, this one's, uh, I know we don't have a problem doing public speaking, but uh, for Carol, this one is actually uh, choking me up a little bit. Uh, on April 1st, 2022, I thought I received what I would call the almost greatest April Fool's joke ever. Carol called me into her office, uh, like she normally does, and she handed me a piece of paper. And I quickly read that piece of paper and realized she was retiring. 
I stood there in disbelief and I went away for about a couple other meetings. And I, and during that second meeting, I realized, wait, today is April Fool's Day. <laughs> so in my excitement, I ran back and I was thinking, she's playing an April Fool's joke on me. I can't believe it. But I am sad to say that she was not. So that's why I call it the almost greatest April Fool's <laughs> joke ever. Carol has, has uh, been a leader, a mentor, and a driving force for the County and General Services Department for the last 20 years, serving 19 of those in general services. I first heard of Carol when I was with the Health Services Agency approximately 10 years ago. She quickly became one of the go-to contacts in order to get stuff done. I've had the luxury of working with her, learning from her, mentoring with her over the last four plus years. Carol has always done the work of two people and always with a smile. I would be remiss if I didn't say I'm sad to see her go. Work, working with her these last four years has been fantastic. I enjoyed her personality and her good times and her bad. Although I can't ever really recall any bad times as she's always happy and always customer service oriented. Carol's positive attitude and contagious smile will be missed day to day inside GSD. But on behalf of GSD, Carol, I want to thank you for all that you've done for this county, the GSD family, but more importantly, me. I wish you and Keith well in your joint retirement. Carol, would you like to say a few words? Well, as Supervisor Friend alluded to, I do not like the spotlight and I don't like public speaking, so I've made a few notes. So first of all, thank you, Chair. Appreciate this and the board for the recognition. Never did I think that 20 years ago, I'd get the opportunity to do everything that I've had the chance to do. Collaborate with county staff on projects like you mentioned, but also Primo, the county strategic plan. Um, I've worked with amazing colleagues. I can only name a few, Edith Driscoll, Laura Bowers, Christina Mowry, my mentor, Trish Daniels, Kathy Sams, Jessica Randolph, the, all the staff and personnel who've helped me navigate all those amazing, tiresome personnel guidelines and hiring people. Um, they've give, shared their guidance, their wisdom, their experience, and I appreciate all the time that it took them to do that with me. And then over the last two years, I've had a chance to work with departments of public, work, public works and human services as we struggle to get through CZU lightning fire and COVID-19 and help the uh, community rejuvenate. I was overwhelmed by their compassion, dedication, and collaboration to the people in our community. And I was proud to be a part of that response. I wanna thank the amazing staff in general services, especially our admin and physical teams, purchasing and warehouse and fleet. They have had my back the entire time. I could not have done my job without them. And I appreciate them every day. And lastly, Michael, it's been an amazing four years. Um, again, I've learned from you. You inspire me. I can only imagine where the county is going to be and general services, especially in 20 years and your leadership. So thank you. Thank you. Uh, before I give this proclamation to you, I, we're always forgetting that we have to uh, authorize them with the motion. So if, could I get a motion from a fellow board member? Motion. <laughs> second. Motion by Supervisor McPherson, second by Supervisor Friend. Any further discussion? Uh, seeing none, roll call vote, please. Supervisor Friend. Aye. Coonerty. Aye. Caput. Aye. McPherson. Aye. And Koenig. Aye. That item passes unanimously. All right, now that I'm duly authorized to give you this proclamation. So much. Appreciate it.
All right, we'll now proceed to item 16 to consider authorizing the issuance of a proclamation honoring Paya Levine to be signed by all members of the board. And I'll go ahead and read our proclamation for Paya. <laughs> Whereas Paya Levine is retiring as interim planning director from the County of Santa Cruz after 35 years of dedicated service. And whereas Pia earned a bachelor's degree in earth sciences from the University of California at Santa Cruz and began her career as water, a watershed analyst in the environmental planning section of the Santa Cruz County Planning Department, which uh, after which she went on to become a resource planner, staff geologist, and then principal planner, managing the environmental planning, development review, and sustainability policy sections of the department before being promoted to assistant planning director. And whereas Paya was called upon to assume the role of interim planning director after the unprecedented pressures of the CZU August Lightning Complex fires and COVID-19 pandemic, during which she led the development of new work processes and trying times and exhibited the leadership, professionalism, and grace, and whereas Paya's sense of compassion and equity converged with the needs of those rebuilding after the CZU August Lightning Complex fire disaster, and she worked tirelessly to create recovery permit center and rebuilding policies to support CZU survivors on their path home. And whereas Paya utilized her leadership skills and geologic understanding to respond to two major Santa Cruz County natural disasters, the 1989 Loma Prieta earthquake and 2020 post CZU fire debris flow threat with respect and empathy for survivors and swiftly negotiated the creation of sound recovery policies to allow reconstruction of damaged structures. And whereas under Paya's guidance, the planning department has made strides toward finding solutions to complex land use, housing, climate change, and regional challenges, which necessitated the development of numerous land use policies and regulations, including cannabis regulations and the sustainability update. And whereas Paya has not only been a dedicated leader throughout her esteemed county career, but has also been a valued mentor, problem solver, and source of guidance, wisdom, and calm during any storm, as well as a cherished coworker and friend to many who will be missed, but contacted frequently. And whereas Paya will set an example for others in retirement, as well as traveling throughout the globe and finding new rewarding challenges, both physical and philanthropic. Now, therefore, the members of the Santa Cruz County Board of Supervisors hereby thank, honor, and commend Paya Levine for her years of dedicated service to the County of Santa Cruz. Board members like to uh, add a few words. Yeah, Mr. Chair, I'll, I'll start if that's okay. Um, Ms. Levine is just an outstanding public servant and a remarkable listener. And uh, when we would meet, there was never a code issue that was in the depths of the code, totally esoteric, that she couldn't tell you exactly where it was or what it meant. Um, one of the things I always feared about uh, Ms. Levine, though, is that she would take copious notes when you would talk to her, and I wasn't sure if they were just she was just judging everything I was saying, or whether she was uh, <laughs> what are these questions this guy's asking. But at the end of the day, what I appreciated was she listened. She always had a creative idea for a solution on problems that we brought forward, and was always willing to work toward change to effectuate something. And a lot of people in the community don't get to see. Uh, the work that county staff does, I recognize that the board is out in front or there's certain department heads that are out in front. But, but Paya, you really shifted a lot of, of for the better, um, culture and opportunity within not just the planning department, but overall in things that we did on housing policy and the way that you uh, advocated for changes in the code quietly but effectively to help improve outcomes for people in the community. I, I always respected and trusted your counsel, because it always came unfiltered. It always came from a place of knowledge and history that I did not have. Um, and you are a wealth of information and a, just a trusted individual. And, and I, I truly admire you as a person and, and also as a public servant, and you will be missed at the county. Thank you. Let me also just uh, agree with what Zach said. Pi is just the consummate problem solver. Um, and then over the last couple of years, uh, as we face CZU fires and then debris flows, um, 
had real grace and intelligence under pressure um, to find creative solutions, uh, to navigate very, very difficult issues, some of which we control, many of which we do not, um, and a real commitment to, to ser ser public service and serving uh, the fire victims and people who we could, uh, who, who were in real need of our, of our help. Um, and then finally, I think also, as Zach said in these meetings, um, always getting right to the heart of an issue and doing it with um, <clears throat> real thoughtfulness and then just a real sense of humor, um, which is not always uh, the first thing that comes when you think about code uh, requirements or other uh, issues that we face. Um, but uh, it's truly been a pleasure to work with you as a professional, as a human being, as a member of our community. Yeah, I would uh, like to reiterate those comments that were made by uh, Zach and, and Ryan. And um, she came into her most recent position really at, at the most difficult of times, as was mentioned, the CCU fire, which has been how do you react to it and do it as quickly as you can, especially when there's some state obligations you have to meet. And she just, you know, just wove through those issues and got to where we needed to be as quickly as she could. And then COVID hit. And so she didn't have the employees to see face to face like uh, everybody else was used to. Uh, that, that was another complication, but she got through that and did it. And I, I want to compliment because of her leadership, the planning department ran very smoothly as as smoothly as it could under those um, conditions. And I want to thank her again for her hard work and professionalism that she exhibited uh, through dozens of meetings and consultations to address the recovery issues in particular, as I mentioned. Um, <clears throat> Working on planning is never easy, but it's, I can't think of a more difficult time than when she has been the head of the department uh, that she's had to really go through. There's been a lot of emotion. Um, and on the side of many of our constituents that we have had in the recovery process. But thanks, Paya, for your uh, leadership, your dynamic personality, uh, and yeah, having a sense of humor as much as you can under some real trying circumstances. She is a special, special person. We're lucky to have her in the most difficult of times that I think we've we've uh, we've faced in the planning process in many, many years, if not forever, in Santa Cruz County. So thank you, Paya, and um, enjoy your retirement. Yeah, 35 years is a long time. And uh, you were probably, uh, well, probably very young when you came here and uh, started working. And I don't know. Uh, I'm looking forward to hearing what you have to say. Uh, uh, and uh, thank you for getting through, uh, uh, you know, a lot of things that we had to get done. And uh, actually uh, improving the uh, planning department of the whole process. So thank you. Uh, Paya, I just wanted to thank you. Um, you stepped up at, at a very difficult moment in the county's history into a leadership position uh, that was a very difficult leadership position and you did it with such uh, grace and such calmness and such professionalism. I just really admire you. I think you're a great person and you really saved us at a time we really needed you. Thank you very much. I'll just add that as a new supervisor taking office during a clear housing crisis, I of course came in with lots of ideas for how we can improve planning and what we can do about housing policy. Uh, and I. Uh, Pio, you were always there uh, for a one on one and um, where it's so easy to say uh, no so often in government because of liability or because uh, you know the way we've always done things, uh, you always said yes if uh, and had a had a, a way through it um, with a reference to the code um, and something that we could work on together and it was a very collaborative attitude uh, and I really appreciated that. And uh, I, I know you were, have been interim planning director for just a year and the, the department is uh, undergoing some major changes, but I think you really set us off on the right foot uh, with your leadership. So thank you. Anyone else like to say a few words? 
Good afternoon, Carolyn Burke, Assistant Director of Community Development and Infrastructure. Um, so I'm both happy and sad to be here. Um, woo. <laughs> um, so uh, in deference to Paya's East Coast sensibilities, I'll try and keep this short and to the point. Um, no one breaks down a problem like Paya Levine. Um, you can be in the midst of the most complex situation and she says, okay, and starts pacing. And eventually in the course of about 10 or 15 minutes, we've distilled things down to the main points that we need to solve to get where we need to go. And that type of leadership was um, what we, uh, what we so desperately needed in the midst of two crises coming at once. And uh, Paya had been through trial by fire when she went through as a staff geologist, the Loma Prieta earthquake um, and learned so much that she brought to us. Um, in between, she has led every section in our department. <laughs> and um, it's, that accumulation of knowledge and wisdom combined with a complete lack of ego in making these decisions and policies and always at the forefront, um, looking for good planning and um, treating her staff well. Um, sometimes to her own detriment, she would, she, um, everyone has gotten the late night emails from Paya. Most of the time, the 2 a.m. emails are set to go out at 8 a.m. so that she um, makes sure to set a good example for staff. And we have always appreciated both her care and her knowledge, and we will miss her greatly. Thank you, Paya. Good afternoon, board. My name is Daniel Sasueta. I'm assistant county counsel, and I represent the planning department. And where is she? <laughs> Paya Levine. Just wanted to come up here and say thank you to Paya. Um, and I wanted to make sure that everyone in this room and uh, everyone listening, and for the record to show just how much I appreciate her hard work. And I wanted to acknowledge that, um, you know, a lot of times, as, as the attorney, you get to see all of it, right? You get to see the good, the bad, and you have to come in and, and do some cleanup sometimes. But, um, you know, we get to see in the public eye a lot of stuff that uh, maybe doesn't always go right. But I get to see behind the scenes of all the stuff that does go right. And there's just so much of it. Um, she is a tireless advocate for the county. Um, and we are just so lucky that we had her for so long. Um, you don't know how hard she, I got to see how hard she works. I see how many hours, how many weekends, how much time she spent caring about this county and caring about the institution. Um, so I think it's, uh, it's a sad day for us, but I think it's a great, great day to recognize Pia Levine and say thank you. Good afternoon, uh, Suzanne Isai with the housing section and planning. And I just want to echo the comments that have been made here today and say how much um, we are going to miss Paya. It has been really great working for her. Um, it, she did come into the position she has now at an incredibly difficult time. I personally can't imagine having to juggle everything that she juggled and all the crises, you know, with the pandemic, the fires, having, you know, uh, department retirements and all of that. Uh, it's just mind boggling to me that she was able to pull that off without having, a, you know, a nervous breakdown. I think it's um, amazing. And I, I don't know if, you know, folks outside our department can really fully understand and appreciate how much expertise she has and her depth of knowledge in her fields um, and what an incredible, uh, loss this will be, but I, I totally wish her the very best in her retirement. And we're very happy to congratulate her today on her retirement. Thank you. Ayo, would you like to say a few words? 
Thank you. We've had a lot of discussions about um, my retirement in the department, and they usually end up in a, a lot of tears around the table. So um, I've had to write down my remarks. Um, thank you, everybody, for your kind words. Um, I don't trust my memory enough to recognize everybody who's been important along the way. But um, firstly, I'm so grateful for the opportunity to have done meaningful public service in my adopted home community for so long. <laughs> and um, to work in so many different roles over time. My career here has been very many things, but it has never ever been boring. I started here in the previous millennium um, by a, a somewhat random event, I filled out an interest form at which the personnel department was, the personnel department was recruiting at a professional meeting I was at. And I filled out an interest form, mostly to encourage the young gal who was sitting at the table because she wasn't getting very much traffic. And the next thing I know, I'm a watershed analyst and grading inspector in the planning department. That evolved quickly into practicing geology, which is my actual specialty just in time for the magnitude seven earthquake. And once I and all of us recovered from that, I joined the ranks of the California CEQA nerds. And finally, I shifted to the built environment and to administration. My gratitude extends to so many people, my colleagues, staff, mentors, advisors of all stripes, clients, the technical community in this town, our customers, commissioners, and the board members. I can't hope to mention you all, but if you're in this room, you've influenced my career in a positive way, and I thank you all. Um, a few particular shout outs. Firstly, um, thank you to my family for sharing me with my job. And Sophie, Robert, Teresa, Jeff, Terry, and Diego, Diego thank you for being here this afternoon. <laughs> Thank you to the staff of planning. You will not find a more dedicated and creative group of people anywhere. And I think it was Daniel who said so much goes on behind the scenes that um, their effort and their talent is I think vastly underappreciated. And they are the reason I was able to do any problem solving at all. So um, thank you so much to the staff. You know, in particular, the way the staff responds to challenge is with teamwork and professionalism. Um, and really, it's, it's just extraordinary what this group of people can do. At the end of the day, for me, it's the teamwork that I value. And my idea of a good time is spending the day in a room of other people solving problems. So it's, it's been a good match in that way. The current team of managers I've been privileged to work with is an outstanding group of leaders and friends. Stephanie Hansen and Carolyn Burke, Amy Woolbanks and Jocelyn Drake, Matt Johnston and Marty Heaney, Suzanne Issei, Lizanne Jeffs and Julie Newbold. They are all heart as well as professionalism and including also our council, Daniel Zazueta. The generosity within that group is really just, it's been wonderful to be a part of. Many thanks to my mentors and advisors, among them Kathy Malloy, who was our previous director. She saw where the best fit for me would be when I could not see it myself. And as usual, she was absolutely right. Thank you to the CAO office and um, particularly um, Melody Serino. She taught herself land use and has been a fantastic support, especially in the last 10 months. Um, I think being a great mentor is part of your passion for organizational development, but it also reflects that you're just a very generous person. Thank you to the rest of the CAO team. Um, I value my new relationships with Elisa and David. Thank you to all the county council staff, especially to Jason. He's been a reliable and smart sounding board and I hope friend. Thank you to Carlos for giving me the most recent opportunity to Matt Machado for carrying on the planning and environmental principles of our county into the new community development and infrastructure department. 
And lastly, I would like to thank each of the board members for having confidence in me, for the times that we were thought partners on how to accomplish your goals for the community and for your revived investment in the community planning. Professionally speaking, I grew up here and I will miss each of you. I will look forward to the fine things that will happen in the community development and infrastructure department and my very best to each of you going forward. I now um, can have my nervous breakdown on a weekday. <laughs> If I go too far, Paya, if I can just get a, a motion to approve this proclamation. I'll move the recommended actions. Second. Okay. Uh, roll call vote, please. Supervisor Friend. Aye. Coonerty. Aye. Caput. Aye. McPherson. Aye. And Koenig. Aye. This item passes unanimously. Come back and forth. We'll now proceed to item 17 to consider authorizing the issuance of proclamations honoring Larry Bigham, Jerry Christensen, and John Minslov to be signed by all members of the board. And for this item, we have our public defender, Heather Rogers. Uh, nope, sorry. I believe she's on Zoom. Uh, who knows these three better than anyone? Heather, I believe you have your microphone. <laughs> Wonderful. Thank you so much. Can you hear me okay? We can. Wonderful. I want to start by saying congratulations, Larry, Jerry, and John. You did it. You set out to create a public defense firm that fought for the rights of the underrepresented, zealously defended them, and turned out aggressive, committed, skilled public defenders. For over 45 years, you have done just that. There is not a defense attorney in this county who has not been touched by your life's work. We proudly follow in your footsteps, honored to be a part of this family you've created, a tribe of attorneys, investigators, and administrative staff who followed you down this difficult path, taking up your calling to stand up for the accused. I can honestly say that each of you dramatically changed the course of my life. When I took a law clerk internship at BCM in 2003, during the final semester of my final year in law school, I thought I wanted to be an environmental law attorney. And within a few weeks, I knew that I would never handle another clean water case. I was completely <laughs> and hopelessly in love with this work. I shared a windowless office in Annex 2 with Mandy Tovar, across the hall from Lisa McCamey, I wrote my first 995 from Mark Garver. Beth Chance was my brilliant supervisor. I think we were running DOS at the time on this big clunky computer with a tower, but none of that mattered. The team at BCM were brilliant, vibrant, fun, social justice warriors with big ideas, big hearts, and a relentless passion for justice. And you three led that team. Larry with a story saying or quote for every situation, always up to jam on a case full of advice. Very calm under pressure. There for us when we needed a cool headed assessment and the straight truth about a situation, never pulling punches. John, the thinker, brilliant and intuitive, a human supercomputer of information about everyone and everything in Santa Cruz County, every law and every case, with a knack for getting to the heart of the matter. I knew right away that I was going to do whatever it took to join you in this fight. And here we are. I am humbled and honored and happy to keep walking this path with the BCM team, continuing your life's work, which is also ours. When you're in Italy, walking on the beach, playing with your grandchildren, gardening and listening to jazz, think of us. We'll be sitting around that big round wooden table 
that in a few weeks we'll move from the library at BCM to the library at our new office and we'll be talking about our cases, wondering how to handle something. And somebody will remember the sign above the copier. If you're not making dust, you're eating it. And we'll know exactly what to do. Thank you. Would, would anyone else like to say a few words? Yeah, Mr. Chair, I'd like to add in some words. It's it it's nice to be on the other side so that I'm not just listening to Larry, Jerry, and John talk to me, right, guys? <laughs> like these are these these three amazing people are people that I've known for a long time. And similar to Carol, I first encountered them uh, when I worked at the police department. And let me say something about their character. Um, it says a lot about people when you can be on the other side of them on an issue and you absolutely respect every single thing that they're saying and know that what they're bringing to the table is clear, honest, and a perspective that's worthy of listening to. And I've always felt that way about them. And uh, and I think the entire community did. And for that matter, at the time in law enforcement, all of law enforcement felt that way, that they may not, they recognized that everybody had a role, but they had just such utmost respect for their for the approach that they did, uh, for the care and effort that they brought to those that needed uh, adequate defenses in our community, and just the intellect that they brought. And it was it says a lot that they they did it for so long and and were such a trusted source. I've had the privilege personally of also getting to know them, not just professionally. The great fortune of of uh, having them actually live in my district, <laughs> two of them anyway, and uh, you know this is this transition to the public side is the right thing, but it wouldn't have been able to happen without the culture that they created within that agency to help develop internal talent and uh, the work that they did to adequately represent uh, the indigent and others within our community. So just a deep amount of respect for you that this is what you chose, and also let me say this too that that a lot of attorneys go the corporate way in order to make a lot more money. And some of them don't have a choice because of law school debt and other reasons. But, you know, you chose the hard road. You chose making sure that somebody's constitutional rights were protected and that they had a, a very strong voice in our local justice and system. And, you know, that says a lot about who you are, all three of you. So I just wanted to, uh, to send that respect over and, and looking forward to seeing you in a personal capacity in your retirement. Yeah, uh, I'll just add in that um, one, I hope this doesn't mean that I, I won't see you guys wandering around downtown looking for a good lunch spot. Downtown economy needs uh, needs your business, but um, uh, appreciation for your passion and commitment and also your willingness to engage in um in moving upstream and helping people avoid the criminal justice system and finding alternatives uh, to incarceration and alternative programs that, that involved accountability but, uh, and treatment um, and, uh, and created an option for people uh, to get to do better and for our community to see less impacts. And I appreciate that. And um, over the many years, I've had uh, Larry come to my class a bunch of times. And every time uh, it was an inspiring um, lecture on what it means to do justice in our system and why his job uh, and the job of his firm matters um, to people, uh, to all of us, not just those accused. Um, and so I'm grateful for your service to our community. Uh, and I do wish you all the best in all these other endeavors, but um, you've all been just outstanding advocates and people and leaders in our community. <laughs> Please. It's been a while before I've appeared before this August body. It's nice to see a, a real old friend there that has the staying power that the group that we're honoring um, here today had. My name is Bill Kelsey. I was retired. I'm a retired judge. I was an active judge full time for 38 years, mostly here, but often everywhere else in the state of California. 
And I had an occasion to observe public defenders because of course, guess who has the most knowledge about the performance of lawyers that appear before them? It's the judges. And I had occasion to see different kinds of public defender offices. The, the type that we're structuring now, which is fine, a private firm like these fine gentlemen have had all these years, as well as even an elected public defender. In all those years, because it's not easy for anybody but somebody in the system to judge a public defender, I mean, after all, they don't pick their clients, they don't pick their witnesses, they really don't have regular hours, they're often overworked, and so it's only the judge that gets to see them on a daily basis, observe their demeanor, their character, their proficiency, their initiative. And I have to tell you, this private law firm, from my experience, is the most remarkable public defender's office I ever saw. It was amazing to me as a judge to see for almost 47 years this high level of proficiency, this high level of ability, lawyers that, who were always well-trained, and they were well-trained by these remarkable men. And I just have to tell you, and I know Harry Brower will disagree with me, <laughs> oh, no. but in 19, what was it, 75, I wasn't even a judge then, it took two years later, he got together with some of his colleagues, the county administrative office, and basically directed in his fashion that these men be appointed the public defender. And I find it the most remarkable accomplishment. There's only one person whose accomplishment could perhaps come close to meeting it, and of course that's Bruce. He's been outstanding all these years in public service. But these men had done something quite re remarkable because it has simply been consistently the best office I've ever seen. Thank you very much. Kelsey is always a hard act to follow. My name is Craig Haney. I'm a psychology professor at UC Santa Cruz. Um, and I've known uh, these three gentlemen for the better part of the last five decades. Um, we were only three years old when we met. Uh, uh, I came here uh, about um, 40 plus years ago to take a job as an assistant professor at UC Santa Cruz. I was fresh out of graduate school and law school. And at that time, it was fashionable to be critical of public defender's offices. Um, they were characterized as overworked and underfunded, uh, as eager to uh, plea bargain their defendants in cases where they shouldn't plea bargain. Uh, and uh, assembly line justice was the term that was often applied to them. And even before I got here, I had seen some of those assembly line justice public defender offices and consultations that I had done in different parts of the country, Newark, Philadelphia, Los Angeles even. And so when I came to Santa Cruz, I expected to see much the same thing. And um, early in my tenure at UC Santa Cruz, almost the first year I was here, I was invited to come up to their office. And I was shocked to see something entirely different, the complete opposite of the stereotype of a public defender's office. Even in those early days, they were totally and completely committed to their clients. They were committed to defending their clients at all costs, no matter what energy it took, no matter what toll it took on them as lawyers. No stone unturned was the motto. And it was a motto that they applied to all of the cases, small and large. It wasn't just commitment, it was uh, also sophistication. So I watched them develop remarkably effective techniques, trial practice techniques that weren't really being used anywhere else. I still consulted with public defenders offices across the country. So I can endorse what Judge Kelsey has just said, which is I've never encountered a public defenders office any better and rarely found one that could match them. Um, early in the 1980s, Santa Cruz had a number of high profile capital cases and the public defender's office handled them. And in those cases, they perfected techniques that are still being used today. 
I was at a death penalty training seminar just a week ago in Baltimore for death penalty lawyers from across the country. And they were teaching as best practices the practices that the Santa Cruz County Public Defender's Office developed in the early 1980s, they're still using them. And as you heard Judge Kelsey say, there are many, many lawyers who got their start in this office and have taken that commitment to justice, the social justice warrior ethos that they instill and the techniques that they taught, taken them out of the office and into the community. And we in the community are the beneficiaries of their training. And some of those lawyers are not just in Santa Cruz, but they're across the country. The other thing that they've done, and I suspect few people in the community know it, but I know it very personally, is they have mentored hundreds of undergraduates from UCSC over the 47 years that they've been in practice. So I and other UCSC faculty members in the legal studies and politics and psychology department send that law office undergraduate students who work in a variety of capacities, learning how the law operates, learning what it looks like and feels like, learning the commitment to justice that is so much a part of what they do in that office. Many of those undergraduate interns have gone on to law school themselves and they're practicing law, not just in California, but across the country. I run into them at conferences and they say, I took your class, you advised me to go to the public defender's office. It opened my eyes. I went to law school. I became a lawyer. I'm a public defender now myself. One of those people is my own daughter. Um, my daughter, Erin, graduated from UCSC. She wasn't sure what she wanted to do. She got a job in the public defender's office and they instilled in her that commitment to justice. She went to law school. She became a public defender in San Francisco herself. She's now the national legal director for uh, uh, the Reform Alliance. It's a criminal justice reform organization run by Van Jones and others. And she's often said to me that, that the spark to do that kind of work was instilled in her in that office. So a while ago, I asked her, well, what, Aaron, what was it you learned there? What was it that really put you on this path? She paused for a minute and she said, courage. And I, I asked her to elaborate and she said, well, courage, the courage to stand up in any room and do the right thing, no matter the odds against you. And she said, they taught me that there. And I said to her, I thought I taught you that. Uh, and they said, well, you did that, but they taught me how to do it in the courtroom. And that's that's the kind of ethos that is um, it, it's it's hard to put a label on it. That kind of commitment to social justice is, is hard to define. It's hard to quantify. But that's what these men in that office have been doing for the last 47 years. So on behalf of the thousands of people whose liberty you've protected and the scores of lawyers you've trained and the hundreds of undergraduates at UC Santa Cruz that you've mentored and instilled that ethos. And I want to thank you. You three men are retiring as legends, not just in this town, but in the defense community at large. Thank you. Before Larry, before you get up, I just have to say, if you, you know, Larry, I'm up here, Bruce. Uh, you know, we. Who stole? Hi, Bruce. <laughs> yeah. yeah. You know, we politicians have to say something about it. you. You can't say it any better than those last two speakers. Uh, the quality of what we have had here in Santa Cruz County, that who have served uh, with the utmost the highest grade of professionalism, devotion, and dedication for, you know, a relentless, a relentless passion for justice. Uh, that's what they are about. Uh, they are really the best you, you could ever get. And they have been through some trials and defense situations that have reached national attention, uh, certainly statewide attention. And they are just the, the best of the group, as has been said, uh, when you compare to what other judges and uh, the professors have seen, uh, these three are the top of the ring. And I, I, I don't know uh, John and Larry as well as I do Jerry, because Jerry and I go back, way back, uh, when we were uh, Pointed League All-Stars, and uh, we lost two to nothing to La Mesa, or we would have gone to the World Series. And... Uh, you know, if we could have each hit a home run, we would have won, huh, Jerry? Yeah, right. He, if he wouldn't have been an attorney, he would have been a professional baseball player. But, uh, you know, I have um, 
Time and again, when you talk about public defender, I think some many of us have been in that conversation with gosh, how difficult would that be to do that, you know, really? And to do it with the integrity that you have and have displayed, that is, as we've learned, nation, you recognize nationally, uh, certainly statewide, uh, it is just a classy, classy office that you have been part of and led. You have a great team of people with you, and uh, they're, they're just fortunate to have worked under you. But thank you for your service and really for uh, your your relentless passion for justice. Much appreciated. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Um, Perla Ronellis Perez with Assemblymember Mark Stone and my colleague. Jonathan Engelman with State Senator John Laird's office. Okay, so we just wanted to, um, on behalf of assembly members, Mark Stone, Robert Rivas, and Senator John Laird, we wanted to present the following resolutions to um, Larry Bigham, John Minsloff, and Gerald Christensen for all your hard work for our community. And I actually wanted to add that um, during 2020, I was actually an investigative intern. And growing up, I've always loved and um, I knew I wanted to be an attorney. But after completing this internship, it just really solidified my love um, for this issue. And uh, I cannot um, follow up on all these stories, but it just goes to show how incredible the work you guys have all done for our county, because all these people are out here with all these amazing stories for you. And 47 years is just truly incredible to think about. And, you know, one of the pillars of our country is the right to legal counsel, regardless of socioeconomic status. So to do that is a truly righteous and inspiring. And on behalf of State Senator John Laird, Assemblymember Mark Stone and Assemblymember Robert Rivas, we're just incredibly thank thankful for all the work that you've all done. And we have these uh, resolutions for you from the state legislature. Thank you. All right. <laughs> All right, get in here, Jim. <laughs> Is it my turn? Yes, it's your turn. Go ahead. Thank you for all the kind remarks. We have fought the good fight. We have finished the course. We have kept the faith. And it's time to pass the baton. I am blessed to have had a long career in a profession with such profound purpose. Representing people's liberty is both an honor and a serious responsibility. 50 years, nearly 50 years as a public defender is a very long time in what is an often competitive and occasionally contentious profession. And I'm grateful to many people who made it happen. First of all, I want to thank the people who hired me initially, Gary Britton and Jim Jackson from Britton and Jackson the firm that had the contract for indigent defense services before I and my partners got it. Um, they hired me in 1972. I'm a new, I don't think you were even born. <laughs> and this is in the midst of the, um, the mass murder trials, which I know you remember, Bruce, Mullins, Kemper, and Frazier. The office was small. It was overworked. Life was hectic. But with their encouragement and their support, I tried some serious cases at a very young age, and I matured professionally. And I'm very grateful that they hired me back in the day. Um, I want to thank the judges because we've been in the business that long in large part because of their support. The judges at the end of the day understand the value of healthy checks and balances in our system to ensure reliable and legal outcomes. So I'm very grateful for the judges support throughout the years. And I have to give a special shout out to Harry Brower who did lobby the board in 1975 pretty effectively to appoint our firm to get the contract. 
I'm grateful for all the BCM lawyers and alumni who are strong and courageous, our investigators now and in the past, and our staff and all those UCSC students who have done such a good job and have kept their sense of humor and sanity through some very stressful times in the office. And they have made this work really rewarding for me personally and for the clients as well and the community. I'm grateful to our court and justice partners who respect our role and with whom we find common ground to try to make the system more resilient, more effective, and more fair. And many of them are in the court in this room right now. And I want to say thank you for all your cooperation. Um, it's not always an adversarial system. <laughs> I'm grateful for the support of the county administrative office and their staff throughout the years and the many supervisors who have channeled or reflected the values of our community and have financed our community, community support for common sense constitutional principles like equal justice and due process and fundamental fairness. It's because of your support over the years that we were able to do our work and improve our staff, increase our staff, and meet the challenges uh, in the community. Finally, thank you for your trust. Thank you for your support. It's been a great ride. Um, it, it has a good future. You've got the right person leading it. Our own Heather Rogers, who's been with us for 10 years. She's a strong lawyer and she understands our mission and that's really important here. So I'm grateful that you selected Heather and I look forward to the future in the new office. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you all for your uh, kind remarks and to the board for your proclamation. Uh, my one of my heroes is, of course, William Shakespeare, and uh, on his behalf, brevity is the soul of wit. So I'll make this short, and I'll have Jerry come up and make some further remarks after I'm done. But 47 years is a heck of a long time, and it's gone by awfully quickly. What I'm most proud of, oh, going says 47 years is the fact that three of us, our office, our staff, on a daily basis, every one of those days, we've collectively breathed life into the Sixth Amendment of the Constitution. Our lawyers have represented our clients diligently, effectively, energetically, and competently for 47 years, and we're damn proud of that. Thank you all very much. I'm gonna change the tone a tiny bit here. Um, and uh, basically uh, let everyone here in the room in on a uh, a secret you say secret uh and maybe not so secret a secret and that is being a public defender isn't always popular <laughs> and that may be an understatement in fact i'm certain that's an understatement because and we've all heard it, and Bruce commented briefly on it earlier. We've all heard the refrains, but they represent such yucky people. They, how can they defend someone who's that guilty? And it's a fact of life, essentially a fact of life. And so I think it's worthy of reflection to contemplate those 47 years as public defenders because 47 years is a long damn time in a interesting and controversial 
area. And so I reflect on it and I've reflected on this question is how in the heck did they last this long? Okay. How did they survive? How are they still standing? And I think the answer to that really lies in a, uh, a Beatles song, believe it or not, okay? And it, uh, I'll, I'll spare everyone and everyone's ears, and I will not sing any of that song, but I think the real answer is we got by with little help from our friends. And in our instance, it actually wasn't a little help from our friends. It was a lot of help from our friends. Uh, it begins with the CAO's office and the Board of Supervisors, who have always strongly believed in looking out for the disadvantaged and believed in us in regard to carrying out that duty to the disadvantaged and supported us. And honestly, without the money, uh, you can't do this type of thing. And so thank you, thank you in regard to that, this and previous boards and CAOs. Number two, the judges, many of whom are here today, who have become as much friends as colleagues, and I want to thank them also because what they have done for us, other than supporting us, which they have surely done very, very strongly, but they didn't give us blind support. No one should have blind support. They put us to the task. They essentially monitored our performance. They were the ones who made sure that we did what we said we would do, which was vigorously represent those who cannot look out for themselves. And so that accountability to the judges was exceptionally important. And once we established that, they could not have been any more supportive than they have been. Number three, I want to thank the district attorneys. And you should say, come on, Chair, you're going a little, a little far here. Uh, you bitch about them all the time, and they bitch about you all the time. And that's true. It's part of a competitive environment. There are institutional adversaries. But I will tell you this, and I'm not a lot of people know this, and, and thanks for the Little League comment. I'll appreciate that forever, Bruce. Uh, <laughs> Uh, but in my background, my first job was actually in one of the most um, magical, I really have to say magical DA's office that has ever been. Uh, the local legends um, multiplied within there. Peter Chang, Chris Cottle, Bill Kelsey who was here earlier today. Art Danner, John Fry, John Bohr. Uh, what a group, and it's remained with me all those years in regard to what a special thing that was. Now, of course, a long time ago, I switched over to the defense side, and I love it, love it, love it, and always have. But I still want to thank the DAs uh, not just from my previous experience, it's because they challenge us. And as part of that challenge, how people react to a challenge says everything. Because it makes you stand up. It makes you stand up for that client. And you know what? It makes you a better lawyer for the people that we represent. Uh, and so... A real strong thank you to the district attorneys. In fact, a former district attorney who is no longer with us, Art Danner, made me a much better lawyer from the fact of basically bumping chests in a courtroom uh, multiple times for, for a, a long amount of time. Made me a better lawyer. 
Number four, I want to uh, I want to thank and acknowledge uh, my two partners, the phenomenal lawyers, phenomenally committed, never, never, never doubting the mission, never. And they're better human beings than they are lawyers. I mean, that's just what they are. And I have been blessed to have the two of them by my side throughout this entire time period. And finally, and probably maybe the biggest shout out is to, and there are a lot of them here, the people who've done this public defender work with us, you know, this is uh, the furthest thing in the world from a three person show. This is, a, this is something that's a creation of an amazing amount of people. Uh, phenomenal amounts of them, phenomenal amounts of courage, phenomenal amounts of standing up. And it just, it's impossible to say enough for the public defenders. And I'll say what I always say is go public defenders. <laughs> And that sort of segues into the fact that Heather Rogers was one of those extremely strong public defenders for 10 years. She's lived within our environment. She's the right person to take this into uh, the next county uh, um, office. And I just want to close with the fact that uh, we want to wish the new office and Heather the very best. Uh, uh, thank you all, and thank you all for coming here today. It's been an amazing and incredible and wonderful ride. Thanks. Let me, uh, okay. Yeah, I just wanted to say, uh, you look back on all these years and uh, all the innocent people that you got off, and maybe a few that weren't all that innocent. Uh, but uh, if if I was accused of a crime and I had everybody pointing their finger at me and saying I'm guilty, but I knew I was innocent, you're the guys that I would want to have in my corner. And uh, that's uh, that's what makes uh, actually our country so strong that even if for somebody maybe doesn't have any money or they don't have any, uh, you know, political clout. Uh, there's people like yourselves that will stand up for them and fight and win. So thank you. And a, a real quick question. I don't know if you know a ballpark figure of how many uh, clients you've had throughout the 47 years. Uh, is it a thousand? Is it more? Yeah. You know. Yeah. I think first of all, Greg, I've represented worse than you. We can handle it. <laughs> but uh, why don't you multiply forty-seven times six thousand, and you'll get to a ballpark. Is that right? Yeah, I don't know what that is, but that's a that's a ballpark. Okay. Wow. It'd be two hundred eighty-two thousand. <laughs> You did it? Yeah, okay. Wow. All right. Well, can I get a motion to approve these proclamations? I'll second. Motion by Supervisor McPherson, second by Supervisor Caput. Any further discussion? Seeing none. Clerk, will call vote, please. Supervisor Coonerty? Aye. Caput? Aye. McPherson? Aye. And Koenig? Aye. Senate passes with attendance. Okay. Michaela calling from Santa Cruz Oral Surgery. This message is for Thank you very much. Appreciate it. John Farrell here. <laughs> Where are all these flies down here? Ugh. 
Uh, we, we do have one last item of business, so if you wouldn't mind taking uh, the celebration out into the hall. <laughs> All right. I'm in break. All right, we'll take. All right. Well, now. All right, we'll, we'll proceed with item 12 to uh, consider approving in concept an ordinance amending subdivision A of section 2.02.060 of the Santa Cruz County Code relating to the compensation of the Board of Supervisors and schedule the ordinance for final adoption on June 28th, 2022 as outlined in the memorandum of the personnel director and county administrative officer. For a report on this item, we have our personnel director, Ajita Patel. Good afternoon, Chair Koenig and members of the board. The item before you today is to consider ordinance changes to increase board compensation. Pursuant to county code, you may consider increases annually each June. Salary adjustments are tied to those of Superior Court judges, which are set by the California Judicial Council. Board salary shall be no greater than 62% of the judge's salary. Based on the 2021 data, which is detailed in the board letter, staff recommends that you maintain the 62% alignment, which results in a 3.6% salary increase effective August 2022. Your board's last increase was in September 2020. Happy to answer any questions you may have regarding staff recommendation. Thank you. Any questions or comments from members of the board? I'll make a comment. I, I just uh, like the way we do it now. Uh, it was always to me a little embarrassing. Uh, and then uh, when people would, uh, people would say uh, we gave the impression that we're the only ones that could vote on our own pay raise, right? Uh, so uh, I know in ethics, they say watch out, do things right, but also watch out for the things that uh, can have a, an impression of, uh, of not doing the right thing. And I always felt that it was on the borderline. So uh, it's, our, it's our board that changed it. And uh, I guess uh, you remember going back to uh, Bruce uh, when we always had to go and do that. And so anyway, it's, it's a much, much better process. And anyway, I... I appreciate it. <laughs> yeah, I just um, um, yeah, want to get this over with too. But uh, historically, I've um, in the state or here, I've not accepted pay raise until the next election. Uh, but um, I think we have a policy here that is is the right one. And I just and I'm not trying to put this or be holier than now. But uh, my intention is to pay. Give the pay raise to um, health, human health and services, fire departments, libraries, parks, whatever it might be. And I, I, I do think the board should be commended too under this situation about taking the 10% pay cut when others were taking less than that. Uh, that's not to say that we're greater than somebody else, but uh, uh, we're sensitive to this. And I just wanted to mention that. 
You bet. I, I just say the same thing. Uh, when we took the 10% pay cut, <clears throat> I believe uh, Carlos did too, and uh, the uh, county council also. And uh, uh, very proud of the uh, of what how we were trying to deal with uh, a crisis that we never really saw before, and hopefully we'll never see again. Yeah. All right. Thank you. There's uh, no further questions or comments. Is there anyone from the public that wishes to address us on this item? We have no speakers for this item on Zoom. All right. Then I'll return to board for action. I'll move the recommended actions. Second. A motion by Supervisor Kennedy, second by Supervisor Caput. Any further discussion? Seeing none, clerk, roll call vote, please. Supervisor Coonerty? Aye. Caput? Aye. McPherson? Aye. And Koenig? Aye. That item passes with attendance. That concludes our regular agenda. Uh, we will go into closed session now. Um, we'll take a, a 10 minute break and convene closed session at, uh, actually, so it made it, um, yeah, 3.40. Um, is there any reportable actions that will come out of closed session? Nothing reportable today. Thanks. Okay. Uh, thank you. Thank you.